Yeah. Right there. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so. Yeah. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Chris. Yeah. Hi. Pleasure to be here. Hi, Chris. Good to meet you. Hi. Yeah, likewise. Hi. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Chris. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hello. Pleasure to be here. Be juice. No. <laughs> uh, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> that was a nice way to get get the little jitters out. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it definitely created some kind of space. That was a nice way to get get. Oh no. <laughs> I see if I can call anyone. It seems to happen when maybe Sarah or Karen is unmuted. Because I saw their, their um, squares highlighted as if the sound was coming from there. Hmm. Hi. There, there's um, squares. We are highlighted. not hearing anyone from Printed yeah. Matter, and we don't know. Because I saw their, their um, squares highlighted. The echo that, there's, like, we're all hearing. We are not hearing anyone from Printed Matter, and we don't know. Because I saw their, their um, squares. We are highlighted. not hearing that, like, we're all hearing. I saw their, their um, squares highlighted. So, yeah, I don't know what's No one welcomed us. We don't know what's happening. And, um, can you can you hear me? Um, does someone have a live uh, tab open? Can you just check to make sure you don't have the live stream open in another tab? Does someone have a live? No one Hi. Can you hear me? Um, does someone have a live uh, tab open? Can you just check to make sure you don't have the live stream open in another tab? Okay, that stopped. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, Hi, are I we think, are we live right now? Yes, I think <laughs> I think the problem was someone may have had the live tab open. Okay. Um, and then the sound that that's where the feedback was coming from because uh, it was probably picking it up, but it sounds okay now. Yeah. Not great okay. either way. Okay. <laughs> I have something on mine with the red thing saying live. I should change that. No, I think we're live. I think we're, we are. I, I think, think, think we're so. meant to begin. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. The experimental, um, you know, 
feedback sound loop is over and now we're going to get really serious. But yeah, all my nerves are out. That was great. I'd like to do that every time. Please. <laughs> okay. So I guess I'm just going to begin everyone. So hello, I've got something actually um, somewhat lengthy to read. And, um, and so what's going to happen, let me just begin by saying is that there are a few intros and then there'll be a reading. Um, and then uh, there'll be some discussion and Q&A through the live chat. Uh, so hello and welcome to this live book launch event for PPI number two, Photography in the Sensorium. This issue has been co-authored by Thea Backstrom and Pradeep Dalal, but due to a family emergency, uh, we're all very sorry to say that Thea is unable to join today. Uh, but we're very glad that Chris Baliwas, an artist based in Los Angeles and a student of Fia and Pradeep's in the Bard MFA program, uh, is here with us, as you can see. And we'll read excerpts from Fia's text when we kind of move into that. I'm Shannon Ebner. I'm the editor at large for the PPI series and chairperson of the photography department at Pratt Institute. And I'm joined by Sarah Greenberger Rafferty director of the MFA program in the photography department at Pratt. Mm -hmm. And I wish to thank our co-publishers also on the line here, Dancing Foxes Press, who are Barbara Schroeder and Karen Kelly. I also wish to thank the designer of the series, who's Chad Koffer. So I'm going to begin by speaking. I also want to thank Printed Matter <laughs> um, and David Senior, who I, I'm not seeing here, but but thank you to, to all of Printed Matter and the Virtual Art Book Fair. So that's the context that we're in. And um, the context is, is important to the project that we'll be discussing today uh, because of its relationship to the legacy of the artist book. So I'm gonna read a bit from Printed Matter's website to say something of who they are and what they do. So founded in 1976, Printed Matter is the world's leading nonprofit organization dedicated to the dissemination, understanding, and appreciation of artists' books and related publications. First established in Tribeca by a group of individuals working in the arts, among them artist Saul Lewitt and critic Lucy Lepard, Printed Matter was developed in response to the growing interest in publications made by artists. Starting in the early 60s, many of the pioneer conceptual artists began to explore the possibilities of the book form as an artistic medium. Large edition and economically produced publications allowed experimentation with artworks that were affordable and could circulate outside of the mainstream gallery system. Printed matter provided a space that championed artist books as complex and meaningful artworks, helping bring broader visibility to a medium that was not widely embraced at the time. So this is how we find ourselves um, gathered in this virtual space because of the activities mentioned above, the exploration of possibilities as they relate to the book form as an artistic medium. So the publication, that's the subject of today's gathering, Pounds Per Image, PPI, is a series that I started in 2018 the same year that I moved back to Brooklyn from Los Angeles to begin chairing the photography department at Pratt Institute. But I should back up first and mention that the seed for the project had been planted sometime around 2013 when I was invited to do something at the California Museum of Photography in Riverside, California. The museum was housed on the site of a former department store in downtown Riverside and the architects of the museum, Stanley Satowitz of Natoma Architects, designed the building so that it would have an operational relationship to the camera. Riverside being a dusty desert-like town 55 miles east from Los Angeles, I somehow imagined the building to be the perfect peripheral site to activate a series of commissioned texts by artists about image making. As if a building uh, dedicated to photography with a camera as form mandate could dispatch inquiry, produce writing, and distribute information to advance ideas. All within the context of a UC school, I thought, what could be better? 
but the project was never fully realized. Um, in the end, there was no real infrastructure to support it. And so I just moved on. Arriving at Pratt about five years later, I encountered another building that piqued my interest. The Activities Resource Center, or ARC as it's referred to, is a lower level subfloor windowless uh, building with, a, with six long interconnected corridors that the photography department shares with the gym, math, science, and ID departments which gives the building a certain energy and purpose for testing and experimenting. When I was contemplating the chairship and a move across country, I found myself inspired by the idea of a fully immersive experience in a photography department, not just how I might shape it, but how I would become shaped by it and how others, students, faculty, visitors, guests, would participate in creating this nebulous form. I realize now after publishing two issues of PPI that the project is a serial experiment in pedagogy through the activities of publishing. So the series is published annually through the Pratt Photography imprint and Dancing Foxes Press in Brooklyn who became involved halfway through the first issue. Rolling the, the issues out year by year allows for a responsive timeline within the context of the school. Each issue is a book signature and six signatures will constitute a book. So within printing terms, the signature is a configuration that printers use to lay out a booklet or book pages on a press sheet so that after folding the sheet, they're in the correct order for binding the book. Pages in a signature look out of order and half of the pages are upside down, which is exactly as they need to be for folding so they can end up in the right order. They're in the right order <laughs> in our publication. So it's not like a true. Uh, the serial experiment at PPI is itself multifold. Many of its elements were established in the first issue. Uh, the paper it's printed on, the typography, the size of the publication, the cover treatment, et cetera. But how each person works within these parameters, how ideas meet the page are different each time. So the other part of this experiment has to do with, and now I kind of borrow another phrase, or really it's a title, uh, which is called the social life of the book. And I borrow this title from another signature series that came out of a collective in Paris that's now defunct um, called Castillo Corrales, which um, was founded in 2007. Um, a little more here. So within the school context of Pratt and any of your schools for anyone that's on the line here with us today, I'm interested not just in the book Social Life, if it's to have one, but in how the content of the writing can get socialized among students, faculty, peers, colleagues, and friends. The poet Jack Spicer said that we can't think without the ideas of those who came before us and that old ideas are the very material of thinking. When I came into the chairship and initiated the PPI project, I wanted to see how we could think with new ideas or discard, cut, and mix the old ideas with new ones to socialize them through pedagogy. And I wondered if a modest publication could play some part in accelerating and possibly deaccelerating that timeline. And it occurred to me why I ask these questions in private when you can ask them in public where they can go to work on the next generation of image makers and thinkers um, in schools. So I just want to tell you about PPI one and the PPI three that's forthcoming. Uh, so PPI number one, which is this right here, was published in 2019. Uh, it commissioned the Los Angeles-based writer and curator Rhea Nastis and her essay is called, We Make the Image in Real Time a viewing log, and it's an essay about experience and viewership that focused on the art of Beverly Buchanan, Keon Gaskin, Richard Maxwell, Cameron Rowland, and Diana Young. PPI 3, which is forthcoming, has commissioned artist Leslie Hewitt based on two postscript conversations with scholars and artists Deborah Willis and Ariella Azule, which took place in the fall 2020 uh, following the Teaching Photograph Symposium. So, Thank you for listening. I'm gonna turn this over to Sarah now uh, to tell you a little more about that symposium, which was basically the catalyst for the second issue that we're here to kind of launch and celebrate and talk about today. Um, 
Thanks, Shannon. And um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having us, Print and Matter, et cetera. Um, so speaking, the way that we speak about teaching photographs, uh, at, it, at inception, it was conceived as a horizontal brain trust, one that would carry, hold, and transport a whole host of ideas about how photographs work, if they do, as objects, images, concepts, agents of information and exchange, as material, as immaterial, um, and as material culture. So as such, we hoped that what started as an idea for this one-off symposium to include workshops, experimental lectures, meals, podcast episodes, critical texts, and engagements, formal, interstitial, and et cetera, would be catalytic for work in our field for months and years to come. Um, so we started with six questions. Uh, one, how do photographs teach? Two, what is an audience, a public, a student, a teacher? Three, how does artistic purposelessness operate? Which has been the most confounding question. Um, uh, four, how does your work serve um, and who does it serve? Five, what are the ethical considerations of picture making? Um, and six, how are photographs made? Um, so we started planning in 2018 when Shannon arrived as, chair, at, as chairperson at Pratt, as she said. And it was also in the second year um, of, of my uh, directorship of a soon to start MFA program. Teaching photographs as a construct um, is a double entendre or double meaning, uh, the way in which photographs teach alongside our work as teachers teaching about, around, how to, why to, and sometimes why not to photograph. Um, and so as the former co-directors of an, another MFA program in photography, we invited Fia and Pradeep to give a workshop as part of the opening gambit of teaching photographs, which was to start an October 2019 three-day on-campus event. Um, and so they were engaging more literally with the teaching of photographs than some of our other programs. Um, and funny, as Shannon mentions, the architecture of the ARC, um, which is, in my opinion, a building made for processing chemistry and not for people. Um, uh, the fact that fall 2019 was the last time we had a full semester unencumbered relationship with um, mass indoor meetings. Um, I remember the tight, dark filled room where we held the workshop with Fia and Pradeep, which was standing room only. Um, and by design, it was a small room for intimacy and classroomness. Um, and then eventually the ultimate directions to go out into the crisp fall outdoors to photograph as pairs um, interconnectedly, you know, uh, which you see in the, in the final page, almost like, I think it's maybe this printed matter background is gonna mess this up, but you see it in the final page of the PPI, which are the instructions for the workshop that we did in that October, 2019 day. Um, so it's all just so novel, like a little bit of more than a year later, um, and a lot to think about for, for the future and for the now. Um, so once the construct is there of teaching photographs and also of PPI, which, um, Shannon describes as the Pratt photography in imprint, but also as pounds per image. Um, and with our crossing into the pandemic era as sort of um, mid-career bookmakers, educators, artists, um, we have a comfort with open-ended questions intersecting and crossing streams. Um, and that's been one of the most wonderful discoveries of teaching photographs as a construct. And I think it's, it's also evident in the crossing streams of the dialogue between Fia and Pradeep in this issue um, and in PPI in general. Um, so PPI is a platform of discourse and so is teaching photographs, um, dealing with the site specificity of photography, teaching and learning and public publication and reading. Um, 
when I worked with Matt Keegan on North Drive Press, who was another participant in the 2019 symposium, um, we always talked about the time capsule nature of what we were doing, um, that we were making a record of the now into the future. Um, teaching photographs has become something of a pedagogical framework and a teaching philosophy more than any one event, um, conversation, artist, or scholar. Um, it's not about ownership or making a brand. It's an open source, generous, and adaptable project for thinking. Um, to that end, it has a, a future current life in a really brilliantly organized uh, project called Thinking Through Photographs at the University of Buffalo Art Galleries curated by Liz Park. Um, and so these kinds of, um, you know, streams that are going out, uh, tributaries are, are really rich. Um, and finally, before, um, you know, I invite Pradeep to speak about the, the this particular issue, um, in, in the talk that they gave a couple of weeks ago at Pratt, uh, Fia mentioned that the book is a mobile site, um, which, interestingly to me, describes our current conditions, even though we're the least mobile, or at least, you know, I feel the least mobile that I, that I have been in my whole life. Um, I really enjoyed thinking about this book as a mobile site um, to have on hand, to have this engagement with the outside world. So um, with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Pradeep to um, let us know about um, this issue. Wow. Um, I am very sorry to say that Fia is not here with us today. And I think as Sarah mentioned, if you want to get a sense of her reading the text, then to check out the talk that we had done at Pratt a few weeks ago. Uh, I wanted to also, on behalf of Fia and me, uh, thank Shannon and Sarah uh, for inviting us to produce this volume that we're launching today. Uh, we're hugely grateful to Shannon for her belief in our work and the exceptional care and discernment with which she helped edit our text and images. And also a huge thank you to the amazing Barbara and Karen of Dancing Foxes for their inspiring and very collaborative publishing process that we've learned from and enjoyed. And to Chad for his meticulous design. It's been very kind of carefully done and to work with us uh, on that. I am grateful for Chris uh, to come and help read Fia's text. And he said he was going to like really learn the Swedish pronouncement. So let's see what happens with that. Um, so just as a quick background, uh, you know, it, as Sarah mentioned that we were invited by Shannon and Sarah to do the workshop and presentation in 2019. Uh, Fia and I had worked together as co-chairs at Bard for the last five years. And then we had taught together at Bard for a couple of years, even before that. And uh, so I feel that we've had lots and lots of conversations uh, around photography and pedagogy. And we're grateful for this chance from Shannon and Sarah to contribute to this volume as a way of kind of just thinking about that path that we were on together in a really tight dialogue for a long time. So right away, we decided that we would build the text uh, around one recent project each. In this case, both of our projects addressed ideas of nature, very different perspectives, very different geographies, but very uh, valuable overlapping concerns. Uh, we also found that we were both invested in the idea of physicality of making, especially with these projects and the tactile dimensions of photography, hence this title, Photography in the Sensorium. So we were looking at sensorial approaches to both research, image making, and writing. So it wasn't just in the production of the images, but it was in many of the other steps along the way. And then in the process of making this publication, we decided to write separate texts, and then we wove them together into this bivocal text. So there are three kind of loose subsections that we had titled knowing, handling, naming. And we know that these frameworks 
uh, are very general, that research making and writing are extremely active, fluid forms, and they never really separate out in practice. But this was a way to kind of construct a certain structure uh, for the project. And now I'm going to just ask Chris to speak for Fia uh, and read a little bit. Thanks, Radeep. Um, so we each have two double page spreads for our work. And we also have informational thumbnail images in black and white alongside the text for specific references. Also in these margins are a set of pedagogical questions or prompts, which also help guide our writing such as, how can a longer term or more intimate relationship with the image be built? And the life of the digital image is light and floating. How can it be anchored? Or can displacing, dissecting, and reassembling the image process open up the work? At the end of the booklet is material from the workshop we gave in the Teaching Photograph Symposium, which initiated this publication. The workshop was titled A Super Wordy some proposed strategies on how to situate images by building context beyond representational pointers. We have included the prompt and questions and a selection of the resulting images and texts that the participants made. In the end, this booklet has become a hybrid of sorts, both a pedagogical tool and an artist book. So before we begin to read, um, I just wanted to thank you seen some slides of the booklet. I think um, just speaking to this pandemic time, it is a particular moment because most of us don't have the book in hand. And therefore, again, the encounter with the publication is uh, a bit remote. Um, but I wanted to just say a couple of things right before we read. One was that I had not put my own process of making under this level of scrutiny before. So in making this book and writing and thinking and discussing the text and images so rigorously with Fia and everyone else uh, in uh, our group, I felt that uh, I worried that the heightened self-consciousness would kind of mess with the pleasure of making and thinking more unguardedly. Um, I, and then a few days ago, I read this uh, statement by the artist Lorraine O'Grady, uh, where she says that the process of explaining the work has helped me understand it. You get the benefit of other minds, and it's made me realize how artists who are not attended to lose opportunities to grow. It was a great little reminder that in this kind of way of thinking that I too had, and I feel that the PPI opportunity provided by Sarah Ann Shannon allowed uh, or made this extremely valuable. And it is kind of, in a sense, uh, working just for this very reason. Now, speaking to the artist book and pedagogical, uh, uh, artist book and the pedagogical tool qualities of the booklet, a couple of quick observations uh, that we can then pick up later in the discussion after our reading. So both Fia and I are making work in and about our home countries, Sweden in the case of Fia and India for me. So there's an aspect in our work of translating cultural contexts, particular histories that may not be fully legible in this context. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. There is also a density of materials that we cover in the booklet, uh, photographic processes, printing techniques, art history, institutional and national histories, artist writings, literature. Uh, the term I cite a little bit in my text is uh, the multilingual imagination. It's a memorable phrase by the writer Arun Krishna Merothra. And it's not only in the form of language, but even in uh, an image, uh, a multi kind of image uh, frame. So I feel that a whole range of voices are brought in from many disciplines, architecture, philosophy, linguistics, literature, political history, and many more into this orbit. And the writing itself ranges from the plain spoken and diaristic, descriptive and informational, and even ruminative. And it's also questioning and uncertain in places. So I just want to put that out there that is a kind of a language frame within this. 
Uh, and the images also work across many different registers from the thumbnails that we mentioned that serve as references to image and process studies, uh, to installations, to maps and diagrams, and also perversely as tiny little memos to the full final works. So here you're seeing a little kind of tiny little thumbnail standing in for a finished complete work that may be 30 by 40. So there's something kind of interesting about that too. And then I feel that we had these double page spreads to each that encourage a more visceral encounter with the images at a much larger scale and in color. So I am still a bit surprised that all this material is packed in a modestly scaled booklet that is seemingly light to hold and unassuming. So that contrast for me is also like incredibly valuable, you know, just as the way it uh, came out. Anyway, we'll touch on this a little bit later, uh, but I want to just begin by just jumping into the text and we're both, uh, Chris and I, reading little segments to give you a sense of the language and a sense of the material. Obviously it is uh, partially accepted. Yeah. A college friend in Ahmedabad grew up in Sri Rangan. She described the 14th century temple town and showed me historical maps. A few years later in 1986, I probably saw other plans, drawings and photographs of the town in the landmark exhibition Vistara, the architecture of India. I'd seen that in Mumbai. The exhibition was organized by the architect Charles Courier for whom I went to work that very same year. At that time, I was indifferent to traditional Indian architecture, yet something lodged in my mind, perhaps the geometry of the seven concentric enclosures that make up the city plan, or I may have been drawn to the, its more than 700 year long history. Many years later, when I read the Vistara catalog carefully, I learned that Sri Rangam was conceived as a cosmic mandala, a representation of the universe. Korea and his co-authors say that all motion is directed inward and that the geometry becomes more and more precise as one gets closer to the sacred center. I was drawn to the powerful diagrammatic quality of the city plan. So on my first visit to Sri Rangam in 2001, I stumbled on a tiny garden. I was drawn to the casually decrepit, forlorn and uncanny so different choreographed and strictly ritualized order of the temple precincts. A radio played old film songs in a small gazebo. This reminded me of childhood visits to a similar gazebo in Mataram, a hill station, uh, a hill station near Mumbai to listen to the evening news with my father. Um, the park was an oval, looked oasis with people napping on benches, chatting in small groups and taking walks. I did not focus there on my first two visits, which were a dozen years apart. On my third visit in 2013, I photographed the cascading light at dusk, but could not capture the intense bodily sensation of sitting under trees filled with thousands of cacophonous birds in pitch black darkness. The lights were switched on and off at regular intervals, perhaps to save electricity. A group of images I made in the park alternate between daylight and night views. There is a statue of Queen Victoria in the park, in this park celebrating the proclamation that made her Empress of India in 1877. At that time, the British introduced the Indian Penal Code, which contained the notorious section 377 making sexual activities against the order of nature illegal. After 150 years, it was finally overturned in 2018. So I wonder about this order of nature. Who decides what belongs to nature and what falls outside of it? What is unnatural? Is there a universally shared understanding of nature? A sourness persists, bitter nature, bitter nature. The Jürgen Still Building, erected in 1908 for Ernest Thiel, houses the banker, venture capitalist, and patron's collection of Swedish national romantic paintings, together with the death mask of Friedrich Nietzsche, a gift from the philosopher's sister, Elizabeth Förster Nietzsche. 
From early childhood visits to the museum, I have vague memories of the mask. The palace's construction dovetailed with the formation of the Swedish welfare state. Having grown up with its founding values of social and economic equality, I was able to excavate some of the troubled origin histories of the welfare state by way of this site for the work that came to be titled Facing Her Land, Notes from Elsewhere in 2019. In Sweden, the nature is accessible for everyone through the law Alamans Retin, translated as every man's right or freedom to roam. This collective caring for nature is an expression of the values of the welfare state. But as for many other Western settler colonial states, extractive mining and hydropower provided the wealth that supported the Swedish welfare state. Teal, a second generation immigrant and risk capitalist invested in the Jalabada Mining Company in this village of Svapabada. Such mining not only scarred the landscape depicted on Teal's paintings, but also displaced the indigenous Sami population. Descending the stairs of the palace from the death mask is a sculpture in Swedish granite titled Lappen, a derogatory word for Sami, by national romantic sculptor Christian Eriksson of a Sami man in traditional garments. Ericsson's busts were displayed at the popular 1919 exhibition, The Exhibit of Swedish People Types, which resulted in the creation of the Swedish State Institute for Racial Biology, another episode in a long history of indigenous oppression. The exhibition was publicly supported by some of the artists and writers connected to Teal. During World War II, Northern iron ore mines provided weapons to the Third Reich, while Teal's daughter, Signe Henschen, as part of a feminist net network, brought Jewish refugees to safety in Sweden. In the archive, I found sloppily written letters with large ink blots from Thiel's good friend, Werner von Heidenstam, the aristocratic nationalist poet who wrote the poem, Sweden, in 1896, originally included in the poetry cycle, A People, as a contribution to a competition for the national anthem. Several works in Tiosco Galleria depict the common fantasy of Northern Sweden as an untouched, pure nature with wilderness becoming a construct for the purpose of establishing a nationalistic white narrative of a people which came in handy for future tourism. Uh, I often make copies of articles to read on subway rides and long flights. I refer to photocopies of architectural drawings, plans, sections, and elevations when I visit sites. I copy travel guides, articles, and essays. These are stapled and transported in clear plastic folders. Mostly they live in unwieldy piles in my apartment. I've made photocopies of my photographs, scanned them, and made photographs from the scans. I like the displacements of the image. I made copies of some Mughal manuscript pages, especially the unwan compositions of calligraphy framed with elaborate borders on tracing paper and found myself drawn to the geometrical elements, asymmetrical rhythmic placements of rectangular and triangular shapes filigreed with an obsessive floral pattern. I also photocopied some of these pages so as to blur and soften the fussy detail and to remove the seductive color. I wanted to see what a lo-fi graphite gray image of the original gold and jewel-like paintings would look like. I noticed how the rectilinear elements, the crisp geometry of lines, could effortlessly hold within it organic foliate plant forms. This bringing together of abstraction and nature was matter of fact for these artists, and that was a revelation. I then made modest prints by inking etched copper plates marveling at how the mottled vegetal pattern registered in shallow relief on fine art paper. As I scanned these prints and printed the photographs, another kind of image emerged, one with a condensation of detail, less delicate and stranger than the original. I also mixed etching inks and was struck by how the colors of my prints, the rich umber and ochre browns and pale yellows translated into digital photographs. I selected five images in which I had separated each of the border elements from a 14th century manuscript by Mir Ali and centered them, an extraction and a distillation 
to see how the smallest marginal units of composition might hold their own. I imagined myself in the landscapes of the Swedish paintings and decided to drive to fresh kills on Staten Island, once the world's largest landfill and now transformed into a recreational wild park. The area had the highest percentage of Trump voters, 72% in New York State in 2016. I walked down Cedar Grove Beach to photograph, not sure what I was looking for, moving to understand. For the ephemera that I produced for the project, I wrote, it is half past four in the afternoon. The sun is warm. I look at the horizon dividing the Atlantic Ocean from the sky, a slightly bulging line indicating the sphere we inhabit. I lie down on the beach. I touch the warm sand and let it seep between my fingers. I listen to the waves hitting the shore. There is plastic debris everywhere that has blown ashore from last year's storm. Notes from elsewhere. I lie very still to feel the breeze touch my face. I hear birds circling above me in the sky. I open my eyes and see more and more birds excitedly gathering above my body, noisy seagulls, but also what looks like predatory birds. I raise my head slightly to look at the foam forming from the water that moves in from the ocean. I see tiny dots in the distance, tankers hovering like unconnected bodies. I think to myself that I don't want to be hit by bird poop, so I move my arms slightly and the birds immediately scatter. A living corpse sifting sand on the beach, set in a community in a flood zone, devastated and scattered after Hurricane Sandy in 2012. In 2016, in response to community demand, 55 houses here were part of the first climate-related state-subsidized real estate auction. Um, instead of taking pictures with a tripod, I use surrogates both in my surroundings, walls, plinths, steps, benches, gates, and also with my own body, hands, forearm, knees, thighs, shoulder, and torso. There were some photographs of the tree canopy in the park in Sri Rangam that I had written off as unusable because they were blurred. Yet when I looked at them several years later, I found that bits of night sky looked like raining shards of glass. These white light bars linked up visually with the light, brighter white rectangles of street lamps in the park. I'm not sure if I trained my camera upward to follow the deafening but thrilling bird calls, but the experience of sitting under the swarm of noisy, noisy birds in pitch dark was sensational and uncannily outside the body. A brief feeling of being one with the transcendent continuum of nature. Cyanotype, the least toxic process, needs only two chemicals, ferric ammonium citrate used as a food additive and for contrast in medical imaging, and potassium ferrocyanide, which renders the well-known subaqueous tone in several photographic processes. Cyanotype belongs to a history of nature depiction, most notably Anna Atkins contact prints for cyanotypes of British and foreign ferns from 1853. Because Atkins was unable to duplicate an image, the wilting of the ferns was unintentionally registered through the contact printing of the edition. I have several ferns that are fragile, needing constant care. Yet ferns are prehistoric witnesses of global extinctions and climate changes. Instead of branching out into smaller and smaller arteries, their very structure defies hierarchical taxonomic logic. Their leaves are organized horizontally all parts have concurrent access to water. I once visited the, bot the botanist Carl von Linnaeus teaching garden in Uppsala near Stockholm, where the plants were organized according to their sexual systems. The plants with their stamens and pistils were lined up as if morphing into each other. Ferns whose pansexual reproductive system via spores were a mystery to Linnea. He left them for a bed devoted to plants whose reproductive systems he was in, unable to classify. Linnea was the founder of the taxonomic system, a precursor to any Western classificatory system, including photographic seriality. I kept nudging the process along step after step, make a photograph, print it, make a photocopy of it. He transferred the image onto a copper plate, ink the plate, run it through an etching press and print on wet paper. I like the relief-like indentation 
and the three-dimensionality of the image and the way the ink sits on the paper. I like the vibrancy of the pigments and the immense possibilities for transforming color by mixing etching inks and oil. The softness of the image and the diffused edges of lines were the opposite of what I would look for in printing a photograph. Another form of clarity, but then another displacement. With a desire to go back to the satisfying machine-made image and away from the handmade, I scanned the print and reworked it digitally, matching and approximating the pigment hues in Photoshop and outputting it as an inkjet print. In response to Nietzsche's death mask and his complicated patriarchal and Nazi connected history, I created masks of three of the envi environmental girl activists' faces, Greta Thunberg, Rita Mapande, and Marinel Ubaldo. I was interested in exploring how 3D modeling could be a photographic portraiture process. I gathered images of their faces from the internet for the modeling process, approaching the moving lines of a dimensional face as an approximation of an outline in constant motion. White, with its assumed neutrality, was not an option for printing variable skin tones. Green was too symbolically heavy handed and seemed a mockery, turning their faces into aliens. I opted for gray, turning the heads into ghost-like presences. The modeling material, PLA, is corn-based and biodegradable. A mistake generated by horizontally orienting the print created a topographically layered skin texture reminiscent of a landscape. Appropriating the display of Nietzsche's seemed a strange choice for my masks of living young women. Walking in the garden, I imagined instead how the girls might become witnesses if they were looking down at the viewer from the trees. I fastened them high up around the trunks like tree huggers where they actively engaged the sight. Viewers would be forced to move their bodies across the horizon, crouching down for the prints and tilting their heads upward to see the masks of the girls who became like tree spirits or hovering like the mythical creatures El Bor. Okay. And now for the last bit from, on language, uh, a couple of excerpts. Uh, I begin with a quote, here is the writer Amitav Ghosh on the relationship of naming and language and culture in placing one firmly in the world. So this is a quote from Amitav Ghosh. He says, I was in my teens when I read Naipaul's essay on how in the Trinidad of his youth, the flowers of the Caribbean were rendered invisible by the unseen daffodils of textbook English poets. That essay sparked so powerful a jolt of recognition that the moment has stayed with me ever since. As a child, while reading The Mutiny on the Bounty, I'd been fascinated by the word frangipani, which seemed to me redolent of all that was mysterious, desirable, and secret. Then one day I discovered that the gnarled old branches in, by my window belonged to none other than a frangipani tree. I'd been staring at them for years, my response was neither shock nor disappointment. It was rather a sudden awareness of the anomalousness of my place in the world. This was not an awareness I had ever seen reflected in anything I'd read until I came across Naipaul's essay. So that's Amitav Ghosh. Uh, for me, a similar estrangement was caused by the primacy of the English language in my education and experience and the insidious way it superseded my mother tongue Gujarati and the other languages I learned in school, Hindi and Marathi. Facility with English was a ticket to get ahead in the world and a means to become part of a larger Western world. But it blocked the ease of access and profound connection to my own culture and traditions. It took me a long time to figure out that learning about the world, including my own, through English, carried with it an indelible strain, stain of Western superiority. It would take a great deal of effort to begin to see an exceptional sophistication, beauty and complexity in Indian art, architecture and language for myself. In an entry in his diary, the 20th century Bengali artist Somnath Hor describes being, in quotes, surrounded by the clamor of various sparrows, shaliks, bulbulis, close quotes. In another entry, he says that the Dalim tree is full of birds. When I speak of my experience in the garden in Sri Rangam, I do not have this intimate and fluent knowledge of trees and birds. 
I cannot name the trees under which I was sitting, nor identify the birds in the trees besides noticing crows and parrots. In another entry in his diary, Hoare describes white blossoms everywhere, Togor, Golancha, Juvi, Rajnikanda, Madhuganda, Beli. At the back, the Dalim tree is ablaze, its flowers dancing in their gagras of red shalu. He knows the local names of the flowers in Hindi and Bengali. I'm envious of his ease in observing, describing, and taking pleasure in the natural world, and the effortless flow between his mother tongue Bengali and the national language Hindi and English. It is impossible for me to bypass the language frame of English. However, as the writer A.K. Ramanujan says, that he offers another path. He says that while English has distorted our traditions, it has also made us look at our traditions. This whole question of colonial distortion has been formulated in English. It requires a dialogue with English. English has been the other through which we have returned to ourselves. English has made us self-critical and made us critical of English itself. Another poem, the minimalist epic narrative cycle, Ednan from 2018, whose title means land, <coughs> earth and ground by Sami poet Linnea Axelsson, moved me deeply. Written in Swedish, the sparse words leave massive white space on the printed page and on the broad spine of the tome, recalling the vast white expanses of the North where earth and sky merge. A much different kind of landscape depiction than the grandiose painting gestures in the museum. I requested permission to reprint a few sections that describe the exploitation of mountains and rivers from the perspective of an intergenerational Sami family, rather than from the sanctioned view of the progressive Swedish welfare state. The poem offers an emotional landscape reinvented as wilderness and mapped with Swedish geographic names that erase the original language and the history of the land, the patriarchal lineages of mining and naming. Whose depiction of the land gets to count? In addition to the poems and the longer written texts about the walk, I juxtapose additional forms of language, descriptive texts on the historical, economic, and social vectors informing the site, countering quotes from the girl activists of various backgrounds, and my own poetic notations that, have, that gave presence to the process of making. One of these notations is an ode to the sun, the source of life and of printing the photographs, global witness and aid to catastrophes, healer and heater all in one. Printed in Swedish are also the lyrics to the popular song, Engla Mark, Angel Land in 1971 a protest against a governmental decision to expand hydropower in Sweden. The song was written by the troubadour Evert Tau to save the river Vindelelden, the lower part of which is known as Vieux de l'Edneu and the upper as Vie de l'Edneu in one Sami language. The river winds its way through Sapmi, the region where the Sami live, stretching across Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. Vindel etymo etymologically stems from, the, from meandering, while Elv derives from the German Elbe, river. And Elva, moreover, is a young female human-like creature in Norse mythology who is always found in a group, often dancing at dawn or at dusk in the woods. The Elvor are sexualized motifs in the national romantic tradition, but in folklore they are also connected to the Mara, a, a supernatural entity that tortures those sleeping by sitting on their chests and provoking deep anxiety. Uh, that concludes the reading, um, and, but uh, before passing it over to Sarah and Shannon, um, I'd just like to take a moment to say thanks to Fia and Pradeep and everyone involved for this opportunity to fill in and also to provide a small echo of the publication as someone who is a student of theirs at Bard, a participant in their workshop for the Teaching Photograph Symposium at Pratt, and now having spent some nights with this text in preparation for today. In my own research, image making and writing, there's an artist that has been key to helping me develop this knowledge through the body, help me understand the movement in a photographic practice that complicates a printed image. 
an artist that Fia suggested I look deeper into during my first summer at Bard. American jazz drummer, percussionist, professor, emeritus of music, researcher, inventor, gardener, herbalist, and martial artist Milford Graves. Milford didn't come to the drum set traditionally. His relationship with the apparatus was developed through another familiar body experience that he observed could be applied to the traps. He shares in an inter interview that when he first encountered a drum set, he wasn't sure what to do with the hi-hat and bass drum. Coming from a Latin percussion background, the hands did much of the drumming. And when playing drums that involved standing, many percussionists would do these particular dance moves. Milford decided to apply those dance moves to the pedals of the drum set, stating that if I dance, I know it's going to be coordinated with up here, speaking of his hands. And up here is going to be coordinated with below. So I get a four-way coordination going on as he makes a circular motion with his hand. I'm reminded of this as I read through both Fia and Pradeep's experience of walking, circling, combined with the intimate moments of handling photocopies, letters, and prints. What is it that accumulates within from the, that attunement and, coordinate, and coordination of the sensorium? What is it that becomes? As some of the pedagogical prompts in the margin of the, this publication asks, can everyday observations and overlooked activities lead to valuable source material? What if sight is not the primary sense through which to understand the world? Throughout the text, Fia speaks of these approximations of a worn pale reddish flag on a pole of the caption, the image, which Milford speaks of as well in the interview, stating that when it comes to studying something like drumming, one can only analyze and capture it in an approximated way. That there's only approximating because you'll never be able to put something that's moving down on paper. This reminds me of a prior Q&A for this publication between Fia, Pradeep, and composer writer Bill Beats, in which Pradeep mentions how he takes the tactile and hand-making quality back into a digital image, wanting something that is more distanced from the original process. Movement, mouver, émouvoir, émou, émote, emit while seeing in motion, emotion, as in movement of materials. Is that emotion in motion? Is that the feeling, feel it, that Milford speaks of? I share this to celebrate Milford Graves' life. I share this to say thanks to Fia and Pradeep. For in this time where much of my desire is to be outside, I'm grateful for these teachers who have shown me the knowledge and movement that is available within. Um, thank you, Chris. That was, that was incredible and uh, really brought home basically all of the points that that we were talking about and and uh with a really deep meditation on the sensorium of the, the titular sensorium so um thank you that uh i really really appreciate that that sharing um i i see we're about at noon and i want to say we're going to start the conversation um, for those of you out in the YouTube zone watching, um, would be great if you wanted to put some questions in the chat. Uh, those of you who are signed in, um, audience questions as it were. Uh, and while we're waiting for those to funnel in, um, we're gonna try and take a look at the PPI2 issue. Um, and start kind of speaking amongst ourselves. Can people see this? Is this playing or is this my screen again? It, it's your screen. Which, I mean, I do this all the time and don't come up against this issue. I'll try one more time if it doesn't work because it's distracting. I will, here, this one might work now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Perfect. Um, so this is a video of the, the physical book, the signature, which really gives you a sense of the piece. And also, um, I guess I wanna start the, the discussion off with, um, with a question about the marginalia questions, um, because I think that this inside and outside that Chris just spoke about um, is, 
is one of the tools of the book for, for, you know, reflecting the project that was roughly, you know, if you go back to Fia and Pradeep starting to teach together in 2015, and then sort of towards the end of their teaching partnership, making this workshop and book, but then going forward. Um, so in the, you can see in the video there, but it's actually, you know, a one of the things that's, that's really striking about this book. Um, I'm using one of the printed matter backgrounds today, but it's kind of flying this situation, but there's, there's these questions. Um, the life of the digital image is light and floating. How can it be anchored? Um, how can a longer term and more intimate relationship with the image be built? And I guess a question starting out for Pradeep and also Shannon is how does that relate to the publication and how does that relate to the idea of reading or, or the life of this, this book going forward? Pradeep, maybe you wanna begin. I know this question kind of came up um, a little bit at the end of the Pratt talk around this idea of this publication as a kind of pedagogical tool. And that's what I think about in terms of these questions along the, the margins. Right. I think we began with, uh, yeah, we began with the questions as prompts for ourselves to begin to write and uh, to have a conversation or a discussion around these themes, because even though we ended up writing separately, we did begin by trying to write together and that these were prompts to kind of nudge us along too. So that was the initial kind of uh, impetus. Then in including them within the book, the idea was that they would also have a kind of a free flowing quality. They aren't absolutely tethered to a specific response that we might have to that question exactly, but that there is a little bit of slip sliding and motion in there. And it serves, I feel, uh, also as a way to unsettle any kind of uh, kind of a closing uh, frame, you know, like that. As soon as you read something, then the question next to it that says, "How does the work find its place in dominant and minoritarian con conversations?" That that question can pull you out and allow you to reflect or to kind of take it into your own space. That was the way I was thinking. Uh, that, or at least some of the ways that it might work. I also like that these little texts kind of serve as thumbnail so that the image and the question are also interchangeable. You know, several years ago at Bard, we had read the Roland Barthes book, uh, Index Cards, you know, with his uh, index cards that he taught his last lecture in Paris. And in one of the essays by Dennis Hollier, he talks about those index cards being like images or snapshots. So again, kind of the index card question, the location of it within the gully. Yeah, I mean, um, I know last time also there was um, this phrase that came up about bivocality in terms of just um, mm -hmm. the the writing process uh, that you and Pia <laughs> underwent. But I think I keep thinking about a sort of um, like a pan vocality. And I somehow see these questions and the thumbnails and the images and the interwoven writing as being this kind of pan vocal experience um, for a reader that there's just these different registers in, in how this thing kind of operates. It's just really rich. And I think that um, there's kind of no one way through it. Um, which I, I really enjoy in terms of just the kind of reading experience and its utility, you know, that you can kind of turn to those questions as prompts and sort of activate them, um, you know, possibly in a classroom. And yeah. uh, I think also just to stress that point, uh, that I was talking about the unsettling aspect, but it is that these prompts are also probing and questioning and it's a way again not to settle in the fixity of an image you know that there is something different and more 
uh, outward looking from that, that there's a kind of an opening up that is possible in there, which is different from trying to decode an image. So I feel that that switch up is also a valuable kind of back and forth. Um, just uh, while we wait for some questions to come in, I have another question, which um, is a little bit switching gears um, and directed more towards um, Shannon and the and the dancing foxes. Um, so I, I knew about the um, Castillo Corrales um, signature project, um, but I never knew if they bound them. You know, I have a couple issues of that, and I I just uh, I remember them as signatures, and I think I never followed up to see if they were bound into books. It looks like you have something at the ready. So oh, wow. yeah. And I, I have a few issues of that in my, um, I believe they're in my office at Pratt. Um, but, uh, but so I wonder about the, the futureness and the sort of promise of binding them together and how now that you're underway in production of the third issue, so it's sort of well underway after it was finding its form, finding its, um, its stride, um, what it's like to sort of do these serial publications that will then be bound, which seems very also, you know, kind of harkens back to serial publication of, of magazines in the 19th century and whatnot. Um, and just sort of how, how you think about the idea of binding something into a book um, with these multiple, you know, autonomous, you know, cause you were just talking about polyvocalities, this, this, these multiple autonomous publications. But you're muted. Okay. Yeah, no, I know Barbara and Karen are, are here too. So, um, so yeah, I think this is something we can kind of all speak to. You know, I mean, well, I'll just start off by saying that that one, so far as I know, uh, the social life of the book hasn't been bound. When I was looking at the site today, it seemed the last one was printed um, in 2015. Uh, it'd be a good question to find out if there's plans to bind it. I mean, one conversation though that, um, that we had earlier on was, you know, if we were gonna be really kind of, um, strict about this, we would have basically printed enough of these to just warehouse them somewhere in Brooklyn and then actually bind each signature. Um, you know, we would have had to keep the edging. We would have had to keep some as actual signatures with all of the kind of information that gets kind of cut away from the press sheet so that they could have been assembled. And that would have been a really beautiful thing. <laughs> um, I, re I recall kind of ruling that out early on. I don't know, Barbara and Karen, what if you have a recollection of that conversation? I think I think I <laughs> I might be wrong, but I think that we decided not to partly because it was a storage issue, and we print. Yeah, I think it was a a lot of a storage yeah. <laughs> a storage issue, but also potentially a production issue that we wanted to keep it open in terms of how how we bound them together. So um, yeah, a, pro a production slash. But I what I like about this is that um, is the how how issuing them serially and individually and on their own really gives them a, um, and puts forward these individual, them as individual projects, but then eventually coming together to say something larger. Um, so I like the focus that it gives the individual pieces as they emerge just on a conceptual level. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it also makes me think of the, um, was it the Documenta project with the hundred kind of booklets 
that always was really interesting to me because they were they were so homogenous in design, but then they had different sizes, trim sizes, which um, always made me like think, well, what would happen if you like collected all 100 and tried to make them a set? Um, but yeah, I think that storage issue and production issue is is really real, especially when we're here on this virtual classroom attached to the printed matter art book fair, which is um, that's that's virtual and in IRL, it's so much about the space and how you can merchandise the table and how much you can bring if you're coming from out of town. And so it is interesting to think about the, again, back to the mobile site of the publication, as Fia said, the, the portability um, of something like this versus a hardbound book. Mm -hmm. Actually, that it is very much like the the documented books because they were eventually bound together into one book, but they were reconfigured to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's 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 what will be. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it sort of goes back to what you were saying earlier, Karen. Just this idea that. Um, when it comes time to actually make the full publication, it'll be yet another opportunity to sort of revisit how each one of these covers was working in the signature form and sort of how it imagines itself as a kind of completed project, which right now it's, you know, this kind of like slow moving project um, that does have that responsiveness built in. So, um, yeah. Um, So how are we doing in the, are there any questions? There, coming there's, still, just... there's still no audience questions that I've received, um, yeah. but it, it could be processing or, or um, yeah, no audience cues yet. I just got the message. So for okay. talking amongst ourselves, um, I think, you know, one of the things that was so nice about both the event a couple of weeks ago and today is the the dialogic reading, um, which I think is just, sorry, I have a dance party coming by my window. Um, so yeah, I think that's partly one of the most, um, I think, productive things about this book is seeing this particular discussion. And then again, back to the questions, which I'm very interested in, the marginalia questions. Um, the the dialogue that it proposes that could happen um, and the multiple lives of these kinds of exercises. Um, so I wonder, maybe it's a question for Chris, if you're comfortable speaking extemporaneously about this um, as someone that, you know, is moving through having been a student, having been there during the workshop, reading the text sort of somewhat fresh and thinking about it, you know, as someone who wasn't involved in its production, maybe you have a, a thought on, on it as a, as a tool or as, you know, something that we've been talking about. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think back to a question that um, the current co-chair uh, who preceded uh, Fiam Pradeep, uh, Ariel asked um, in the last session of like how this can function in the classroom. And um, I think uh, for me as someone, you know, going through an MFA program, uh, it serves not only as, as something I look forward to ask myself um, as an artist, but um, something to utilize as someone who hopes to, you know, land a, some sort of teaching gig or something, you know? So um, I, f I just feel there's a, a whole, uh, there's a wide range of, of possibilities um, in the margins, you know? Um, funny enough, I was looking at my notes with Fia from that summer and I, 
Milford Graves is written in the margins like horizontally. So it's kind of just a, a, a funny coincidence for me, but um, yeah, I def, I, um, yeah, I, I, I look forward to maybe having another workshop and seeing what kind of what new questions can arise from there too. So, yeah. Yeah, and um, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, um, Shannon, with PPI one, there was a kind of course built, sort of adjacent to, if not directly related to the text, um, and with this, it was first the workshop symposium, then the text, um, and with the upcoming next issue edition. Um, with Leslie having sort of, I guess, simultaneous conversations with two scholars, plus a kind of collage vision. Um, uh, there's all these different modes and ways that the, that the text lives and has its origin story. And I'm wondering if you see any through lines with that or any relationships with that and your um, chairpersonship of, of a department and thinking about media, um, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it um, kind of speaks to those questions that I was having entering into the project and thinking also about its utility and, and how it can be socialized. You know, how can elements of it be taken up, um, you know, in the classroom, um, and um, yeah, just how it can be activated, what, what more it can sort of generate on its own terms. Um, because of course, for every issue, um, there's the text, but then there's the meta text, you know, very plural. I mean, there's so many, um, uh, you know, different writers and uh, theater directors and artists and exhibitions and sort of just this wealth of um, material that kind of tumbles out. And so that's sort of really curious to me when I think about all the kind of next lives it can have is that there's just so much to kind of, um, you know, further, further develop um, because every reader, every student will bring something um, different to it, but, um, but I think that that kind of polyvocality is um, strangely enough, because it wasn't planned this way, but it was sort of like it started with Rhea, singular author, though talking about making an image together. And then it goes to Fia and Pradeep and this sort of co-chair relationship and this way that I was aware that they had spent this, um, certain period of time intensively thinking about the image for all these years in a school environment. And now it's sort of like becomes Leslie and, you know, um, Deb and Arielle, and here we are at three. So, um, you know, it's like, uh, it keeps sort of mutating and gathering more, more, more like collective voices. Um, yeah, if I remember my elementary school math, which I understand has changed, five is next in the pattern. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, I think, I think it's so, um, I, I'm really, just to get back to the kind of scale, the, the simultaneous modesty of the scale and expansiveness because of that kind of modesty, because it's not like, um, you know, we're going to make a textbook on photography 21st century or 2020s, you know, um, and almost starting with that monumentality is so much more limiting. So the sort of open rolling process is what allowed this PPI to, to then intersect with teaching photographs, um, invite Fia and Pradeep to, to make this issue and to make this meditation um, and then it, you know, it keeps going. And so, um, yeah, maybe I'm just thinking of ways in which I myself have thought about the shifting, um, 
publication landscape or way or uses of publications. Um, and I think the actual, the, the, I don't even think this word is the best word, but the, the modesty or the small scale is almost the biggest sort of most expansive element as opposed to um, some smaller scale publications, which inherently are ephemeral as in they're gonna go away. They have an obsolescence or they have a, they have a read them and recycle them kind of um, vibe. So yeah, I wonder Pradeep if you, now that we've been processing the publication sort of in public over these two events and, um, and, and now it's kind of launched, if you have any, on behalf of yourself and Fia, any um, thoughts about from your own tangential tributary where this work will go? I think before that, like I was just trying to think with the conversation you were having now, and I was going back earlier to when Shannon said like this larger time frame of projects and time frame of making work. And obviously this comes from a uh, visiting artist lecture that I'd done at Pratt a couple of years ago then, and the same ideas, some of them were already kind of boiling up then. And then I had done that residency for a year at the Elizabeth Foundation where I had started to explore this work. And I kept thinking that within that art context, I mean, I had exhibitions and then I, I mean, I had works up on the wall and I had a handout. And then I was trying to think of that gap between seeing those images on the wall, the handout, which is one page kernel of this text, and then what we've produced in here, like 5,000 words plus the questions, the images, the workshop and all this other stuff. And so it's making me kind of think that in visual art, so in image making, that there is this whole other life of thought that is there as a kind of a ballast to these images or as a form of thinking that is not legible in most formats that we present our work in public. So for me, there's something valuable about even something hinted between Rhea's project and this one and maybe Leslie's that it's showing students that there is kind of like this massive subterranean soil of thinking and how it is so much part of the making. The making itself may not always register all of this and the writing may not immediately tow in the images, but it's very much in that same universe. So that for me is a super valuable thing. It's not something that I've seen that clearly. And I think for maybe for all artists, but for artists like me who are immigrants or coming from other cultural contexts and making work in those contexts, you have to create those contexts, I mean, the contextual tissue around your ideas. And the only way, or you have to use everything at your, um, in your means. And that would mean writing, and it would mean the ideas of other people that you were trying to think alongside with or think through. And then it is also the images that you're making and putting out as an offer, I mean, you know, in front of people to kind of decode or enjoy or to kind of make sense of. So somehow that process is being rattled, I feel a little bit with the BPI thing in a very valuable way. Um, and I think for me just understanding fear's own practice and mine a little more clearly, and you realize that there is something where there isn't that kind of hold of the image operating as a large format 30 by 40 image per se. And there isn't even all this material that we're thinking through, there is a kind of a politics, there's all kinds of ideas in there. But again, that churn and the friction is what then leeches onto the images in some fashion, one hopes. Um, yeah. Really, really cool. Um, I like, I like, uh, sort of concluding on that note. I um, wanna thank Chris, uh, Pradeep, Fia in absentia, Shannon, um, Barbara, Karen, um, Margaret at Printed Matter, David Senior, Sunel, 
everyone at Printed Matter. Um, and uh, I don't know if Dancing Foxes wants to say how to get your hands on this. I saw a pile of them this morning, so I know they exist. Um, so maybe, maybe we can end on that note. Yes, please come buy it on our website, www.dfpress.us or .org, either one. Okay. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thanks Bye. so much. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.
Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending this virtual event. I wish it were otherwise and we could be together for an intimate evening celebrating a beautiful new book. But this is the best we're going to do for now. And I think it's a good alternative given our current situation. And tonight, I am truly delighted to celebrate Media Burn and Arm and the Making of an Image. The book is a tour de force. It has a wonderful introduction by Chip Lord that sets a scene. Author Steve Seed contributes a brilliant page turner narrative of the 1975 Cow Palace event. And further, Adam Michaels designed a publication that seamlessly lays out a deep dive into a historic event that continues to in interest and engage us today. I am very pleased to co-host this Bay Area book launch with Rena Branston Gallery and UC Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. I want to emphatically thank both organizations. In addition to marking the book launch tonight, we are honoring Chip Lord's solo exhibition at the Rena Branston Gallery. So I hope you all have a chance to check that exhibition out when you have a chance. And before I go any further, I would like to introduce myself, especially to those of you who I have not met. I am Robin Wright and I own Wright Editions. I've published a number of artist books and monographs over the last 15 years. And I'm very grateful to co-publish this book, Media Burn, Ant Farm and the Making of an Image with Inventory Press. Especially since it spotlights an important art performance that took place over 45 years ago in our backyard. So here's the book. I'm going to hold it up. I hope you all can see it. The book is available for purchase and can be obtained by going on my website, which is writeeditions.com. That's R I T E editions.com, and you'll find the book for sale there. The book is also available through Inventory Press and DAP Art Book. Now I want to get you into the right state of mind. So Ian Sicarella is going to screen share a short film clip edited by SF MoMA of the event in 1975. Today, some people decided to stage what they call the ultimate media event. Now, right away, everybody perks up. The ultimate? Hmm, that's interesting. They told us... It was a ridiculous sort of fictional idea of spectacle, right? Which derived from just, you know, how can we make this one image, like a car crashing through a pyramid of TVs? That's the image we want. But then... As we started thinking about how to do that and how to how to uh, frame it, you know, it became more performative. It became it had all these aspects. One of them was the sculptural object of the car itself, which was at the center. Just six months ago, this was a '59 Cadillac Eldorado Barretts convertible. Curtis took that on mostly. Are you worried about your chances for survival? Um, I'm more worried about America's chances for survival than than my own personal chances for survival. It was fictional in the sense that it was... We made uh, it up. It was an event, but it was an event that was twisted out of all proportion. It had the politician coming to speak, you know. Uh, it had the red, white, and blue bunting because it was July 4th. We had rental cops, we had these barriers. It was all a play on that, on those kind of rules of, of spectacle. And of course, there had to be a press area, and you had to wear your press pass to get into the press area. And all of the local TV crews showed up wearing their press passes. Of course, the other great interview is one of our crew interviewing one of the local uh, TV people. Right. What brings you out here today? Uh, what I have to say, I'll say on Channel 4, 5.30 and 6.30. What angle are you taking on the start? All of these elements are really part of media burden. Although the final product is basically a video tape that's a document of it and a postcard image. I think we also had a, a, a rather naive idea that if we could get this image into the broadcast news flow, it would connect with people. 
And in, in fact, society, you know, the well, local maybe. stations covered it. Well, presumably, the message is for the media. Get it? Don Knapp for Action News at the Cal Palace. I don't think I want to get it. <laughs> One of them, I think it was NBC, the network picked it up and it ran on the national news. Tom Weinberg got a UPI uh, oh, yeah. shot onto, on, onto it and it went to every newspaper in the country. And, and that's where, when a thing started being picked up. Yeah. From it's a still, still in the caption. caption. It's still in the caption, black and white. Yeah. yeah. But we didn't control the caption. So I hope that primed you for what's to come. And now I want to get you to the heart of the program. The lineup includes an introduction by Constance Llewellyn, who will give you local and conceptual context for Media Burn. She will be followed by a conversation between Chip Lord and Steve Seed, moderated by Tanya Zimbardo. And there'll be some special appearances as well. If time allows, a question and answer session will follow the program. And I wanna encourage you all to submit your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom program. So now I have the great pleasure of introducing Constance Llewellyn. Constance Llewellyn is adjunct curator, curator at the University of California Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, where first she was matrix curator and subsequently senior curator who organized many major exhibitions including Ant Farm 1968 to 1978 with Steve Seed in 2004. Then in 2007, A Rose Has No Teeth, Bruce Nauman in the 1960s, followed by State of Mind, New California Art circa 1970 with Karen Moss in 2011. And that is just a short list of the many notable exhibitions Connie has organized. This year in 2020, she co-curated Stephen Kaltenbach, The Beginning and the End, at the, Medi at the Minetti Schramm Museum, and co-curated a show about the Reese Paley Gallery with Jordan Stein at Cushion Works. Further, Constance Llewellyn is author of 500 Cab Street, David Iron's House, and co-author of Bruce Nauman's Spatial Encounters, both published by UC Press. So now to Connie Llewellyn. Well, that, I hope, gets you in the mood. Obviously, San Francisco in the 1970s was unlike today's city of unaffordable housing, homelessness, and extreme wealth fueled by Silicon Valley. 50 years ago, the Bay Area led the country in educational reform sparked by the 1964 free speech movement at UC Berkeley. Protests against the war in Vietnam, though nationwide, were especially strong here. And while social movements of the era were on a national scale, their rise was particularly strong in California. 1966 saw the founding of the Black Panther Party in Oakland and the National Organization for Women in Washington, DC. Ignited by the 1969 Stonewall riots in New York, gay life and political activity found its nucleus in San Francisco. In addition, a new environmental awareness led to the first Earth Day in 1970 and the first Greenpeace action in 1971. The Haight-Ashbury neighborhood was the epicenter of the new counterculture whose ethos was expressed in Stuart Brand's Whole Earth Catalog, which first appeared in 1968 and emphasized ecology and the do-it-yourself spirit. Rock music of such groups as the Jefferson Airplane, performed at the Fillmore West and avant-garde music of Terry Riley and Steve Reich signaled a new musical form. Also, there was a growing interest in Zen Buddhism and Gestalt therapy, and let's not forget widespread use of recreational drugs. In the context of the enormous cultural and social changes in society at large, traditional modes of art making seemed entirely inadequate to many young artists here and elsewhere. They de-emphasized the creation of saleable paintings and sculpture in favor of works in which the concept and or the process that went into their making were primary and documented them with some combination of maps, photographs, drawings, video, and text modes that pervade, modes that pervade artistic practice today, as well as such democratic forms as mail art and artist books, moving freely between all of these according to which was most appropriate to the idea. Since these new art forms were ill-suited or disregarded by traditional art venues, they colonized alternative sites such as the city streets and non-art spaces. Whether or not actively engaged in the political and cultural movements of the time, 
These artists were still caught up in the desire for change and held the fervent belief that they were forging a new, more open society. For all of these reasons, and because of its relative paucity of cultural institutions, traditions, and art markets, vis-a-vis -vis New York, for example, California represented the future and freedom from, for experimentation of all kinds. Ant Farm came together as a collaborative in 1968. It was founded by Chip Lord and Doug Michaels, joined in 1969 by Curtis Schreier and Hudson Marquez. The Ant Farmers were among the many artists who came to the Bay Area in the 1960s and became fully immersed in the counterculture. Chip Lord arrived in 1968 to attend one of Lawrence and Anne Halperin's legendary workshops, which encouraged new relationships to space and collectivity. Trained as architects, they rejected the corporate architecture world, devising new modes of shelter, such as inflatables, and engaged in the new fields of performance and video art made possible by the advent of the Sony PortaPak. This is the environment in which Ant Farm created Media Burn, which Steve dissects and amplifies in his new book, Media Burn, Ant Farm and the Making of an Image. Steve and Chip Lord will now have a conversation with moderated by Tanya Zimbardo. I will now introduce them. Steve Side and I co-curated the Ant Farm Retrospective, which opened at UC Berkeley in 2004 and subsequently toured museums across the country. At the time, Steve was media curator at the Pacific Film Archive, where he presented hundreds of public programs highlighting experimental media, as well as overlooked and spurned genre of cinema. Currently, he has turned his attention to a pictorial history of the movie tie-in novel, a decidedly cheesier, this is, this is uh, Steve's word, cheesier project. Side looks forward to the day when attending a film screening is just an intellectual and emotional danger, not an outright health hazard. Chip Lord, as we know, is a founding member of Ant Farm. He identifies himself as a media artist and has worked with video since 1971. With Ant Farm, he produced the video classic Media Burn, of course, and the Eternal Frame, as well as the public sculpture Cadillac Ranch in Amarillo, Texas. His work blends documentary and experimental practice, and he often collaborates with other artists. His exhibition at the Rena Branston, as Robin mentioned, is titled Chip Lord, Folding Back Time, Form, and Format, is open by appointment until January 30th. Tanya Zimbardo has shown performance-based film and video work from the 1970s at different venues, and as assistant curator of media arts at SFMOMA, she curates contemporary exhibitions, including Future Histories, The Astor Gates, and Colleen Smith, which is now on view through May. Okay, take it away. Um, well, thank you, Connie. Um, I don't know if people can see my video, but just wanted to welcome everyone and say how important it was to me as a graduate student in 2004 when Steve and Connie organized the Ant Farm Retrospective um, at Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. What a revelation that was um, to learn uh, extensively about the practice and working collectively um, together. And I want to thank you know both of you for not only that show, but in the publication, but the range of programs you've done um, that have brought light and a real in-depth look at uh, work from this region. I found myself about 10 years later in conversation so, with Steve about his curatorial work, his earlier history of curating video, including uh, working with Chip Lord. And I, at the time, this was just a, a book that was a, a vision that he was working towards without a publisher. And so I want to thank Robin, you in particular, and Inventory Press for supporting this really just tremendous publication, which is also um, something that is so, I think, unique to be able to have something that is both first and foremost Steve's writing, uh, but also the, the range of visual imagery and um, you could say minutia, but all of the, the receipts, the sketches, the correspondence that went into this large scale performance, the resulting video, and then the sort of uh, afterlife of a number of these different postcards. And so uh, it's really for many of us to have a work that has become such a touchstone, so key for many educators and artists in particular decades later um, to have this resource and one that's as you know, thrilling as the original 
performance and this sort of iconic image of a car sailing into, uh, into the future, into uh, a pyramid of television. And um, at one point, Steve writes that one of the reporters uh, who's featured in the video um, is saying that if smashing a 59 Cadillac into a wall of old television sets is art, then the world may rest tonight with a new masterpiece. But Steve notes that Media Burn isn't a masterpiece in a sense of an extraordinary artistic achievement that's fixed and unassailable, but rather it's a forceful, prescient, and open-ended work that even attempts and, and anticipates to guide its afterlife. And so I think tonight we'll be looking at a number of the kind of rich visual material, um, the different players, the different perspectives on this performance and how it was conceived over time. Uh, one of the things that's clear is that, that not all people may know is that this was something that was being theorized by members of Ant Farm three years before um, the final event took place on July 4th, 1975. And so one of the things, Steve, that you had said um, in 2015 was that you wanted to address that the anti-television sentiment was just um, a sort of at the surface of what was a really complex collision of ideas and images. Um, and so I wanted to start with asking you about what were some of the key questions for you when you were approaching this work in the beginning to think about it as as a more extended writing piece? Hmm. That's asking for the crux. <laughs> um, what puzzled me about, you know, after having worked on uh, the Ant Farm retrospective with Connie Llewellyn, what, what puzzled me was how much more was still sitting there. You know, it was kind of a vast and well-documented uh, exhibition, but it just seemed that anywhere you would scratch, there was still more backstory and every backstory had a backstory. And, you know, it, it occurred to me that, you know, Media Burn began with this image and then another one and then another one and then another one and then another one and then another and another and another. And maybe the same image, maybe not. But even though the performative aspect of Media Burn culminated in this sim simple image by John Turner. Um, there was an enormous uh, and evolving history that precedes it, that goes back um, oh, three or four years of, of serious uh, contemplation and uh, investigation preparing drawings before there was even an event uh, or a concept, you know, discovering things. Uh, and that's what I wanted to get at through the books so that it wouldn't simply stop there. <laughs> and one of the origins, or and I think there's, for me, what's interesting is to see both uh, moments within Ant Farm's practice leading up to this, but also then these sort of other cultural events. I mean, this morning I was looking at Evil Knievel, March 1972. There's footage online of uh, Evil Knievel, the legendary stuntman, um, at the Cow Palace, uh, launching over, um, I think it was 15 cars, um, and sort of wiping out and sliding through the, out, the doors outside into the Cow Palace, but that there was um, a, a kind of culture of, of car culture and spectacle um, that was, you know, among the points of inspiration. And so, Chip, I was curious for you um, what some of the first conversations were around thinking of this, what would become the image that Steve refers to of the car sailing into the, the televisions? Yes, well, you know, there was a uh, a movement of uh, in the early 70s of people who just began shooting video and connecting over a network uh, that was fostered by a, a magazine called Radical Software. And uh, Ant Farm bought a porter pack in 1970. 
and we just began shooting. We didn't have any training in film or anything like that. We were architects, trained as architects. But, um, you know, there was uh, a book, Guerrilla Television, and we happened to meet uh, Michael Schamberg and Rain Dance and other uh, early video uh, makers. And um, this became a sort of the text of, of a kind of uh, idea that maybe this portable low cost video could democratize television and ultimately bankrupt television. It's taken more than 45 years for that to happen, but I think we might be on the verge now of bankrupting uh, broadcast television. Um, and, you know, actually we should, we should probably cue the, uh, the slides now because there's, a, there's one of the early drawings uh, from 1973 um, that's sort of pertinent at this point in time. And, and we'll go right past the uh, media burn and we'll go past guerrilla television. Uh, and what influenced by that, uh, by the guerrilla television movement. And in 1972, Doug Michaels and I uh, were in uh, Texas to do a project, an architectural project. We, we left behind in San Francisco, Curtis Schreier and uh, Hudson Marquez, the other members of Ant Farm. But Doug made this drawing in January, 1973 of you know, labeled media vision of a car crashing through a wall of TVs. And I think it was uh, in a sense, a literal uh, construction of an image that would stand in for what the philosophy of this, of the ideology of early video was about. Um, so that was uh, January 1973. Uh, if we go to the next slide, immediately about the same time, Curtis began sketching uh, because of this discussion that we were having, we were having at long distance, but a logo for Media Burn. And this is the uh, cocktail napkin sketch. And the next slide <coughs> is uh, a more finished uh, version of, of the logo that became the official logo. And it shows up in many places um, in the book. Um, and the next slide uh, shows also a drawing by Curtis Schreier, uh, the Phantom Dream Car classic cutaway view. And we actually had this car as a company car uh, a 59 Cadillac uh, convertible, but it was in a fender bender. And uh, that, I'm not sure when that was, I think it was about a year before the actual media burn. Um, and at that point we decided, well, this has to be the car that we will drive through the TVs. Um, so if you go to the, the next couple of slides, and Steve, feel free to chime in at any point here. Um, we began um, converting this uh, 59 Cadillac and to make it an appropriate car to drive through a wall of burning television sets, if you will. It had to have a giant uh, central fin uh, like the uh, dream cars of the 50s had. And it already had the two largest production tail fins. Um, and <clears throat> next, and, and also the, well, Steve, maybe you can describe why there were only two two people seated in the Phantom Dream Car. Well, actually, I, I'd like to go back uh, a year and a half or two years. Um, there was this other kind of curious project that you worked on that some people might have heard of called Cadillac Ranch. Uh, and that was introduced in the spring of 1974, uh, the late spring of 1974, built uh, along the highway in Amarillo, Texas. Um, and just a few weeks later, um, about two weeks later, Ant Farm was given an invitation to uh, uh, participate in a street fair that was going to be in, I believe, September of 1974. They were given just a couple of months to come up with a project you know, develop it, pitch it, have it approved. Uh, but the invitation really was spurred on by, in a sense, the Cadillac. Uh, Cadillac Ranch was such an outrageous event 
that uh, the stature of Ant Farm uh, just kind of blew up. And it was, in fact, the second important project in Texas. They had already done the House of the Century outside of Houston. Um, but I, I really feel that even though independent video was a strong informing aspect, the automobile itself is something that literally drove and farm. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <clears throat> the next slide continues the, um, well, here's an example of the logo being used in several purposes, including the souvenir booklet. Uh, at the top is the invitation postcard, the black and white photo. And that was sent out to friends in the Bay Area who ended up becoming the audience, which we will see in the next slide uh, at the, the Media Burn. And this, this particular shot uh, shows how the, the structure that bridged across between two parking lots at the Cow Palace was the perfect um, sort of overflow viewing spot. I think there were maybe three or 400 people there. Uh, mm -hmm. And the postcard admitted a car load. Next. And also you can see in, you know, uh, in the middle of this photograph, uh, there are three people with uh, different aspects of a porta pack and that's optic nerve. John Rogers, Jim Mayer with the porta pack on his back and then Jules Backus doing the audio. And they were really close companions, compatriots of uh, Ant Farm. That's right. And the next shot shows um, Doug Michaels uh, the morning of the uh, Media Burn event you know, with the car. And uh, Doug died in 2003. So in some ways, we should uh, dedicate this event to him. Um, next slide. So I want to go pretty quickly through these. This is, shows the uh, renter cops who, who uh, control the press area, press pass was required, nut shot. Uh, and um, also we had two levels of security. We had to have secret service agents as well as renter cops uh, to protect the artist president. And of course we had to have next slide, a um, souvenir stand and uh, which sold postcards of Cadillac Ranch as well as t-shirts for $5. And next slide. And example of the t-shirts modeled by Tom Weinberg and myself. Next slide. And um, this is an interesting shot because it shows the uh, two, two members of the establishment press corps on the far right. Uh, then to their left, two members of the alternative press, uh, John Carroll, uh, who wrote for the Village Voice. And I don't know the name of the other um, alternative reporter there. And if we move further to the left, behind the stack of TVs, you can just get a glimpse of Uncle Buddy, who was in the process of pouring kerosene onto the uh, backs of the TV sets. Next shot. And of course, before it was July 4th, so there had to be a, a politician had to come deliver a speech and this was the um, artist president. Uh, and actually we do have a, uh, several um, additional guests who we're going to talk to later in the evening. And one of them, Doug Hall, who was the, uh, who performed the role of the artist president. Steve. It's also in this, in this photograph, you can see a uh, on the right side are again um, uh, the independent uh, subversive press, uh, guerrilla television with uh, Sony porta packs uh, and being quite portable and inexpensive. And on the left, you see the establishment, you know, mainstream uh, press corps uh, carrying 16 millimeter cameras on their shoulders and, uh, you know, kind of encumbered. And, uh, you know, I've, I've always liked this photo because it shows the division between the, uh, the two technological sides. Yeah. 
let's go to the next let's see how many shots we have left we, well we played the national anthem and then the next slide will show the several shots here of the impact image uh, because we had several photographers up close and well, this is uh, Diane Hall's image. Uh, there were about a half a dozen photographers. Uh, Diane was a lead photographer, Edmund Shea, uh, John Turner was there, Phil McKenna was there, uh, Lynn uh, Adler from Optic Nerve was taking a lot of photographs. And this was the first one to be selected as the kind of representative image. Uh, and it was sent through wire services later this afternoon uh, and you know made it out to uh, daily newspapers around the country and then eventually that was supplanted by John Turner's color image uh, taken from a slightly different angle and that that is the one that became the famous postcard yeah. and that's the next shot is not John Turner's photo but uh, from the same position that he he photographed almost <laughs> and um let's just keep going through the the slides uh, another this is phil mckenna's mm -hmm. impact shot and beautiful daily city in the background and here is the uh the victory lap uh around the parking lot of the cow palace next shot and finally, of course, the wrap up and each of the local TV stations uh, had, you know, a film wrap up, which um, we eventually used in the end of, uh, of the tape, because they were so ironic, you know, they were the um, both the comments of the anchor teams and the reporter who many of them thought it was just ridiculous that they had to be out there covering this event. And then just minutes later, uh, there is the wonderful, mournful shot of that very tow truck pulling uh, <laughs> the Phantom Dream Car uh, yeah. back into the city. That's featured that also captured on film. Yeah. Okay, next. So after Media Burn, the Phantom Dream Car, first it was uh, taken back to our studio at Pier 40 on the Embarcadero. And then uh, we were able to, next please, um, bring it back in uh, 2004 for the uh, exhibition at the Berkeley Art Museum. Next shot. And it has a permanent home in the Belcher Arts Center in Kansas City. That's kind of a long story of how it ended up in middle America, but um, it's fortunate that it did because it was able to return to Berkeley for the uh, Amphar 1968 to 1978 exhibition. And I think there's one more shot before we go um, into a conversation. Um, this is the back of the souvenir booklet, which you could purchase for a dollar. And um, there was a Potentially, you could cut out that postcard and send it to Uncle Buddy and give us feedback on if you were at Media Burn of what you um, experienced. And Chip, tell us a little bit about Uncle Buddy, because there's also a number of great documents, um, including selling or attempting to sell the, the Phantom Dream Car post performance. Yeah. Well, Uncle Buddy was uh, an, an invented uh, character, and I think he first appeared uh, as part of the San Fr uh, SF MoMA Artist Soapbox Derby earlier um, spring 1975. I, I, I was the Ant Farm member who played Uncle Buddy, and um, Uncle Buddy was based on a typical uh, used car salesman, so I had a kind of cheap suit and uh, and when, when Media Burn rolled around, it was necessary to have somebody to light the fire, let's say. And um, we didn't want 
to anybody to know who it was, you know, and their actual identity. And what happened was that, of course, the fire department, the Brisbane Fire Department came uh, once the smoke was burning and they couldn't find anybody who was in charge of this event to issue a citation to. Mm -hmm. Dispersed authority. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, I think another key thing in, in watching the video again is really just the, the kind of primacy of also all of the people involved, which some of these images you both highlighted is all of these other collective groups that you've enlisted to volunteer their, their footage talents, their roles as performers, photography, um, as well as sort of this larger peer oriented audience. Um, and I was also just curious about how you guys approached both the mainstream press as well as you might call them the counterculture press in terms of covering the event, because it wasn't a surprise that there was a sort of statement of actually this is what's going to happen. Yeah, well, we sent out a press release, you know, a couple of weeks before the event and uh, specifically to the three uh, main network affiliates in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, but we also had been interviewed by a reporter for a TV station in Sacramento, and uh, so we invited him as well. He came with a uh, high-speed camera, which eventually became our slow-motion footage, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it was, we sent the press pass with the press release, and we said, you will need to wear your press pass to enter the press area, and all, all of them showed up wearing their press passes, which we were quite happy about. So they bought into the, the structure that we had created, and we really set up barriers so that the public could be kept as, at a safe distance from the potential danger of the, uh, you know, because without that, people would have wanted to get much closer. I'm curious about also because you you incorporate the footage from a number of the the coverage is just the the press's attitude towards I don't want to say mockery but just sort of dismissive or um, very clearly trying to deflect that they're you know under critique um, and not wanting to get further into that. Um, do you how did you see that at the time? the kind of strategy that the press was doing in that moment? Well, I mean, I think we were, we, we had, had an understanding of that form. It was such a typical form, you know, sending out the reporter and they come back. And plus that um, the only way art was ever covered on television was one of two ways. If, it, if something, if a painting sold for a high, you know, figure, it would, that would be news. But otherwise, it was, you know, what are the crazy artists up to now? It's always that sense of uh, uh, depreciation of the, of the work, I think. And of course, they didn't understand that there was really a revolution going on in the art world as throughout the 1970s, as, you know, traditional forms of painting and sculpture were being superseded by performance, uh, video and these these other experimental ways of, of realizing work so it you know that was that decade was the beginning of something that we now understand is the foundation of of sort of the contemporary art world and so, uh, yeah go ahead steve it's also interesting for me because the the press gets thoroughly co-opted and they don't just get co-opted in the straight on ironic way of showing their own stupidity but there is so much documentation of the event that they just become kind of pulled into this maelstrom of of documentation where there's video being shot inside the phantom dream car as it's being driven there's documentation of the film crews from the networks there are, are photographs of the car there are photographs of the audience you know at at every level the entire kind of visual spectacle is being uh, captured and um, run through a cuisine art of, of a sort. Um, 
And you know, so the, the mainstream press is not only just being their own kind of snarky self, um, but they, they get uh, kind of turned around uh, and co-opted themselves in a beautiful way. Yeah, and also we, uh, we realized that we could never ask them for the footage. So we had to drag a very heavy Sony 8650 video recorder over to Jim Newman's house because he had cable. <laughs> and, we, and so that night after, you know, getting up very early in the morning and all the energy of, of, of the event itself, we had to go record uh, our own video of the newscast in order to have it. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the other key references, of course, uh, is sort of political events and the decision you know, I think a kind of confluence of factors, but having Independence Day and then having Doug Hall as the artist president with John F. Kennedy impersonation. How was some of the, the work you were doing with Top Value Television and the Republican Convention informing this idea of not only working with the media, but having, you know, a sort of political figure with security detail well, it was just, uh, you know, that I think working with TV TV informed more or less the production style because Media Burn was a, a fiction, but it was uh, filmed or actually videotaped in a documentary fashion and in, in some ways in a traditional documentary form. But, um, you know, I think maybe we should bring Doug Hall since he's here since the artist president came up to comment on that. Um, and maybe we should bring Igor into the conversation and Curtis also because, um, you know, the ending of the, the, of the video earlier, uh, we didn't control the caption. And we should throw that question over to, to <laughs> Igor or to Doug. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. What's the question? Uh, well, the question is, uh, where did that John Kennedy impersonation come from? Well, that's such a long story. I don't know that I want to intervene into this really interesting discussion of media burn. I mean, you know, briefly, I just say that the, um, my college roommate, Jody Proctor, and I, when we were in college in Massachusetts, um, were really interested in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the kind of celebrity of Kennedy. Um, and, and like a, a lot of us, I think, you know, our interest in media saw him as the first media president who was constructed out of um, all of these images, a, a kind of shared moment in time that was generated through these devices. So, you know, all of that was really interesting. And, um, you know, when we were in college, I, 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 I joined a, um, a uh, literary club and, and, and I had to deliver a speech and it was, supposed to be funny and clever and stuff. And I don't know how clever it was, but so Jody became my Sorensen. He became a speech writer and together we wrote the speech and we went into the club beforehand and um, sort of snooped around and looked and saw like it had like famous people who had been members of the club and stuff. And so we looked at the whole situation. So the speech ended up being a speech about making a speech about the club and it was sort of the beginning of thinking about these uh, rhetorical devices that, you know, sort of look at the situation in which you're performing as part of the, of the material that you're, you're, you know, critiquing or living through, I suppose. So, um, but, you know, Chip and I, you know, Diane knew Hudson uh, in college. I, mean, I remember running into Ant Farm on, um, Gay Five Road, where they were doing a performance, and Diane looked and said, "Oh my God, that's that's uh, um, Hudson Marquez. He went to art school with me." So there was that connection, and we became very close. We shared studio space for a while, and it was um, yeah, we we collaborated on a lot of things, and I would say Chip and I are still intimate friends. Right. Right. Nice. Uh, I wanted to, well, I wanted to add one thing because the, the speech that the artist president uh, delivered at Media Burn was based on, or you, a template that we used was a, an article that uh, George McGovern wrote for Rolling Stone magazine 
of, of course, two years uh, after Nixon had resigned in, in disgrace over Watergate. And it was a way, and, and Nixon had beaten McGovern in, by a landslide in the 1972 election. Uh, so Rolling Stone magazine gave McGovern an opportunity to publicly respond. And we began with that, that speech. And then I think it got passed back and forth to Jody. He cut, and, and, uh, but it became the, the a form that uh, we gave to the artist president. Yeah, I had to, I changed the only, the changes I remember is that I needed a lot of broad A's and there weren't <laughs> enough broad A's in there. So I had to kind of play around with it a bit, but yeah. And I remember Jody, I think wrote a first draft that was just too wacky and, you know, just didn't but work at all. So. Some parts of that speech still exist. Of the original? Yeah. You know, yeah. The first run at it. But yeah. there's some rude remarks written on. on yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> It also, it the, the next uh, important project that Ant Farm does is the Eternal Frame, in which, in a sense, they're they're restaging the Zapruder footage. And so, rather, you referred to it as it really was a collaboration between two organizations. Yeah, the artist yeah. going Ant Farm. So, I, I always have problems with that. <laughs> but what, what I was going to say is that not only is there, it's the first, in a sense staging of the artist president in, in Media Burn in this way, but the vehicle, the uh, convertible Continental, Lincoln Continental that is used to drive the artist president and the media matadors, the artist dummies uh, around the event is also the vehicle in which the artist president uh, will be finally find his image death in Dealey Plaza in Dallas, uh, just a few months later. Yeah, we referred to it as assassination mobile. Yeah. So you can really see that this is, you know, they're like interlinked uh, projects that uh, say a lot about image, you know, uh, proliferation. So we might, uh... We, we might ask uh, Igor Vampos a question at this point and introduce him, uh, member of the Yes Men. Uh, th this idea that we didn't control the caption after the event w went out publicly. Um, I think he may be familiar with that process. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it seems like you guys had a press release and, um, you know, it seems like you presented a kind of complete event. So I, I don't know. I mean, it, you didn't control the process, but you uh, created a story that it seems like everybody repeated to, you know, to one degree or another. So I, I mean, I, I always see these things as a kind of collaboration and you know, you know, it's, it's a blind collaboration where the media that you're working with are not somebody that you can control but there's somebody that you can feed information to. And the more precise you are about what you feed them, the more, uh, the easier it is for them to repeat it verbatim. <laughs> and so, I mean, I think that, I mean, I think that you already said going into it uh, before you did it, that you kind of knew how they handled, how they covered these events. So you kind of, <laughs> I mean, you by, by giving them the press release and then giving them the sort of enough mystery, it seems like you were collaborating. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, in, in the telling of the story. Yeah. So, C Certainly in the sense that uh, their, their cameras, the local news cameras were filming and we were using their footage uh, in our final edited production of Media Burn, which has become the record over the years. That's true. How much was it also for the, I mean, what, what did you think of the, as the spectacle though? So I, I know it, it, it gets re um, combined into your own, you know, into your own work and, and videos, but how much, how important uh, was the spectacle on that day when it, when it go, went out on the news and, and how, what did you feel? I don't know. What did you feel was the result of, of the news coverage? Because since you were 
being covered as the weirdos doing that thing. <laughs> yeah. I think there were two choices, right? One was money, the other was weird or something, and and you got yeah. weird. And so, uh, yeah, yeah. Did, the, did the weird work for you? you? You know, I think what was interesting was there was no spokesperson for the media to interview. So they were forced into conforming to the the narrative that we were laying out. And so the the artist president became the the voice in a way. But whatever that speech was, it was the the only thing. And of course, they they didn't really want to use very much of that speech because that would give it too much credence. Mm -hmm. But there was enough uh, spectacle. There was the audience. There were the souvenirs. They they all they got all of those cutaway shots, you know. And it was very easy for them to to just uh, put it together in an, in, in an edited story with this ironic uh, ending, let's say. But you know, it all went for the, the pile of the burning TVs as the last shot, you know. Uh, what does it all mean? Well, the question is for the media. <laughs> you know, that's one quote uh, from, you know, I don't know which station that was. But local media has a tendency to be, you know, create, I, 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 uh, I can't remember, but I think it was the last, probably the last segment in the evening news. And so they have this tendency to use either happy news or odd news as a way of kind of ending their program. We did a project later called the Emerald News Tapes, where we actually were artists in residence at a small television station in Texas, where we really sort of tried to look at the theater of local small format television, I mean, by small format in a, in a smallish community. And, you know, Chip played the weatherman, Jody played the um, sportscaster, and I was the anchor. And, you know, we adopted sort of the, the, the mannerisms and worked with, worked with the actual news people who were trying to teach us how to behave in a way that was appropriate for, um, a, you know, their, 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 you know, system of, Hey, so I just saw that Ian has stacked up a series of questions here, uh, yeah. including this number one here. With the increased siloing of our media consumption, how do you think Media Burn addresses similar or the same issue that was happening at the time it was enacted, or does it? And so I, I was curious, having seen that, that was the first of a series of questions he put up here. And I just wanted to go back to that while we have a pause. What do you guys think? <laughs> Uh, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Siloing. You know, in, uh, I don't really think so much about this, this idea of siloing because it, to move media burn forward for me is, uh, and I might have a, an opinion that is unpopular, but I think the media won. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we got burned uh, and that the apparatus has become so fetishized that people would not part with their media, much less destroy it. Um, so, you know, I don't, uh, the siloing, the, you know, uh, social media and news and whatever, uh, um, to me, it's all just become um, a kind of sensorium that you, you know, find pleasure inside of. But I, I remember, we, I think it was uh, in conjunction with the exhibition at the Berkeley Art Museum, we did a screening and one of the, and there were a number of students there. So that was 15 years ago when, and they were college age students. And somebody came up to me afterwards and said, that it's as relevant today as it was then. <laughs> you know? And at that point it was already 20 years old so it you know there was something that communicated to that younger generation at that point in time um, i think it still i think it still worked to drive a, a car through televisions <laughs> years ago yes. but i don't i don't know what it does now <laughs> right. i mean i don't i don't I, like what would the modern equivalent of media burn be and i because i it, and i don't 
I don't, I don't know. I just was, uh, after looking at this question, I just thought about it because I do feel like that it's a drastically different landscape now. Maybe it's massive hacking. Maybe it's, yeah. I mean, because, you know, re I mean, remember in 1970, there were three channels, ABC, CBS, and NBC. That was yeah. it. And so it was very easy to set them up as a, a, a target, um, much less, it's much more diffuse now. I don't think it's siloed. I think Steve's response is fabulous too. I think it's, you know, all of it, all of it is is out there and, and is 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 absolutely a sensorium. I think it's a fiction that that we're sort of, I think that that notion that we're sort of at the mercy of this huge monolith of of media is is not accurate. I think we 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 ingest it and we play around in it and we dream in it and you know as we do with everything. And I do think that with Ant Farm and a number of the other groups, it's also anticipating uh, networked culture, the idea of images going viral, of user-generated content, of, as well as you know counter journalism. Um, but there's no question that we both, you know, we're still dealing with the dominance of television. And I think with our last um, election cycle, seeing you know more money still being spent on ads, you know, than any time in the past, but that we're now dealing with, you know, misinformation through the internet, as you also point out, hacking, um, and this real attack, you know, under this, I'd like to say now recent, not current administration, um, of, you know, attack on the media and fake news, um, which I think has given a different, also sort of context and resonance for, for thinking of the role of media now. You know, I mean, we were making fake news back then, <laughs> but now, now we want a little bit of distance from the fake news because it's such a uh, damaging, uh, you know, when Trump says fake news, it's, it's such a damaging uh, reference, I think. Um, and Chip, another reference um, that's made in the video is also around um, a critique of sort of addiction to television and sort of malaise of sort of consumer consumption. Is that, do you feel now with contemporary landscape of people's relationship to sort of well, devices, the internet, a similar oh. concern or is it different because of that shift in the monopoly? It's, I, 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 I would suspect that the hours on the screen have gone up, you know, because in the mid 70s, it was it was easy to measure the Nielsen. In fact, I just heard a story on NPR about the fact that the Nielsen company that's always been the, uh, the gateway to advertising revenue for television networks, they don't know how to actually measure where people are, are watching and getting because people are using so many devices, you know, people using their iPhones to watch the news or to watch feature films and so forth. But, you know, I think we can guess that there's much more time spent on a screen now and, and you know, your iPhone will keep track of your screen time for you. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but that's probably not a measure that really has much importance. Yeah, it's also interesting that the primacy of the screen has declined. In a sense, as, as the screen proliferates, it becomes less important. It becomes, you know, the screen now is like an environmental presence. So you're not going, there's the screen and there's the screen. You're just inside. Yes, you know, it's, it's, it's Guy Debord, you know, come, come to reality. You know, where it's a seamless spectacle that's just... Uh, but it's not impervious, and Guy Debord would make us think that it's impervious. It seems to me, yeah. or that it's that it's so overwhelming and overpowering that we're we're sort of devastated by it. And I think going back to what I interpreted you saying, it's more rather a sensorium, you know, that we're engaged with. And it's a little bit like what Fuller uh, with, um, um, sorry, Marshall McLuhan. No, no, not McLuhan, but uh, Walter Benjamin says in uh, Art of the Age of Mechanical Reproduction at the end, 
where he talks about how architecture functions in a state of distraction. And we move through it and it totally imposes itself on our behavior and our thoughts. But we do it in a state of distraction. We're not really aware of it. And I think the same way with screens, we're seeing them out of the corner of eye, we're seeing advertisements, we're seeing them across buses, et cetera, et cetera. And they're part of the, the vocabulary that we absorb into our both conscious and unconscious. And I think we dream through these images, um, even or daydream maybe through these images. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> yep. The yep. question um, also for Steve and Chip about um, some of the ideas specifically coming out of art that informed the work and that maybe we can also think about um, how this performance differs from other forms of creative intervention of activists, um, even just looking at the, the rental agreement for the Cow Palace, it refers to it as a conceptual art event uh, for $100 <laughs> rental. Um, how did explicitly framing it um, as art um, support some of the ideas that you were trying to get across, um, both in terms of the performance, but also uh, in terms of how the media's reception of it? Well, I mean, I think that um, we, we didn't, that, that wasn't the central intention somehow. You know, actually we, uh, in Anfarm, we felt we were sort of outsiders we were outside the, the art world that revolved around the San Francisco Art Institute at that time. We were uh, on, on the side uh, of the, the Museum of Conceptual Art, you know, Tom Marioni's, uh, you know, it's a fantastic program, but we were, had been trained as architects. And so we, we felt we weren't part of that community and we didn't know exactly how to frame it as art. I mean, in our minds, yes, this is conceptual art, um, it made sense to put it in the agreement with the cow palace, I guess. But uh, where we went with it after that, after the fact, uh, after the, the video was completed, um, you know, it took it took a while for it to enter the uh, the flow of of the art world. I think. If if I could once again go back to the beginning. Uh, you know, there, there, there's a chapter in the book uh, yeah, sure. that talks about the when they were still in, uh, in, invited to the Houston event and uh, what was originally called Media Vision then became Easy Money. And what they proposed in Houston was that they would build a ramp and they would customize a car and they would jump an entire freeway, the Southwestern Freeway, in the car, through a wall of television sets, and then back down. Uh, and, and Doug Michaels knew full well that it was impossible to pull off. I mean, if you wanted to commit suicide, it was a spectacular event. But what he, he had decided early on was that they would do everything. They would send out the publicity. They would build a story. They would physically build the ramp, work on the car, but never actually do the jump because the whole thing would be a hoax. It would be a, like a reality TV program in, in which the idea of the event is, is your only requirement. Uh, so, the, the, you know, in a sense, the, the very first media burn uh, was kind of preconceptual. It was hoax. <laughs> And, 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 you know, the odd thing is, I don't remember that at all. I mean, <laughs> that, that kind of uh, plan to set it all up and then get out of the car and walk away. I don't have any memory of that being a proposal. But the, what actually happened, of course, was that nobody connected with the Main Street Art Festival was going to touch this thing with a 10 foot pole. And yeah. so, you know, we gave, gave up on that one. and tried a couple of other places, uh, but nobody really wanted when they saw there was going to be fire and the crash and everything, what, what existing art institution would want to sponsor that, you know, <laughs> zero. So that was um, a turning point because it meant that we, we, we realized we, we have to do this ourselves. We have to figure out a way to produce it ourselves. 
And, you know, part of that was that um, there were so many uh, volunteer participants, all of the video crews we put together and, uh, you know, every actor in, you know, the souvenir sales person and uh, secret service agents played by members of the residents. And so, you know, it was um, all a volunteer effort and, and actually people also donated TV sets <laughs> in some cases. Um, yeah, I should also say that, you know, after the, um, the retrospective at the Berkeley Art Museum, the, the museum was able to acquire the Ant Farm archive. And um, one of the things that Ant Farm did is they just generated enormous amounts of ephemera. They documented everything. They kept every single little thing, you know, like the, the, the bill from the cow palace, every letter that they sent out as a pitch to raise money. So in a, in a, once again, the single image, you know, that we see has behind it thousands of little pieces of paper and drawings, you know, Curtis's, uh, Curtis did many drawings, uh, looking at the velocity of the television sets after they were hit and could he survive the impact, you know, everything is saved. And because of that, uh, it, it allowed the kind of minutia of this complex event, you know, to find its way into the book. You know, it, it was kind of a great gift to me. Chip, I have a question. Don't, don't you think that Doug Michaels was like this incredible sort of um, avant publicist? I mean, I, I can remember all of this yeah. kind of plans and ideas that he'd turn out with no possibility of them being realized just for their own sake. And, and of course, he could have had a career in advertising because he had so many ideas that went in that direction. But, uh, you know, he was, he was kind of trapped because the counterculture was uh, the context and, you know, the ethics of the counterculture. And, and a lot of his ideas were outside of that, you know, like the doggy cola idea, <laughs> which was just a funny, you know, idea, but uh, probably maybe maybe there is doggy cola today, you know. <laughs> How about his bikini designs? <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> Never mind. Sorry I brought it up. <laughs> but you know there's a there is an interesting question that uh, could be an introduction to, to seeing uh, the, the remake that Roman Coppola did. And the question is, was there ever any aspiration or possibility of having the TV sets actually uh, working and, and turned on and broadcasting images? And the answer is no, because we couldn't afford that. You know, we couldn't afford, uh, we, we could have probably put a couple of functional TVs in that stack, but uh, I think, Television drawing actually has functioning television sets. That's right. But that was, be, you know, that was heavily evolved. Yeah. No, the, I know, and, and in the drawing, there's actually a sketch of what you'll see on the TV is a car coming towards the pyramid of TV. So there would have helped, there would have been a camera buried in all the TV sets, as well as the camera that was in the car going in the other direction. Mm -hmm. And of course, that, that camera we we lost because at the at the last moment, um, when the artist dummies got in the car, uh, we realized that we had to choose between whether the signal would go to the monitor on the dashboard or, or to the video recorder. <laughs> and they had to be able to see where they were going. So we chose the monitor on the dashboard. But he did some phenomenal things. It's also that, um... Um, there was a cable that ran through the Phantom Dream car into the fin and was connected to the camera. And it's a, a kind of a connector that you normally would twist. Uh, and Curtis just pushed it up there and didn't give it that twist. And what happened was when the car hit the TV sets, the, the tall fin flew off pulled the camera with it and that cable disengaged. Otherwise it would have dragged everything that was attached to it right through the cockpit of the car. 
and Curtis would not be uh, here with us today if, uh, if he had just turned that thing properly. <laughs> that's correct. And that's, that's a good anecdote, Steve, that is contained in the book. Yeah. Thank, thank also, you know, it is important to note that, as Chip was saying, that, that they navigated the car by video camera. So it really was, in a sense, TV colliding with TV. Because all they were seeing was a televisual replica of that wall of television set. They never saw the thing itself. That... But isn't it true, Chip, that there was a little bit of a problem? In other words, it was much more difficult to drive by television than anyone anticipated. I remember a, a, row, a, a line of two, two by fours mm -hmm. that went down and, and that they designed it so they could look down through the floorboards. Is that right? So that they would have at least a guide if they lost television. And that was Star Sutherland's great. And, Star know. has a lot of great. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I think that it, it made it made the white line more visible on the TV screen, and so uh, there was no practicing driving by TV. So, but on a, on the other hand, it was very just keep it going straight, you know, and that white line will take you right to the TVs. Well, as any pilot will tell you when you're blacked out, knowing what straight is, is not so easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us and, and sharing these reflections. And as Steve, I remember on social media calling out as you were planning the book that there was 400 people who were there and to share um, their thoughts and with you and reflections. And so, so much of that is brought together in this really just amazing book. And uh, Jean Youngblood, I noticed, said that we should raise a toast uh, to you right now for this, um, this really amazing Tour de Force publication. Um, and thank you. And uh, we also have included, you know, a couple clips on the way out. Uh, one of the phantom dream car, as well as in addition to this work being such a key um, influential piece within video art history. I mean, even within a few months, it was in distribution and was showing at a number of venues and museums uh, that it's also had a life influencing more popular entertainment and, and music videos, for example. I think there are several, although not a chapter in the book, um, but we have one that Chip has um, found of from Roman Coppola had shot for Supergrass, the Britpop band. Well, let me introduce that, if, if you will. What there was, there was uh, the first one, first music video was by Wendy O. Williams and the Plasmatics in the early '80s, the, the MTV era. But um, much later, uh, Roman made this video for Supergrass. And obviously he had seen Meteor Burn because it is almost a shot by shot uh, homage. And uh, related to the, the idea that the TVs should have images on them, he was able to achieve that and, and also launch the car off a ramp, but, but he had a much bigger budget than we did. <laughs> so that's what you're about to see.
Hi, I'm Lavender Suarez, sound healing practitioner, meditation teacher, and artist. I'm delighted to share my debut book, Transcendent Waves, How Listening Shapes Our Creative Lives, out now on Anthology Editions. Transcendent Waves is all about how listening can unlock moments of creative spark, mindfulness, and self-awareness. The book features scientific evidence as well as anecdotes from my many years teaching about meditation in artistic contexts, such as workshops at MoMA PS1, the Whitney, and the Rubin. The book features a foreword by lifelong artist and Warhol star Bibi Hansen. I'm going to read a bit from the preface of the book to give you a sense of what it's all about. You are a conduit at the center of the infinite world of sound. By taking the time to listen intentionally, you become a more thoughtful participant in your life. This book is about utilizing listening as a method for developing your creative practice in whatever form it may take. This extends beyond activities usually associated with listening, such as music-based endeavors, into all realms of the creative arts. Whether you have been an active artist for decades or are just beginning to explore or revive your creative voice, this book can help you. Learning to listen to the world around you, as well as to your inner voice, will offer insights into and enliven your creative practice. In this way, you can create a richer experience of life. There are clues everywhere to guide you on your creative path if you just listen for them. So the book is broken up into three main sections. Um, they're all color-coded, as you saw in the flip-through video. The first section is about the anatomy of how we hear, as well as some neuroscience and physiology of listening. The second chapter is all about the creative process and listening. And then the third chapter is about listening to the world, as well as how our listening is changed by the technology that we use daily. Um, now I'm going to read an excerpt from the creation slash expression chapter. To be creative, we have to be willing to improvise and get in tune with ourselves to decide how we want to proceed in manifesting our visions. Improvising is perhaps one of the key factors of being a creative person, since the blueprint we imagine for our projects may not always be attainable. When we improvise, we are deducing other possible realities to actualize our interests. When musicians improvise, the portion of the brain associated with the inner critic, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, is less active while the medial prefrontal cortex, the part in the center of the brain associated with creativity and language, takes over. By navigating the same mental pathways musicians do when they improvise, we can elevate our creativity and shut down the wall of self-criticism. So that's a little sample of the book there. And now I'm going to be playing some audio from a sound bath which is part of my practice as a sound healer. And while that audio is playing, I'm going to be showing uh, illustrations from the book, which were created by Alex Tulse, as well as questions from the book that I like to refer to as the sonic inquiry pages. There are questions about the role of listening in our lives, uh, the role of listening in our creativity, and are meant to help ponder our relationship to sound. So while this is playing, I hope you'll find it relaxing and inspiring, and thank you for checking out Transcendent Waves. I hope you enjoy watching the video or listening or going back and forth, whatever feels best for you.
Uh, hello, uh, my name is Jonathan Middleton, and I'm the executive director of Art Metropole, and it's my pleasure to introduce this talk with Charmaine A. Nelson, David Hart, and Francis Loeffler. Uh, before we proceed, uh, we'd like to state that Art Metropole operates principally out of the Toronto area, uh, and we see the importance in acknowledging that these are the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Charmaine joins us from Nova Scotia on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, and David Hart joins us from Philadelphia on the traditional lands of the Lenni Lenape. We're grateful to have this opportunity to hold this conversation on the occasion of the Printed Matter Virtual Art Book Fair and offer our thanks to the hardworking staff at Printed Matter. Um, after the fair, we hope to include this conversation in a series of podcast recordings on the subject of art and writing produced in collaboration between Art Metropole and Oakville Galleries. This talk is an informal discussion of two works, a uh, book written by Charmaine A. Nelson, uh, Slavery, Geography and Empire in 19th Century Marine Landscapes of Montreal and Jamaica, and a poster edition by David Hart that serves as an advertisement for the publication. Uh, we'll have lengthier, lengthier biographies on the event page, but as a brief introduction, Charmaine Nelson is a professor of art history and a tier one Canada research chair in transatlantic black diasporic art and community engagement at NASCAD University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She is also the founding director of the first ever institute focused on the study of Canadian slavery. David Hart was born in Montreal, but now lives in Philadelphia, where he is an assistant professor in the Department of Fine Arts at the University of Pennsylvania. His work explores how historic ideas and ideals persist or transform over time. Francis Loeffler is curator at Oakville Galleries, Toronto, pardon me, uh, Oakville Galleries, Oakville. Uh, prior to this, she has held positions at White Cube, London, and the Liverpool Biennial. Um, so, uh, thank you all for joining us, and um, and uh, I'm I'm wondering how we can maybe start off this conversation. Um, uh, as as I mentioned, the uh, the sort of occasion of this is to discuss two main works. Um, the book, uh, Charmaine, your book, um, Slavery, Geography, and Empire in Nineteenth Century Marine landscapes of Montreal and Jamaica is written and David's holding up his copy. <laughs> um, maybe that's a good place to start. And and I don't know if uh, if you want to uh, maybe give us a like an overview of the of the book uh, and and uh, and how it operates. So what um, sure Sure, thank you very much. Thank you for welcoming me. So I think the important thing to note is that first of all, there's a, a field, not a discipline. So it's an interdisciplinary field called slavery studies uh, that focuses on transatlantic slavery, that 400 year history. Within that, there's all different disciplines operating. The dominant one will be history. The people who are missing in action are usually the art historians because we have a tendency not to want to look at difficult art. Um, and the art in the context of slavery, a lot of it uh, represents atrocities or indignities in, in the least. Um, so the other thing to think about is that why landscape art? Part of it, it part of the, the drive for the book for me was to address the gaps and holes in the study of the visual culture of slavery. Um, and one of the things that I perceived is most of the art historians who talk about art in the context of slavery we go for always the genres that represented human bodies. So like genre studies, images of human activity, figure studies, and portraiture, for instance. The other thing we usually do is go for the representation of the black subject. So we assume that to discuss slavery means to discuss the black enslaved people, as opposed to discussing, for instance, um, critiquing uh, white slave owners in the context of slavery. So I thought about why not look at landscape and what is the role of landscape in um, the production of the category of geography and um, the process and practice of colonization and empire building. And so I wanted to shift away from the body center genres that I too had been guilty of looking at and think through um, using Said, um, you know, think through what Said uh, states in um, his book, Culture and Imperialism, 
that um, power is not just about cannons, meaning firepower, meaning power through violence, but the ability, ability to narrate and control what gets imaged and what gets imagined. So I took that very seriously and that was my starting point. And just very briefly, the other thing I think that was unique about this book is that there's a lot of comparative studies in, in transatlantic slavery study, but typically there's of course a dominant focus on the tropics because there are more enslaved people brought to places like Jamaica and Haiti and the American South than say the American North or Canada. Um, but what that does then is mean that a place like Canada is understudied, a place like the American North, like Scotland, like Argentina, they get ignored. And so we are not studying as scholars the, the differences that emerged in those temperate cl climate locales. So it's absolutely unique then to juxtapose a place like Montreal with Jamaica, because the comparative studies usually juxtapose two tropical sites, for instance, Brazil and Jamaica, Haiti and Barbados, et cetera. So those are some of the gaps that I was trying to um, look into or my starting points for the book. And you, you also talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, the, the sort of colonial capitals, the metropoles and the, yes. and the, and the colonies themselves. Yes. Um, and the relationship that, and that's a relationship that's more commonly studied rather than this sort of, this sort of relationship between, you know, Montreal or Canada and, and, uh, or Northern North America and, and the Caribbean, um, as, as, sort of colonial, like colony to colony relationships. Absolutely. So if you look at most transatlantic slavery studies, it's focused on either Africa, America's relationships or Europe, Africa, right? <laughs> or colonies back to Europe. And what gets forgotten, and part of this, you know, part of how this is orchestrated is through the motif of the triangle and the term triangular trade, which is really um, useful and really misleading because that imagines only that ships got loaded up from, from a place like Britain, right? And left to go to the West Coast of Africa, then they get loaded up again, they go to a place like Jamaica, and then they go back to, to Britain. And that's not what always happened. So for instance, there's trajectories that I wanted to recall, to re-excavate, re if you will, between let's say people like James McGill, founder of uh, my former university, he wasn't just a fur trader, he was a West Indian merchant which means that he used shipping to traffic in slave produced rum, molasses, sugar, which he transported between Montreal and places like Jamaica or the Anglophone Caribbean. Now in those trajectories then they're colony to colony and some like um, colonial ship owners then never would have gone to Europe, never would have gone to Africa. They made all their wealth going between a place like Rhode Island and Barbados or Halifax and Antigua. And we've forgotten those other types of trajectories and that also the motherland, of course, Europe was always being not just fed and enriched by, but culturally um, transformed by what was happening in its colonies. Before we, maybe before we, um, before we go uh, too far into the book, um, it, it might be a, a good moment to I introduced David's project and um, David, if you want to maybe discuss a little bit about how this came about in relation to your own practice, it might be worth worth it for us to also know a little bit more about your practice. Um, uh, but you and I had a conversation early, uh, early I guess it was this summer um, of 2020 um, and uh, where, where we were, you know, uh, I was uh, contacting you, uh, artist. You, you're an artist I've worked with before, um, and and I know, uh, and you have a very sort of research-based practice. Um, and I was, I we, I proposed a, a sort of a commission, I guess, of a of a poster project, um, where in a series of poster projects, Art Metropole is doing, um, where artists and and writers are in conversation with one another um, through through various poster works. Um, so anyway, maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll shut up and let you speak about, about uh, your practice and, and, and how this unfolded on, on your end. Sure, I mean, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this conversation. Um, yeah. Uh, 
So, I mean, the, the proposal to participate in the project that you described was, was really interesting and um, also really satisfying in terms of uh, just how work circulates with different audiences, not just within obviously the restrictions of COVID, but, you know, just work and access to work and the possibility of owning work. Um, most of my work, you know, um, exist through the support of institutions and foundations. And as a consequence, um, it's out of reach for a lot of, of, of folks. And so one of the things that I really delight in is um, making multiples and uh, addition work that um, can be distributed quite widely. So whether that's publications or another thing that I'm really fond of and been fortunate to um, have produced our uh, number of scores that have been released as vinyl LPs. I know that as a young person, um, my first real kind of meaningful contact with art was through record jackets. Um, and so um, to be able to create materials that kind of circulated in that same kind of economy was really interesting. And so when you uh, proposed um, producing a poster, um, I was really excited about, you know, just the audiences that the work will come into contact with. Um, and, you know, the, the, the constraints, but the parameters of the, the project uh, that you described, uh, artists in dialogue with writers, um, I have, I have, uh, I did a talk of, of several years ago that I mentioned to you with Elizabeth Alexander, who's the director now of the Mellon Foundation, but is just this fantastically renowned poet, um, you know, in the US and, um, uh, we did a conversation around my work Straylight at um, when the work was hosted by the Studio Museum in Harlem uh, when Thomas Lax, the curator there, uh, found out that I was looking at um, um, uh, Elizabeth's uh, text, uh, The Black Interior. Um, and it was, I'm so instrumental to my research. Um, but when kind of, you know, when we ended up having the conversation, it wasn't the most productive conversation because it was really kind of two ships passing in the night. I'm not a consumer of poetry, um, which is kind of her focus. And um, uh, so with this idea of like how, how, just what's the kind of common ground between the writer and the artist, um, I thought um, to instead um, actually look at the materials that I was consuming right, um, that I was using as, as a component of my research um, that I could be more deeply in contact with, in conversation with. And at, at the point when you contacted me, I was in the middle of Charmaine's fantastic book, um, um, doing some primary research on this kind of extended project uh, that I've been working on for the past several years called The Histories, um, which has got multiple iterations. The first was um, in, done in Philadelphia, and I, I love your description of the text, uh, Charmaine, and I, I actually wish that I had come into contact with the text um, when I was originally doing the research on the first chapter of the histories, um, because it really was about, you know, this concept of entanglement and really thinking about, um, you know, the porosity of culture, cultural positions and identity, and that things aren't fixed either geographically um, or, um, or, 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 or culturally, you know, that they're not, that they're actually constantly um, kind of um, in communication and, and, and in response to, you know, the, um, the, um, the power dynamics, but also I think um, a kind of empathetic relationship to the possibilities of other cultural positions. Um, and so, um, the first work that I had completed was um, uh, called The Histories uh, Le Bon Sonnier, and it was looking at two cultural locations. Um, one was Haiti and the other was New Orleans. And so I was really interested in, um, you know, the idea of the Haitian Revolution being this kind of catalytic moment um, uh, that, that, that as a result, there were kind of diasporic conditions that resulted where um, both uh, French and 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 um, uh, French citizens and and and, and uh, free black slaves were finding their ways, you know, throughout the Caribbean and into the Americas, um, and being and beginning to contribute to um, you know the, the 
the cultural capital of, 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 of those environments. Um, and I found a number of different um, uh, musicians and authors and, and artists that were participating in that kind of, um, th those travels. Um, and used uh, their voices and their experiences as uh, the foundation for the work. Um, the second body of work that I did um, was just shown recently at Corbett versus Dempsey Gallery in Chicago, um, where I was looking at um, the locations of uh, Trinidad and um, uh, the Ohio River Valley, uh, specifically through the work of uh, Robert Duncanson and Michel Jean Casabon. And these are contemporaries, both Black artists, who are participating in significant artistic movements, you know, um, both in um, Trinidad and in the United States uh, by their association with both the Hudson River School and the Barbizon. Casabon was trained in Paris and participated in the Barbizon. And so you have Black artists that are central to these art historical um, um, you know, discourses, and they're participating and they're contributing. And, um, and this is what I mean by, you know, this kind of empathetic response to conditions that one finds in these different locales. Um, and so when I was actually researching the third project, which is a commission for the PMA, the Philadelphia Museum of Art here in Philadelphia, um, I was trying to figure out, I knew that I wanted to make the work in um, uh, Jamaica and in uh, Newfoundland. And I was using um, Frederick Church as a kind of um, cipher to help me kind of navigate mm. um, those uh, environments. Um, and the fact that he executed work off the coast of Newfoundland is, is Iceberg series. And then also um, he spent a lot of time uh, during the Civil War, in fact, in, in Jamaica, um, uh, dealing, uh, mourning the, the death of his children, but also finding a kind of respite, if you will, from the crisis in the US. Um, and I was trying to find, you know, I, yeah, I felt a little bit unmoored, if you will. I'd been doing all of this research and kind of arriving at all of these conclusions. I think there is some, um, there is some uh, kind of precedent within, um, you know, the work of Paul Gilroy and, 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 you know, his text, The Black Atlantic, in terms of looking at the kind of, um, um, diasporic movement that you're describing, but I was really looking specifically for connections between the Caribbean and Canada in the 19th century. And then I arrived on your book and I was like, I like, why did I find this so late? <laughs> this, 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 this it, it, you know, I just felt, I felt like, I felt so relieved right, that there was somebody who was doing all of this work and scholarship within this space. And in some way, I felt as though the conclusions that I had arrived at were being validated by the hard work that you had already done in your text. And so, um, yeah, I mean, the poster kind of was a response to um, that connection that I felt to your, your research and scholarship. Um, and one that I felt that if it ever arrived at a kind of conversation that we could meaningfully find common ground quite quickly in terms of what we might possibly discuss. Oh, that's fantastic, yeah. Yeah, and reading about um, Charmaine's work and reading about the Histories Project, David, because, you know, since we've worked together, this is a whole new project and a little bit of a new direction in your work. I was really struck by the affinities actually between the two of you and what you're doing but it's so interesting to think about you know Charmaine working in an art historical um well sort of framework I guess um and pushing against that too imagine <laughs> and David coming from a, a you know an artistic discipline and just the way that you you know the way that you sort of your consideration of of um site and landscape and your kind of displacement of site, David, and the way you perform that in your work through all these different strands that you pull together and different kind of constellations of figures. You really perform that kind of unsightedness um, in your work. Um, yeah, so there's a lovely, a lovely affinity um, between the two of you that was really interesting, I thought. Um, and David, the image in the poster, was that taken um, on a research trip when you were developing the histories project? Yes, yeah, so it was, it was taken actually this March. Um, so March, 2020, I made it in Jamaica while I was executing the commission for the PMA. Um, so um, 
uh, that image was part of the pool of images that I was considering for um, a large tapestry work um, that is part of the you know, part of the overall composition of the, the PMA piece. Um, uh, yeah, so it's it's an outtake, if you will. Um, but I, I wanted to go back to uh, a point that you made, um, Francis, about sight, which I think is so important, just in terms of a kind of evolution of, of, of my practice um, and thinking, I think, more expansively about the idea of sight. I think that in the past, my work has been kind of really deeply connected to, um, to architecture. And mm -hmm. I always felt that as a kind of I don't want to say limitation, but uh, it, I didn't feel as though it was um, a fair description of what it was that I was actually indexing. Because I'm not interested in architecture per se as a craft. I'm not interested in uh, the buildings per se as a design. I'm interested in um, the lives lived within structures. I'm interested in how it acts or functions as a proxy um, for uh, cultural positions. And um, I found a fantastic book recently um, by um, uh, environmental philosopher Stephen Vogel called Thinking Like a Mall, um, which um, I think the most interesting kind of uh, position that he elaborates on is that, um, um, you know, that the concept of nature is uh, an almost impossible one. Right, that it, off, it, it, it operates as a kind of convenient other, but in actuality, it doesn't really exist, right? So that when one describes the built environment, one describes everything. One describes the landscape, one describes the city, one describes the space in between. Um, and it, what it does is it implicates, um, um, you know, uh, us as actors with responsibilities um, for for the full spectrum of 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 of, um, of what's out there, and um, I think that um, it it begins to kind of uh, um, uh, relate nicely to um, you know uh, this concept of um, pardon me if I, I get it wrong, <laughs> Charmaine, but Said's com uh, concept of of uh, actuality, right? Like to describe something like specifically that you that you reference within the text, um, and and so th there's it's not just a description of a thing, but it's actually an acknowledgement and an implication of the self within the thing. That there are responsibilities that one has, that then one one can't simply other it, and through that kind of othering, kind of treat it as a kind of romantic ideal. Um, and so the work has arrived at this position where. I can move comfortably between uh, uh, structures that we would identify as architecture or cities uh, or regions or landscape. And that it all is a kind of continuous field um, in which the, um, the human consciousness is implicated. I'm reminded a, a little bit, David, of your, I think in an earlier time, I remember you describing your work as being uh, interested in ideological spaces or, 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 or the ideology of spaces. I forget which, which, um, which of those. And I'm, I'm also maybe finding a link between that and, and Charmaine, your description of, um, of racialized landscape as well and like whether like those like in a way that and David you're pointing to the idea that like of course landscape which is which is you know constructed um as well as is a kind of form of architecture and is a form of um you know production of of production of ideology i suppose yes mm -hmm. hmm. it's also a really interesting um direction david because you're going back to a um, you're going to a point in history um, you know, back to the 19th century and even earlier, right? Whereas previously you've kind of been centering on these post-war moments. Um, so you're sort of taking the work back to a more historical moment. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a useful moment because what it does is it begins to describe the kind of the physical and psychic, the physical and psychic infrastructure that continues to haunt us today, right? That that's been 
that the establishment of those infrastructures was uh, was constructed, right? Because as as Jonathan acknowledged um, in his preface to this talk, you know, we're all on borrowed land at this point, right? We're all occupiers, um, and so. Uh, the traditions of systemic racism, of exploitation, of the capitalist system are all, um, uh, they've all reached a particular and unique form of maturity, you know, within this environment. And I, what I'm trying to do is to get back at the roots uh, and the development of those systems. Um, yeah. And I think that, you know, that the hard work that, that Charmaine has done within the text begins to enumerate, you know, um, what those systems are and what they look like and how they function. And I can see too, for both of us, David, that the, the nature of vision as, as power uh, is very important too. And I think one of the things that resonated with me when I went to landscape art, and it seems to me too, I'm always attracted as an art historian. People assume when you're an art historian, they, the first thing they ask you is, um, basically what art do you like? And they assume that you do research on art that you like. Mm -hmm. And most of the, uh, the art that I do research on, I'd never want to have in my home <laughs> because most of it has to do with slavery and it's, it's very depressing to me. But I'm so fascinated by, um, by it in other dimensions that I'm drawn to it as, as a research topic. But for landscape art too, part of my, um, uh, my attraction to it was not understanding fully the ground through which it was created and wanting to, um, an, another failing of art history is um, when Dyer wrote his, his really important book, White, um, uh, you know, I think in the late 90s, I think, everybody's like, yay, what a great book. And then all art historians dropped it. So critical whiteness studies hasn't been fully integrated into art history. So again, when art historians think that they have to do work on race, they look for the person of color, the indigenous person. Mm -hmm. they, they don't unpack or try to critique or try to deal with whiteness at all. But for me, then, the landscape art of the period that we're talking about, the 19th or the late 18th century, you have to think, who was allowed to produce that art? It, it wasn't almost no, almost no women of any background and almost exclusively middle or upper class white men, in part because when you think of topographical landscapes, they're being produced by the military, their form of reconnaissance. That's pre-photographic method to see like, where do we, do, how do we dock the ship and not have it crash into the shoal, right? So, so I had to understand that as compared to the more aesthetic landscapes, but to understand too that part of the production of that and, and the knowledge around that was, I understand, the, the assumption was, I as a white man understand and can truly represent this place um, that I am not native to because I've been there and because I've seen it. So this idea is built vision as, as or European visual vision as infallible and vision as the truest course to knowledge was something that I found profoundly disturbing. And that's why with a lot of the topographical art that I was looking at too, they actually put drawn on the spot or on the spot on the, the paintings or on the prints that they and mass produce after the fact to assure the viewer and often the reader, because many of these were actually reproduced in travel narratives or tourist narratives to assure the viewer then that this is what it really looks like because I was there. But of course, it's always already white men doing the looking and the drawing and the painting. Mm -hmm. Although, of course, what they're hiding as well is that on the ground of these spaces, it was indigenous and African informants who were showing them how to exist there, how to live there, how to get to the places that they were trying to survey and, and, and reprodu reproduce and represent. So all that um, other knowledge is just erased. Of course. So part of it for me was unpacking what it what this Eurocentric vision meant, how it was actually facilitated, and what it was able to produce. And part of that, of course, is that the colonial, the inherently colonial nature of imperial geography. And that's why, too, a term that I, I tried to develop in the book was I tried to position Europeans as imperial intruders. What does it mean for us to think of Europeans not as people who had the God-given right to go to the Americas and do whatever the hell they want to do, but as intruders, people who intruded upon something, lifestyles, communities, kinship bonds, uh, landscape, community organizations that already existed, that pre-existed them. Because part of the trick of their geographies, of course, their landscapes, is that, um, of course, in order to um, 
to be able to empty the lands through genocidal practices, they had to first imagine them as already empty. Yes. They had to represent them as already, oh, nobody's over here. We just stumbled upon this space and nobody's here. So we're just gonna plant our flag and do our business, right? So I, I think that that was something that really resonated with me that the, what is the logic of your Eurocentric vision that enabled this type of landscape art to be produced in the first place? Absolutely. I love what you said also about uh, um, the ability to participate within this discourse and how it was controlled and limited. And I think that that's what makes um, uh, Duncanson and Casabon absolutely so interesting to me is that it begins to describe the context where their participation becomes possible. So for instance, with Duncanson, you know, him connecting with, it was Longsworth who provided oh, the, yes. for the, um, you know, the, um, the murals um, in mm. his home. So him connecting with an established uh, landowner and abolitionist, right? And finding a community of abolitionists who were interested in supporting uh, a young, talented black artist almost as um, a symbol of, of um, you know, uh, their justifications for promoting uh, an end to slavery, right? That, 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 that African-Americans or Blacks um, can participate and they can participate meaningfully. And we are gonna show you examples of that. So, you know, there's something obviously very um, exploitative, but also <laughs> uh, it's really complicated. And so using Duncanson, as I said, as a kind of cipher to begin to, under, un, to unpack those politics and um, to unpack the kind of cultural conditions where um, you see this uh, contestation of, of, of power and the possibilities. And then with Casabon in Trinidad, I mean, um, there's a, you know, it's a, I don't wanna say a quirk of history, but there's, there, it, it's definitely related to a kind of historical cadence in terms of um, slavery being um, the, the French colonies being emancipated before the British. So Casabon's family is from Martinique. And so there are free blacks in Martinique that then move to Trinidad and actually become slave owners in Trinidad and actually become quite wealthy in Trinidad. Wealthy enough to send their child to school in England and then to study painting in Paris. When Casabon returns, he, he returns to a changed Trinidad where the British have uh, abolished slavery. And um, uh, he actually, some of his first commissions come from the British ruling class where he paints landscape views uh, you know, for their manor homes back in England as a sign of their time in the colonies. Um, but this negotiation that you're talking about is so, and you, you address it in the book, uh, the, these, these ideas of representation and it being a manifestation of a particular kind of narrative um, that they want to propagate. So um, with Casabon, it's uh, not showing the atrocities of slavery or of, um, you know, even apprenticeship, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, of the laboring uh, uh, plantation workers, mm -hmm. um, but um, instead showing, you know, workers in these kind of idyllic settings, um, you know, the uh, wonderful kind of pastoral landscape of, of Trinidad, and essentially um, a representation of control and order and picturesqueness. And so how Casabon, even though he is Black, he is still participating within mm -hmm. propaganda of the kind of uh, narrative that you're, that you're describing. And he's doing it quite consciously. There's a wonderful, um, a fictional biography of, of Casabon uh, that I read um, that, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, where he's struggling with his position, with his role, with his relationship with the, with the white British ruling class um, and um, how um, he recognizes the opportunity, but also kind of um, struggles against it. That's interesting. I'd love to see his work. I'm not familiar with his work, but I'm wondering if it looks at all like Augustino Brunius's, the, the Italian Catholic artist who in the, the 18th century, he's invited to the Ceded Islands yes. by the commissioner and all he wants to paint are genre scenes of the market. 
Yeah. I've never seen an, a Brunius <laughs> that's that's uh, a plantation field that has any people doing any type of, of enslaved labor. And it's like, come on, guy. You were there, and he was there for like three decades. Well, his work so, is like, it's almost like <laughs> Sander. It's almost like early August Sander, you know, okay, okay. like um, this kind of typological um, a recording of a traditional costume. Right, and types, racial uh, types, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And his work is, there's a kind of naive quality to his work, whereas Casabon's, I think, is a lot more sophisticated. So mm -hmm. it's, it is rooted, you know, within the Barbizon, you know, and uh, Casabon uh, shows at the Louvre School where he studies. Um, so, you know, I think in terms of a kind of aesthetic sophistication, Mm -hmm. uh, Kazaban is uh, is uh, incredibly talented, and the works, especially the watercolors, are just they're just absolutely stunning. Fascinating, yeah. Because you, you would think that you'd be looking for instances in which that sort of paradigm would be undone in his work, right? But <laughs> are there many first-hand accounts of his writing about his work, or any? Is there any sort of primary material? Um, I'm not sure what uh, text the writer uh, used as, as source material uh, for his fictional biography of Casabon, whether or not there is an archive um, or, 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 or notes associated with. He did a number of, um, um, what do you call it, um, lithographic editions of his work, and I don't know if there are notes associated with that. Um, I'm going to look up while we're talking um, the, the name of that text just to, so we can right, yeah. look a little bit more. Mm. Yes. Charmaine, um, am I right? Your book was published in 2016. Yes, yes. I'm curious to know how whether you feel it's kind of shifted things along since then. <laughs> you know you what's know, so, interesting, yes. Francis? You know, we're all probably very aware of this. Um, but academic writing is so slow, meaning to actually produce a text, especially when you're working historically, because um, uh, it involves a lot of archival and in, and in the case of an art historian, um, museum -based, based field work. So just the travels itself takes a while. And for instance, um, uh, I had to go for instance to the British Library to, to look at some of the, the books I was looking at. They, they had some of the best copies of, let's say the James Hakewell and the William Clark. Um, and then, um, you know, other archives in Canada, et cetera, but that is slow. Mm -hmm. uh, but also the process of people finding your book is slow, right? The, the book was published in 2016. And it's interesting that I'm, I'm just, it's really just the last two, two years, let's say, I'm getting uh, invitations where people specifically say, can you come talk about that book? And I'm like, I'm actually working on other things now, but, but I, not that I don't want to talk about it. I, I'm still deeply interested in all of those things. They're a continuation of, of my research. But it's just interesting to me that it's really, it's five years later that people are stumbling upon it. And that's just the slowness of academia, I think. Right, of, 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 and the chorus too. I mean, they, Rutledge initially published it in hardback and it was just too unaffordable to some people. So I was actually really lucky in that they plucked that book as one that they would put in paperback. You know, some, some Rutledge books never go to, you know, or some presses, academic presses never put things in paperback. And I understand they need to recuperate their money somehow because it's expensive to make art historical books with all the reproductions. But anyway, you know, it's interesting that there, there is some interest I think um, that people do notice when they do stumble upon it that it is quite unique in terms of the focus on that specific genre and the inclusion of Canada and transatlantic slavery studies is not normal. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you it's not normal. And uh, what we do in Canada usually, I think you and Jonathan would know, uh, now it's Black History Month or African Heritage Month. What usually is rolled out in terms of education is more of the Underground Railroad. Let's talk about the Underground Railroad again. David, this is what happens up here, okay? <laughs> so, and, and we really like celebrating that, but what happens is we wanna celebrate those 31 years, 1834 to the end of the American Civil War, 1865, and heaven, heaven forbid if anyone opens their mouth about the 200 year history of slavery. I mean, they, want, they just come for you. It's like, what are you doing? You know, it's funny, I just had, 
I was really privileged. I had a big write up in the Toronto Star with a wonderful um, um, uh, journalist who interviewed me extensively and it just got published on the 31st. Immediately I get this email from a guy going, why didn't you talk about this abolitionist and that abolitionist and this abolitionist and they're all white men. And I'm like, first of all, do you not get that the article was about the 200 year, year history of slavery? And we actually talked about the fact that it's time to start talking about slavery in Canada and not the um, Underground Railroad. And number two, why are you listing this, you know, um, listing off white male abolitionists, what, the most prolific, continuous abolitionists the anti-slavery movement was generated by the enslaved people themselves over the course of 400 years. They were always resisting. So how about you then throw out some names of black people if you wanna go down the path of abolition? Is that impossible too? In Canada, yes it is, okay? So, so this is the type of thing that you're always having to push back against um, in, in this context in which from you know elementary school through high school to university, you know, the students that I encounter, they get to my class often by accident. <laughs> it's not required. A class like the visual culture of slavery is never required. And I ask them the first day and, and you know, at McGill, I usually had about 20% American students and let's say 10% students from elsewhere and 70% Canadians. The Canadians never knew anything about Canadian slavery. I had one student in 17 years at McGill who said they had content on Canadian slavery or they knew it existed. And when I asked them about the content, the students said we had no content. The teacher said slavery happened in Canada and then proceeded to, to teach them about a tropical location. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is what's going on in the nation. Do you understand that people are bereft of information, but it's like, do you not understand what you don't know? Like know what you don't know. This is the thing, right? Because the thing that we do instead in Canada, when people admit that slavery happened here, the first place they wanna go is to say, it must have been kinder and gentler because less people were enslaved. Thank you, David. So I'm like, how did you come up with that? Please tell me how you came up with that. How about trauma emerging from isolation from self and community? How about that? Did you ever think of that? What it would have been like to be a population of 3,000? And for instance, to be African born in that population of dominantly what we're called Creoles, African Canadians, African Americans, African Caribbeans, to not have anybody speak your language to, who knew your dress culture, who knew your food, your food culture, your spirituality, your religion, and you're like dropped down in Quebec City somehow. Do you want to talk about what that would have felt like? How devastating, how brutal that would have been? And the fact that someone in that, in that context, how did they get to Quebec City? Slave ships didn't go from West Africa to Canada. Okay, so that means that the person had to disembark someplace further south prior to that and may have been enslaved somewhere else before they were either forced through inland tra transit or on another merchant ship up to Quebec City. So can we talk about multiple displacements too? So the thing is, I understand that people don't know this, but at least know that you have never been taught anything and so you don't know anything. So that to jump from zero to Canadian slavery must have been nicer is just absolutely false. Let me ask you a question then about the title of the text because that was one of the things that, that absolutely drew me and it was such a, such a, it's not a Canadian title because it is so direct. And, and in some ways it's actually, you know, it's accusatory as well, which I absolutely love. And I think it's absolutely necessary that it names locations and it names a specific act and, and it names it in a way that is absolutely unfamiliar. Right, um, and and that was it was it was quite literally the language of the title that attracted me to the possibility of of uh, treating it as um, you know a poster campaign that would appear on boarding because mm -hmm. it, it it's a kind of confrontation right that that the words of you know the word slavery in Canada are are are, are words that don't fit together comfortably and that there's a conscious uh, rejection of it within the Canadian psyche and, and what you're doing is addressing it. Did you have any pushback from your publishers when, when thinking through that? No, I, I actually had a, 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 a different title ahead of that. I was gonna call it Sugarcane, um, sugar I think, and Ships, and then Slavery Geography and Empire. They're like, cut that, we don't need that. I was like, okay, okay, <laughs> that's good. So, so I think part of it is maybe because it was Rutledge is based out of Britain, and they're like, do it. <laughs> so that is really good. I'm glad you found it a, a confrontational though. It's funny too, because someone, um, 
uh, just early this morning described the book. He said, your tone is very confrontational. <laughs> it's like you're, you're, you're taking a position and I can feel that you're pushing back and that you're upset. And I said, good, <laughs> because I am. <laughs> I didn't get that from the, from the, the body of the book. The body is okay. just incredibly well reasoned. You know, oh, thank you. <laughs> you make you 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 know there are multiple references that you're citing in order to um, to contextualize you know the point that you're making, and so for me that's the opposite of confrontation because you're taking the time and doing the hard work of of, of really understanding the material and and, and the context. Oh, uh, thank you so much. I think he was referring to things, David, like there's a point where I say the wealth generated by slavery was obscene. And I remember when I was applying, you know, David and Francis, I was applying for a social sciences humanities grant. And I think the first time through I lost and they said, this word obscene is too subjective. And I said, no, I'm not taking it out. And I, put, and I did everything else they asked, but I would not take that word out. I'm like, you tell me what that wealth is. You tell me, my friend, what that wealth is. That is on the, literally on the backs of people who have worked to death. That's not obscene. I don't know what obscene is. I'm leaving it in there. But you know, I think that's what he was looking at. Does sometimes descriptions like that are in there? And I'm like, there's some things that have to be said. I agree. I agree. I, it really struck me, um, Charmaine, about how uh, how much you do draw um, links between this period and of uh, sorry the period of which. Um, the of uh, the landscapes were, were are produced, but also oh. like really like bring it always back to the contemporary moment, like that. And I think that that you were sort of calling out one of the things I was going to have made a note about asking about was just the. You I feel like you kind of call out the production of amnesia in Canada, oh, and yeah. and um, and David, I, I feel like your your role in taking up the a kind of promotional aspect of of this book also is. Um, is a it's kind of in response to that same kind of production of amnesia that we we is it amnesia or is it a, is it a conscious kind of suppression? Well, I, I mean, I mean, yeah, it's it is a suppression. I guess that's maybe that's what I mean about by why like it's like amnesia is not normally produced. I don't think in in a sense, but I feel like it's like a it's part of the systemic racism in Canada that we are yes. we continue to tell ourselves uh you know this story, story that that, yeah. that it wasn't so bad and it would no, it wasn't only was only was only for a little while and there's yeah. also um, such a disavowal of the as as you point out in the book Charmaine of the uh, all encompassing um nature of this history too right that no one is <laughs> everyone is you know every, there's no country that's not free from its entanglement you know it's not yes. like so complex and so all encompassing and as David is kind of pointing out in his work, it's ongoing too. You know, these this is not something, these are histories that stay with us still. And, you know. Right. So. And that's the thing that, you know, to both of your points there. Okay. When I give lectures on Canadian slavery or on slavery in general, the audience members, and I understand they're, they're trying to figure out how do you do this research? They, they Usually though, for Canada, especially, they question, they say, um, so there must be a dearth in the archive. Like there must be nothing, like, what are you looking at? You know, there must be nothing there. And I'm like, that's not the issue, my friends. The issue is how many of us are looking. That is the issue that across the institutional landscape of Canadian colleges and universities, they, they have not um, embraced or even supported in any way the study of Canadian slavery. So I'm not joking. There's probably, now there used to be probably five people like myself who have the specialized training to teach courses on Canadian slavery. One, um, the esteemed James Walker just retired from, from Waterloo. So when you think about if there's four professors who are able to teach this with any consistency, how many MAs and PhDs can we train in, an, in one career? And what's the knock on effect in terms of producing the next generation of scholars who can do the work? We can do very little at the moment because there's four of us, right? And if, and if you're a person in that category and perhaps you don't have access to PhD or MA students, then you're trying to train undergrads who often do not go on to further study or do not go on to further study in that field. So I think that's part of it. And so what I've learned too, and what I say to people is to forget 200 years of history that's well-documented and it's well-documented why? 
slave owners cared about their property and enslaved black and indigenous people were property. They cared about their money, right? So you document your wealth. So they documented the people they owned. That's not the issue. But to forget 200 years of that, to erase 200 years of that takes work, my friends. That doesn't, doesn't just happen because again, the documents are there. The 18th century newspapers, and that's what I'm looking at now, the newspaper ads, the slave sale, the slave auction, and the fugitive ads or runaway ads as they're also called. They're in 18th century and 19th century Canadian newspapers that are on microfilm that of course have not been digitized yet because why would they have been? Because where are our slavery databases in Canada? Because who's studying slavery? Who would have done that? When I study Jamaica or if someone's studying Haiti or a tropical location, much of that data has already been put in the database. So they can just be at home and click on their computer and you know, scroll through those ads. We haven't done that work in Canada. So that takes archival work using microfilm and looking at these three often to five page newspapers for these ads, but they're there. They're there. The question is who's looking at them and who knows even that they exist, how to find them and how to decipher them. We need to train people on how to do that work. And of course, because the Canadian government at no level is, is in our curriculum, are we paying any attention to this history? So, you know, the, the erasure is deliberate. It's very, very deliberate. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's interesting. I actually, um, one of the things that I just did um, uh, yesterday, um, I teach on Mondays, uh, I teach a, a class at Penn. And uh, I had the students uh, look at Boone Throkey's uh, pictures of the world and inscriptions of the war. Um, and what it, the, the film uh, deals with um, uh, essentially the interpretation of data, right? So photographic data. Um, so whether it's um, uh, the registration of building facades uh, through a uh, process of analyzing photographs or uh, um, uh, you know, developed in the 19th century or reconnaissance uh, photographs uh, during World War II of um, uh, German um, uh, targets uh, for, for, for Allied bombing raids. Uh, so there was all of this reconnaissance that was done of Germany, um, um, you know, late in World War II, um, looking at uh, different targets, industry, railroads, um, uh, runways, uh, but they also captured the camps, right? They 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 captured um, uh, Auschwitz um, and the other concentration camps, but nobody knew what was happening there, and as a consequence, they weren't able to interpret what they were actually seeing. And uh, the film actually talks about uh, uh, a freelance, meaning that during their spare time, two CIA operatives go back, and I think they're inspired by Shoah. Is that the, the Holocaust uh, the Holocaust film, uh, documentary film on the Holocaust? Um, they're inspired by, I believe, Shoah um, uh, in the 70s um, to go back and look at the photographic documentation that was done during World War II and to then begin to analyze what was present. And they can actually see the, the camps. They can see, uh, you know, the gas chambers. They can see the prisoners arriving by train. They can see the prisoners standing in line uh, to be processed in the camp. It's all there in the photographic documentation. But as you said, um, there, there wasn't the will nor um, uh, it wasn't um, uh, politically uh, convenient to actually acknowledge and, and to address uh, what was what was happening? What was, there? What, what, what was documented? Wow! That's yeah, in the same way, um, you know that that's why I was careful about the the, the the phrase suppression as opposed to amnesia. Amnesia suggests that one already knows but has chosen to forget or uh, forgets for some other reason, medical or yeah, trauma. Um, but but a suppression means that it prevents the knowledge from ever actually having mm -hmm. been established in the first place, and that's yeah. That's really violent. Right. Yeah. Violent. Can I point out too that the word suppression is interesting because um, if you look at the early historians of Canadian slavery, um, mainly white men, when they started to write, they immediately start to write in, I mean, like the early 20th century in a way that tried to render Canadian slavery as benevolent. So they weren't erasing it altogether, but they're saying, hey, this was kinder and gentler. Slave owners were nice. We didn't do corporal right. punishment, stuff like that. Um, and then um, it's only much later when you have like 
practices like post-colonial studies, influencing um, you know, all different disciplines, black feminist theory, critical race theory, that you have um, an explosion of, of critical practices of the, the study of um, translate slavery. And of course, more and more people of color and especially black people studying it and asking different questions, right? Um, uh, studies, I, th I, I guess you'd say that are um, focused on the enslaved and recuperating the lives and the experiences of the enslaved, right? As opposed to glorifying the enslavers. Mm -hmm. um, before I forget the, the, the Casabon biography, it's called Light Falling in Bamboo. Um, and uh, the author is uh, Lawrence Scott. Sorry, Lawrence who? Scott, he's a Trinidadian writer and scholar. Yeah, the new work that you're doing, Charmaine, I just read about it briefly on the internet, but it sounds fascinating um, into these documents, these advertisements that were put out. Um, is there a, um, are you compiling those? And forgive me if I, I should know and I don't, but are you compiling this research into a new book or is there a? No, absolutely. Thank you for asking that. So I would stumble as I was doing uh, you know, work on on other publications like the 2016 book on landscape art, I keep stumbling on these slave ads. And so they stuck in my head because they're very violent in different ways, okay? So the, the, there's two dominant types of sale ad. One's a slave sale ad when someone was often being sold privately and um, the slave auction ad. And you'll find those across the Americas, but also including Canada. Those are characterized, um, you know, Francis, by how brief they are, the brevity of them and the lack of detail. So they'll say things like, you know, to use a colonial term you find in the documents, Negro girl, 16 years old, um, good, good in the care of children, apply to the printer, right? Almost never in the Canadian context you get even a, fir a first name. And of course, in our context, the last name of the enslaved is the name of the person who owned them. So you, you don't even get a name. You don't get a description of the body type. You get constantly obedient and healthy, really. <laughs> it's, it, it's impossible that they are all always obedient and healthy. But that's, of course, these people are trying to get their money out of their investment, right? The auction ads, too. Yeah, the auction ads are even, if possible, more horrible. Because in the Canadian context, you have Okay, in the Jamaican context, you'll have things like, you know, 50 newly arrived Igbos for sale at such and such a wharf. So they're even naming ethnicity, and you know these poor people just got off a slave ship, okay? They somehow survived the Middle Passage. In the Canadian context, you'll have one Negro man lumped in with a barrel of salt, a boat, and a fishing net. And it's like, really, people? Really? Like, this is Emmy Césaire's thingification. There it is, right? So the, the, the real shift, though, Francis, for me, that, that, that hooked me was looking at the runaway or fugitive slave ads, was that those were the ads, of course, that were placed by slave owners when they want to hunt people who had resisted through flight. Now, the difference there is the uh, amount and the detail of the, the, um, the description, astounding. You, you usually almost always get the name you get often um, the place of birth and or a place they resided in before being in Canada. You get really uh, a lot of details about what they were wearing. And, you know, a, a scholar like David Wallstriker points out that, you know, the enslaved were the poorest of the poor. So to describe their clothing was just to describe them. They have one set of clothing, right? So, you, so that clothing description is really, really important and powerful. And then even they're describing things like mannerisms, how the person moved, how they walked, their accent, their languages, um, their skill set. There's one in, um, from Quebec that says the man is a very good violin player. And so the amount of detail actually, what intrigued me is the detail worked against the slave owners because the detail often was pointing out how sophisticated in the reasoning and how intelligent the enslaved people were to outwit the slave owner. And also pointing out how, for instance, you know, several of these enslaved people have three or four languages. It's like, do they really need you to civilize them, white Canadian? I don't think so, right? It's like, so, so, you know, a scholar like, I think it is Marcus Wood points out that at a certain point, the abolitionists go, 
you know, they're, they're using, you know, print medium and mass produced print medium to try to turn people towards anti-slavery. And they go, we don't need to do anything to these texts, just reprint it. Just reprint it itself is so condemning. And the other, because the other reason too, you know, is that the slave owners were unafraid because they were functioning with impunity. They're unafraid to detail um, the marked scars, amputated limbs, you know, all the horrors of, of the effects of unsafe labor, dangerous labor, and um, um, and also corporal punishment that they've inflicted on the enslaved person's body. So they'll say, for instance, in a place like Jamaica, this person is branded with my initials, right? And so, so of course, the abolitionists were like, let's read this people and understand that this is not a civilizing mission. Right, and, and then that's how the abolitionists were able to get people back in the motherland to turn against the colonies, whose whole points of being really, the whole point of a place like Jamaica was to produce riches through the exploitation of enslaved people, mainly through sugar. So for me, what was so provocative too, and I'll just end here, but is that as an art historian, the, the these, Fugitive slave ads don't have images, they're pretty photographic, but they have these little icons in the corner often, which are like really bizarre in Canada. There's some that my friend pointed out look like they're coming off of tobacco advertising. They look like really stereotypical indigenous figures, as opposed to the types of icons that emerged in the US South, which is a man running in, in a frozen pose, seen from a side in profile, and a woman seated as if she's resting. The Canadian ones are, are bizarre, they're their own thing. But um, the icons are not the portrait. The portrait for me is a text that had to be read and then transform, transformed into a visual image in the mind of the reader in order for them to spot the enslaved person and participate in catching them. So for me then the, those images, or sorry, the fugitive ads are actually a very dubious and violent form of unauthorized portraiture. That's right. Right, they're, they're, they're literally sitters who never sat for their image and never wanted to be represented. Their, their likenesses are being stolen from them and being weaponized against them for the, for the purpose of hunting them and re-enslaving them. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, and fascinating to think, you know, you as an art historian, that the, the information you're seeking is not in the, um, in the paintings, it's not in the illustrations, it's in these other, um, these other unwarranted Portraits, as you put it, yeah. Right, right. Uh, and I'm thinking through then, you know, Francis, what is the difference between, because we both, we all know then, if you look at 18th, especially 19th century, especially European portraiture, there's a plethora of black people being represented. Mm -hmm. Many of them are not free. Many of them are enslaved. We've completely lost their names because the, the oil portraitist didn't bother to record the name. It's just head of a Negro, head of a dark person, colored girl, and over and over and over. But we know they were individuals who are often due to the time frame likely enslaved and also that they likely never got paid for their likeness they're not the patron of their likeness so i'm trying to think through what is the difference between the fugitive slave ad as portrait and the traditional higher portrait of the enslaved people too they're both sources of of often coercion and violence right because in both cases you can argue that uh, of course the sitter the black sitter is not the patron of their own likeness and they had nothing to do with what their likeness became at the end of that sitting. You know, what's interesting about the way that you're framing the research, and for me, really uh, intriguing, is that it's a, it's a form of um, kind of forensic analysis, as opposed to, you know, what most, mostly happens in art history, which is a kind of aesthetic analysis. Mm -hmm. right? And I think that that differentiation um, is, is really important in terms of understanding um, issues of accountability, but also I think recognizing the violence, right? That aesthetics actually doesn't, doesn't necessarily, um, can't accommodate, <laughs> you know, yes. uh, the, the, the violence of what you're describing, that it actually it moves very quickly into, into criminality. It moves into something oh. that requires a kind of forensic analysis in order to understand the dimensions of, of, of the real trauma. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think it's a great way to put it actually. And, and there's an interesting kind of history between forensics and art, art, art criticism too, actually. So it's kind of fascinating to think about that. But it's usually, it's associated with providence. Yeah. Right? 
Whereas this is that this is actually about the subject of, of themselves. And so that, you know, and, and, and with Providence, it's about, again, this kind of reclamation of wealth mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and attribution, the tr uh, attributing a kind of power, you know, yeah. to, to the object. Whereas this is about, again, it's about the subject. Right. And I think that's, uh, that's yeah. really important methodological. That it, it seems to also link, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please, please. Well, I was going to say it, it, it links it back to the kind of uh, landscape painting, Charmaine, that you were talking about, especially, you know, noting the link between early landscape painting and reconnaissance, military reconnaissance, and, mm -hmm. and the, um, I'm going to just pull up the cover of your book here, as I mentioned this, um, uh, in that, there's a kind of a, a perspective, like what we're talking about a little bit is also just like a, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it feels cross to say it, but it's a, like a, a kind of a ledger, right? Um, this is like a representation of property, like we're talking about yes. the ads being a representation of property. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I remember from my, you know, art school days, uh, also learning about early Canadian landscape painting, this kind of faux elevated uh, vantage point that we're seeing in 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 this painting, um, which is a way to uh, you know demarcate items. So it just comes right out of reconnaissance painting that that and and those kind of early um, you know the, the almost sort of icon based um, or or you know very graphic representation of landscape that was also simply about. Um, mm -hmm. You know, counting how many trees there there were, or, how, or whether there was a hill there, or there's a port there, and all these kinds of things. But it feels to me this is all, all kind of a, a counting, and in 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 one form or another. Um, and yes, uh, that gets back to the concept of actuality, right? Doesn't it? In in many ways, like the the manifest of the ship in the port carrying rum and carrying slaves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And to Jonathan's point again, th those images, here's the thing, that, that cover image, <clears throat> why I chose it is because, um, you know, the, the vantage point to, you can't see unless I think you look in the back of the book, but it shows the outstretched arm of Port Royal, which was a military installation as well. So that's part of what Hakewell wanted to show, James Hakewell. Uh, who visited the island, I think now between uh, 1821 and 22, and, and that book is published, I think, in 1825, if I'm remembering correctly. But the other thing, too, is this gesture of, I will teach you, right? And it's always the white man who's, I, I will teach you, which also, for me, the insult of that is that for the implied European viewer, um, of course, the white woman had nothing to do with slavery. And it's like, really? really. And, and so that it's letting her off the hook and making her innocent. And of course, they were implicated as individual owners, as co-owners with their husbands or uncles or brothers, and as widows. So, and, and to that point, just to go a bit further, Hakewell's 21 prints, I think only two had white women in them, right? So, and that one, of course, takes her out of a position of being a purveyor of knowledge herself and someone who could have known what she was looking at on her own or could have taught him. So I think that's part of it as well. Um, but yes, to your point, I think um, Aquell's whole reason for going there, I could never find uncover the lever letters. I don't know if they exist anymore, but I was able to find um, uh, the letter story that would have brought him there in the first place. I think he was invited there by planter so because he, he states in the, um, in, in the book that he, you know, his, um, dedication, his acknowledgments. He's so thankful to the planters for their generosity. And I think what happened is he stayed with them for two years. Like they're so wealthy, they're like, yeah, just go from plantation house to plantation house and hang out with us and we'll feed you and take care of everything because your book is doing us a favor. It's after 1807 when Britain has abolished slave trading. We're hanging on by thread here. Abolitionism is at its peak. They're coming for us. We don't want slavery to end. Paint us some pictures here, my brother, that will make us look good. And part of that for him is, of course, is showing all that they own, but also showing all they own emptied of the hundreds of enslaved people that they usually um, um, owned and that were routinely working in plantation fields. He never shows anybody working ever <laughs> in their most normative work, which was to be cultivating sugar. You know, And thanks to Yale, 
uh, the Center for British Art, I was able to find six of his existing sketches and one of them is showing crop time. And I'm like, dude edited this out. <laughs> like he made a choice, <laughs> you know? Cause it's like, okay, there I have the evidence before it was a hypothesis, but now I'm like, this was a sketch he made which showed everybody clearing the field, which he would have seen, of course, over two years. He made a choice not to turn that into a print of the 21 he put in the book, right? So deliberate sanitization and suppression back to David's term of what he knew to be true um, in the context of Jamaica and the brutality of slavery in Jamaica. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever come across William Notman, um, his work when you were at McGill? They have uh, his archive at uh, the, uh, the McCord Museum. Yes, actually, I'm doing a lecture soon on this portrait of four black sitters that just fascinates me, David. Um, and it's known as G. Conway and Friends, okay. and it's 1901. And what totally made me obsessed with this, this portrait is that it's four beautifully dressed, dignified, upper middle class looking black people who are in a snowy background. Yeah. Even the dusting of snow on their shoulders. And I'm like, this is 1901. Yeah. Prime Minister Lord is after black people at this point. He's like, what can we do to make African-Americans not come to this country? Right. Let's tell them that they'll die in the snow, right? Yeah. And who are these four people who go to Notman in Montreal and go, uh, put us in the snowy backdrop. So I did the research and I found out that they went into the studio, get this, in August. Uh -huh. And they take two, yeah, and they take two pictures, the two pictures both in the snowy landscape. I'm like, I think this, consciously or not, this is, something's resonating for them in terms of the fact that they're in a nation that's telling them to get out, that they don't belong there. And they're making a statement that they do. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, Notman has fantastic portraits of Sitting Bull as well as a number of free blacks as you yes. pointed out. Um, but Duncanson actually spent yes. his time during the Civil War working at Notman's studio. Yes, and they become buddies. And I'm trying to figure out what is going on with Notman and Duncanson because, and I'm trying to figure out, David, I'd, I'd love to hear all of your opinions on this, but was Notman, was D um, Duncanson passing his wife? Is that why he got along so well in Montreal during the Civil War? I don't think so. I mean, Duncanson, you know, um, was very conscious, conscious of his blackness. And he was very conscious of his, I don't think so at all. But I mean, you know what? I found a source recently that, that just made me pause because the source is stating that he was in a correspondence fight with his son, one of his sons, who was accusing him of passing in Montreal yeah. and was ashamed of him for that. And yeah. he basically writes back and says something like, I'm allowed to live my life the way I want to live my life. Yeah. And, 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 you know, 1860s Montreal would not have been great for Black people from anywhere because just 30 years outside of slavery. So right. I'm like, how did he become so the it guy in the, the cultural landscape, hanging out with Notman and taking on white Canadian male art students in the space of two years? I saw that documentation and I saw Duncanson's response in, is it Knesset? Is it Knesset who, who, who does yeah, that? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. On, on Duncanson. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, he, he responds, I mean, the way that Nesset, I think, kind of uh, contextualizes it, um, it's also, um, Duncanson is based, is, is judge me on my history, mm -hmm. right? Judge, okay. you, can make this, you can make this accusation now, but, but, but actually judge me on, on the history of the things that I've done in the history that things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's a more complicated- Very nuanced, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to look and find a, a, mm -hmm. that section of the, the the author um but uh yeah it's um it's uh it's complicated i mean you know he i mean he was alone he was so alone um and he was uh he was being instrumentalized in so many ways uh, wherever he went mm -hmm. you know as this as this yeah. kind of symbol and mm -hmm. um i don't think he could ever escape you know, that burden. And so this idea of passing was in my mind a kind of impossibility for him. And I don't Yeah, think I was thinking how would Notman not have known of Duncanson before he got to Montreal? You know, how could he not have heard his name before that? He was quite famous by the time he went over there to, to Montreal. So yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. 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 So I'm, yeah. So I, I, but the other thing too, is for me, you know, when I teach about passing to my students, I say, listen, judge not lest ye be judged. You do not know what it meant for someone to try to pass. That's not an easy decision. Right. And they're trying to escape the brutality of, of anti-black racism in whatever space they're in. And also that means that what you can't pass and then go home for Thanksgiving. You're cutting yourself off from your life as you know it, your friends, your community, everybody that you love who is black and looks black. So yeah. these were not easy decisions to make at all. So I never have judgment when, when you know, I encounter people who appear to be passing in the archives or historically. You know, I think we need to have a really, um, really think about what it meant for them to take on the like the burden of trying to pass. Yeah. as it will, right? And also too, there would have been the constant biological threat of if they had children of their child coming out and looking blacker than they were. Right. So how long can you escape passing if you are in the years where you're, you're going to maybe have children, right? You're gonna find a, a, a heterosexual mate and reproduce. Right. And it could catch up with you that way too, right? So very difficult decisions, yeah. Joseph, Joseph Kettner is the author of yes. the the Duncanson book, yeah, yeah. The Duncanson book. Yeah. I mean, and what's important too is that he lays to rest some of the issues of, of uh, um, um, uh, Duncanson's race, right? The, he, there, yes. Prior to that, there were claims of Duncanson being a mulatto, right? That his father was- uh, Was a white Scottish Canadian, yeah. okay? <laughs> like seriously, that was how, like, that was our black historical artist for a long time, Duncanson in the National gallery or wherever else was the one that we trotted out and saying yay for us right but of course that that was totally fabricated history like thankfully Kettner was able to 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 do that that work incredible research and figure that out yeah for a long time they were they're still mislabeling Duncan's work as a Canadian artist too as opposed to an artist who visited Canada right <laughs> right <laughs> And all of this stuff is, I think, entangled in really kind of beautiful ways. And I think that your work uh, provides, you know, the framework within which we can understand all of these practices and how they're participating and, and what, and, and the, I don't want to say the, the hidden messages, but I think the, uh, the, the suppressed motivations mm. of, of, of the work that the, 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 um, the, the, uh, the landscapes are, are, are doing. Are doing, right, right. Yeah, and I think part of the way I to say that they get the job done, so to speak, is because, um, especially the more aesthetic ones, they look so innocent, totally. right? Unless you know how to read them, you can't. You don't read them as violent. You read them as pretty, yeah. right? You don't read the, read the violence in them unless you understand the practices of geography and cartography and colonialization, colonization and imperialism. You just are like, oh, it's just some pretty palm trees in a, a nice looking sugarcane field. And so what's the problem? So yeah. I think that, that some of the, yeah, the, the aesthetic beauty of them is actually un, un, works against people's ability to read them in a critical manner. Now for us and back then too, right? That's how James Hakewell's book was supposed to work. The picturesque tour of Jamaica. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, this yeah. is uh, one of my favorite quotes of your book. Um, uh, to analyze these images, not solely in terms of an emptied out, depoliticized de aesthetics or formal methodology, but rather within their colonial context, addressing their implications for processes and practices of empire, is, I believe, what Said meant when he argued for an analysis capable of reconnecting cultural forms to their actuality. Okay. You know my book better than I do. <laughs> you got to take the show on the road. <laughs> Maybe this is a good um, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> moment to begin to conclude. I, I, I'm for not, sure. I don't really remember how long these conversations are supposed to be. I feel like this one could go on for a long time and maybe we can stay on um, uh, after we end recording here um, and, and converse a little bit, a little bit more. But I think before, uh, if that makes sense for everyone, before kind of wrapping up here, um, I'm just going to share uh, my desktop again and just show um, again a few images just to uh, sort of contextualize or to, to, to bring it back to what we're talking about, which is, of course, Charmaine's book. Um, and then here we have an image of, of uh, 
of uh, David's poster, uh, both as the uh, sort of a web file version of it and, and then uh, in situ, um, you can sort of see the sort of size of it. Um, we didn't really talk a lot about the role of sort of advertising as much in this, in the context of your poster, but maybe that can be another conversation. I feel like we can have a few follow-up uh, conversations to this one. Um, so thank you both, thank you all, I should say, for, for being here. And, uh, and I, if there are last words people want to say before we, before we wrap. I just want to say thank you. It's been absolutely wonderful um, uh, continuing the conversation with, with you, Jonathan, and Francis, and beginning the conversation with you, Charmaine. I feel so grateful to be able to do this. Yeah. And I, I would add my thanks to and my gratitude to all of you and to David for, for reaching out to me. And I was just shocked. I was like, wow, this is such an honor. And I can't believe you picked my book. And I, I'm just really honored to get to know you and your amazing, uh, brilliant work and to, to get to meet and work with Francis and Jonathan as well. It's such, it's such a privilege. Thank you for including me. Oh, this has been such a pleasure. Yeah, <laughs> it's been wonderful, really. <laughs> Thank you. It really you. is a, a pleasure and an honor to, to, to host this conversation and to be working with the two of you, so three of you. So, um, uh, well, okay, I'll, I'm going to stop the recording and then, um, and that's it for, for now. Thanks very much.
Hello. Hi. Um, just to let you both know, we are currently live. Um, so the, <laughs> the live stream will pick up anything that we're saying. Um, does anyone need to screen share during the event? Me, I need to screen share. Okay, I'll make you a co-host then. Okay. I don't, how, can y'all, can you see me? Because I can't see me. I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't see myself, but I can see you. I can't um, see you. You should be able to see each other once I stop screen sharing yeah. and, and I can do that, uh, I guess, right at the top of the hour. So at five. I'll yeah, sure. Because cool. I'm just like, is it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Hi, Texas, Isaiah. Hey, you. How you doing? It's nice to be in conversation with you today. You as well. You as well. Congratulations. The book is beautiful. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, yes. I'm looking forward to just, you know, talking about it. Yeah, I can't wait. I think it's going to be really, I mean, I have, I, I like read some interviews from the two of you. I have questions. <laughs> <laughs> I did research. I did Got the whole night. You know what's so funny? I ended up ordering the book mm -hmm. and then I realized that it's not going to get here for two to three weeks. And so I had to go through another, um, I think I went through printed matter and oh. rushed it to LA because I wanted to have it before the talk. Um, oh, wow. Um, so I just got it. I don't even know what date it is. Jesus. Uh, Wednesday, I think. I think I got mm -hmm. it on Wednesday. And it's just been such a treat to sit with it the last couple of days. Oh, that's so cool. That's really I'm glad. It's funny that you were like, I got to get the book. I got to know what's going on. Yeah, because uh, I just been sometimes I just feel like I'm so out of the loop with things. Um, and yeah, I'm just just so happy. It's one of my favorite photo books, actually, that I've uh, purchased this year. Oh, thank you very much. Cool. Yeah. I'm really glad that you like it. That means good things. Yeah. yeah. I also feel out of the loop about stuff, which is why I read, um, oh, hey, Zora. Hi, I snuck up hey, on y'all. Hey, y'all. <laughs> hey, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> hey, nice to meet you as well. I, we couldn't Hello. see anything for a minute, so I just chatted away. Yeah. <laughs> um, if, okay. if you guys would like to get started, I'll start recording and you can go ahead. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, sure, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so it's on, on now. It's recording. Yeah, I'm, and we're live as well. Okay, just because I'm a little confused about that because I went on the website and there was like a YouTube video and then people were like, what's the link? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so sending them a link to that video. <laughs> we're using um, we're using Restream, which rec which shows live. Like our Zoom meeting is live, but restreams onto YouTube. Oh, uh, okay, I, I understand now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um. Hello. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Zora. Hello, Zora J. Hello, Texas Isaiah. Let's. I'm ready to start. Um, yeah, let's get into it. I'm really excited for this today. I'm going to do intros for you all, of course. And then I just have a bunch of questions. So um, my name is Sasha Fires Burgess. I had a book come out with Capricious Publishing this year. I won the um, 2018 or 2019. I was the <laughs> second person of the, the second Capricious book publisher winner. Um, Capricious Books is Annika Sabid and Sophie Mourner. Just uh, the book itself was designed by Studio Lynn. I want to make sure I mention everyone. Also, uh, for those of you who don't know anything about this award, this is there's actually three years of the award. So for those of you who have seen John C. Ed John Edmonds' book, Higher, that was also published by Capricious Books. And Farah al Qasimi will have the next book for this book award out. Um, I don't know when it will be out, but check it out because Farah al Qasimi's work is really crazy and that book's going to be wild. So today I am here with Zora J. Murph and Texas Isaiah. 
I'm going to start with Zora's bio. So Zora J. Murph is an assistant professor of art at the University of Arkansas. He received his MFA from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and holds a BS in psychology from Iowa State University. Merging his educational experiences, Murph uses his practice to highlight intersections between various social systems and art. He has published books with Ain't Bad Editions. It was pulled from the publisher, just so we know. Pulled, it's pulled. You can't get that book, but you can get the books with Chris Gave Projects. His most recent monograph, At No Point in Between, Dice Books, was selected as the winner of the independently published category of the Lucy Foundation Photo Book Awards. Murph is also a co-curator co -curator of Strange Fire Collective, a group of interdisciplinary artists, writers, and curators working to construct and promote an archive of artwork created by diverse makers. Murph is represented by Weber Gallery in London. Thank That's you, Sasha. Bio. <laughs> and now I'm going to read Texas Isaiah's bio. Texas Isaiah, he, they, is a first generation visual narrator born in Brooklyn, New York, but currently residing in Los Angeles, California. The intimate works he creates centers the possibilities that invite individuals to participate in the photographic process. He's attempting to shift the power dynamics rooted in photography to display different ways of accessing support in one's own body. Hello, welcome Texas Isaiah. Thank you. Okay, um, so today I know that really I just thought it'd be really nice to just be in conversation together. And I just always have questions when I look at people's work and thoughts about um, photography and different things like that. So I know um, I, want, I asked you all to kind of think about your aesthetic influences, but I'm gonna ask more specific questions about that. Um, so I'll start with you first, Texas Isaiah. And what were your aesthetic influences growing up? Were you just looking at photographs or were you looking at photography, capital P? You know, like art photography. What were you looking at growing up? What was influencing you? Um, I, would, I would say my environment. Um, I think um, I am the first known artist of my family. So I didn't grow up going to museums or galleries or being exposed to art in that way. And so, um, yeah, I think that the aesthetics that I was mostly drawn to were, were sort of like music. So mm -hmm. I was very obsessed with album covers, my father's vinyl covers, um, mm -hmm. those sort of um, photographic imprints. Mm -hmm. um, and again, um, the neighborhood um, that I grew up in, I grew up in East New York, Brooklyn, also lived in Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights, and now I'm in LA. And so I think a lot of those musical elements that I was attracted to was also mirrored the environment that I lived in. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there was just a lot of things that were incorporated in it, like fashion, particularly streetwear and all of these mm -hmm. other aesthetics. And I found that to be intriguing, but it wasn't the thing that like sort of catapulted me into photography. So what would you, okay, I have two questions <laughs> because I'm like really, I'm like really have been thinking about the reason why I'm going down this path of questioning for both of you is like, it's not often that I think we get to talk about our aesthetic influences, the things that made our aesthetic imprints on us growing up. So I'm also wondering like, okay, do you have a photo in mind, an image in mind, like of an album cover that you used to see all the time that you remember that, uh, that you feel as though has made an impact in some way, maybe not at all on your work? Mm -hmm. Is there anything um, in particular that stands out? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, Cause I can name some, but like mm -hmm. they haven't influenced my work directly. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think I was always somebody who was just like, I don't like want to replicate this feeling or this image, but like, I want to create a thread more mm -hmm. so. Um, but a lot of the images of DMX, um, those black and white images, um, yeah a lot of um, the images of Wu-Tang. Um, what else sticks out to me? Um, that DMX one was a good one because I remember those early images. Eve, like all of like the women who were the first ladies. Um, mm -hmm. 
um, like the images like Missy Elliott and Busta Rhymes, those kind of aesthetics mm-hmm. were just like, I was a big fan of like Hype Williams um, and just looking at those kind of aesthetics. But again, like they don't really sort of grab, like they don't, I never took them into my work. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that they offered me some sort of like um, aspect of like a possibility, right? So like mm-hmm. this is Hype Williams, his black possibility of uh-huh. a visual narrative. So like, what what does like a Texas Isaiah possibility look mm-hmm. like? And so those were the kind of models that I yeah. was attracted to when I was younger. Mm-hmm. And it also really just sounds like it like populates your mind. Mm-hmm. Like, of course, like it makes sense that you wouldn't maybe necessarily like you're not trying to make a Hype Williams music video, you know, but the aesthetics populate your mind to whatever the, the thing that comes next is, you know, whatever the. Yes, yeah, so I think that's really yeah there was a minimal like there's something minimal like minimalistic about those images too right because even those images of dmx like they were just in whatever environment he grew up in or were Mm -hmm. familiar with that image of him with the two dogs um you know those kind of things and i think i was very attracted to minimalism because i'm like Mm -hmm. well in comparison to like all of the aesthetics of missy elliott which are really beautiful i was like Mm -hmm. you could still create a beautiful image in an environment like that mm-hmm. without any sort of like props or like lighting or anything of that sort, you know? I mean, in a interesting way, I feel as though this does kind of circle back to your, because I think <laughs> you're 2000, no, seriously. Like I, I was, um, because a lot of the images that you take are minimal in the sense that you don't, it's often just a subject and light. And I think that you have a keen like uh, eye for light and you're like looking for the light and you pose your subjects within the light. And then there's often like maybe a verdant or a lush background. So Mm -hmm. I think in some kind of way, Mm -hmm. possibly that those, like what you said, like it was the simplicity that was the minimalism of the thing that mm-hmm. made you yeah I don't know I don't know what you think but yeah it makes no sense when I look at yeah. your work <laughs> yeah I I always love to hear it because sometimes I'm like you know you're just sitting with it for such a long time that mm-hmm. you're like I really don't know what it is until like 10 years later you know <laughs> yeah. yeah okay thank you very much yeah no, thank you um okay so Zora I have the same question for you but really I wanted to be I, I had a um okay so I want to know about your introduction to photography, Zorje, and when you got into the more academic or institutional side of photography, uh, like when do you feel like, and, and also how do you see your work as fitting into that canon? That's also a question that I'm then gonna like bounce back and forth. But I was thinking about that specifically because I think um, you just very recently won the Aperture Book Award and Aperture itself is like a, you know, it's like a, it's like photography. <laughs> so I was thinking about, yeah, like what were, were you looking at capital P photography in the sense of like the canon, you know, that who's that, who has the, who has the, um, what DJ has the tag? It's like the canon, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Not the canon. <laughs> Uh, you know what I'm talking Some DJ has that in the Funk Flex? Song. Yeah, Funk Flex. <laughs> oh, the actual sound. The okay. Yeah, he says that in the back of his song. <laughs> How I know it was Funk Flex, though. <laughs> yeah, you were like, um, you grew up in New York. That's why you know. What was that? Hot 97? That was 95. That was 95. Hot 97. Hot 97. <laughs> the Cannon. Okay. Sorry. Um, Zora. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, um, yeah, like I, you know, I didn't grow up like, you know, exposed to like art sort of in the traditional sense of like, you know, going to galleries or museums or anything like that, you know, like my earliest interactions like with art spaces would have been like through, you know, field trips in elementary school to the mm-hmm. Des Moines Art Center. Um, and so, yeah, like I think that I've always been interested in maybe images or imagery. And I, that comes from, um, 
you know, like being at my grandma's house, like looking through family photo albums, you know, we had like a camcorder at some point and I mm -hmm. loved it. Like when, you know, the adults got bored with it and then us kids could have our chance to play with it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like, you know, like Jet and Ebony magazine, um, you know, just like those sorts of things. I've also like um, been thinking about a lot of the movies I watched um, mm -hmm. growing up. Um, <clears throat> And specifically like John Singleton, you know, like kind of dealing with, actually I, I like how this relates to canons because, you know, sort mm -hmm. of his way of touching the canon of the coming of age tale, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so ways of like being able to see oneself, you know, in that, you know, in those narratives, right? And, mm -hmm. and being able to relate and not having to like sort of watch, you know, white movies of that sort and then have to sort of imagine your own blackness like as positioned in those, in those movies. Um, and so I would say like, those are like my early influences, but maybe just thinking about like visual things and not necessarily, um, yeah, like about like, you know, photography, capital P until like I went to school. Right. Um, was that and undergrad? Then, Sorry. Yeah. When you yeah, went yeah, to yeah, undergrad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I went to my undergrad and it was, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, like being, you know, like taught, like, you know, the, the who's who of whatever. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, and so, I mean, I think that like in considering like, you know, like my education, considering my experience, uh, you know, making art um, and your, your question about the canon is that I always, like lately I've been thinking about how I approach things considering my absence, right? Mm -hmm. That the canon- mean, like, like well like okay. I mean like right right like well and I, and I think like I don't want like to get it twisted like this this sort of generalizing way of like you know like black people not existing in the canon of photography but the fact that we do uh -huh. exist it's just we haven't had the power to be able to insert ourselves into the canon right like it's always like you know throughout history it's like grown and progressed but it's always sort of done in like these real like weird awful ways anyway mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think of like sort of absence in that way, like that I was being taught by white people that I was being shown, you know, majority, you know, like white, white artists. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I had to go out and sort of find things for myself um, as a way to understand where, like when I think about the canon of photography or, or whatever, um, that like, there's people out there who exist that I can sort of draw inspiration from or, or reflect upon, but mm -hmm. that in my time, at least as a student, it was something that I had to figure out on my own or, or sort yeah. of go alone, right? Um, and so when I sort of come at that question now, um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't think I would entertain to say like where I fit into the canon, um, but that like, I know I have, you know, the, the, the talent and agency to be a part of the canon, you know, that I can right. position myself, you know, into it, right? Like I can insert myself into the discussion. Um, and I think that's like, you know, what we've all like, like something that we've just all been sort of reflecting upon a lot more lately mm -hmm. than we usually do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have like a, a kind of another question that goes along with this but um I was kind of like debating whether or not we should talk about this but I don't know if you guys don't like the question you don't have to answer it but really I was thinking more like when we look back on this moment like you know how we're taught about historical moments I've been I keep trying to like as a way to understand the current moment project myself if I make it y'all into the future. <laughs> that part. <laughs> if we get there, y'all, I keep trying to project myself into the future. <laughs> and then like, and, and give like a historical reading of this moment, not just politically, but artistically, like, you know, when you think about conceptual art or where do you even think about like Kamoing Workshop or if you think about anything, like if you think about, yeah. And all of these are like very, can't, I'm talking like very canonized things, but like 
even if you think about, yeah, like I'm thinking about Stonewall, all these things that like, I'm like, what is this moment? And what is the art that is like going to be defined by it? And I'm just curious for you all, like, have you, and I know the idea of projecting ourselves into the future is like, it's a task, but have you ever, like, what are your thoughts? Mm. Whoever wants to. I've been, I've been thinking about how, um, how much, like, how much more generational trauma we've accumulated in the last year and a half. Um, I was talking to a friend, uh, my friend Taylor, and I was like, you know, I can't help but like feel my body sort of retaining this information and meditating on how it's going to be passed down. And I've just been kind of stuck on that because I think that I can think beyond in certain ways, but I think what ways, um, I mean, maybe I can hope beyond I think maybe that's it. Like I can, I can maybe imagine what beyond can look like, but I don't think that I have anything concrete cemented that I can like really lean on. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I just feel like when we just think about like the things that we're going through and just healing as just a concept, I don't even think that I can even understand what healing can look like because we're already still in this shit, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And so when I see like all of the the work that is being produced during this time, even for myself and my colleagues, peers, friends, strangers, um, I think it's a little difficult for me to sort of like place or position like what this will look like in the future. Because I think I just also have like a lot of feelings around how maybe work is being made. And then also knowing that there are so many people still excluded from the canon and mm-hmm. how much we f- like, how much I, I see people believe in that because, um, you know, black people are doing this thing that we've been doing for a long time, but not understanding that we are not, that we're not monolithic, right? Like we're not yeah. a monolith. So, and not really, like uh, incapable of, of understanding that like, okay, like how can we think beyond ourselves? Like where are the black queer people in, in this conversation or the black queer, like transgender, expansive, intersex, disabled like folks like in this conversation. So mm-hmm. it, it's just a little difficult for me to like, I don't know, just like imagine like what it looks like, you know? And it, it's not to imply that like, I'm not hopeful Um, Mm -hmm. I feel like if I, I feel like if Black people were not hopeful, we would not still be here. Um, Mm -hmm. But I have a lot of reason to be skeptical. I have a lot of reason to criticize. I have a a lot of reason to like not believe what I'm seeing or what I'm being fed. Um, Because we already know the game. (laughs) Yeah, but like we already, you know, and how much that is also within community, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. And, And to me, that is... That is the most important question to me is like, how are we treating each other within community? Um, Come for me, come for me. Mm -hmm. You know, because I'm not, I'm not considering white people, you know, like I don't think about white people when I make work or when I'm considering like what our well-being will look like. But I also know that white supremacy is prevalent, you know, within us and within our communities. And so I'm just like, how do we, what does it look like to eradicate that fully? Mm -hmm. You think about this photographically? Is this, cause I now I have like so many different questions that I wanna, <laughs> no seriously, because well, two things. It's like, in some ways, I personally see you as part of the canon. And I know that I've, I've read your statements on this before, so we don't have to talk about it. You know, what it means to be blah, 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 blah. But then it's like, even like the work that you make opens a way, even when it's, not opening a way, if that makes sense, because it exists now. And like, Mm. in some ways, I know, yeah, this isn't true, but in some ways we can't look back. That's what I think, but I'm probably a lie. It's like- What, What do you mean by that? I mean, like in the terms of 
all of the things that you're saying about like mm -hmm. in the future, like we still need to like have the conversations amongst ourselves to eradicate the systems of white supremacies that have been embedded in within our communities that we then enact on each other. You know what I'm saying? And so then I'm like also curious about like, for some, when I think about your, your work and stuff, it's like, I see, it's like now that the images have been made and there's a spotlight on them, it's like, we can't pretend like this can't happen anymore. You know, that like mm. queer and gender expansive people can't do this work because we know already, you know, it's almost like, it's almost like reconstruction era America. No, I'm just <laughs> what I'm trying to say though, is like, we know it, it can be done. So now in the future, when the people that own this shit try to make like excuses for why they don't hire people of color to do stuff it's like well y'all did it already what's the problem and it's also reminding them too you know yeah. and I've been sort of contemplating like what our what our role is within that um because I, I feel like the process is still going to be arduous we're still going to have to teach people regardless right <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's even like how I um how I extend that even within like the editorial and commercial work and how I talk to clients and mm -hmm. how I deny work. And I say, this is why I'm not, this is why I'm saying no to this so that you don't <laughs> approach another black photographer um, with as much disrespect <laughs> or like these things. Right. And like, I feel mm -hmm. very committed to like voicing those things because it's not enough to be hired. It's not enough to be the first known. It's never actually, it's never enough to be the first known. Actually, that's really sad. Because, you know, like, I think that when I think about photography, I'm like, I can't name a Black trans photographer. Like, why? We know why that is. Yeah. Right? But also, we can, why is that? Yeah. You know, yeah. and like, we can name those things. But also, it's like the power dynamics, right? Like, there's only so much control in, in how we sort of, like, navigate this thing. And we can only do as much as we can. But um. I feel like I'm gonna just ramble, but I feel like every time I have this conversation with myself, like I keep running into a wall when I mm -hmm. when I think I have found a solution, yeah. and it's just like. Well, but I, I, yeah. no, I, I hear I definitely hear what you're saying, and and especially how you're talking mm -hmm. about how you've been dealing with photo editors, right? Because I think before, or not necessarily before, I'm trying to find a way of like not trying to delineate too much, like as there as if there is like a hard before and after, right? Mm -hmm. But I feel like what sort of um, maybe what I feel I've woken up to is that sense of like, no, it's not enough that I got hired for the job, right? I need to mm -hmm. be speaking out because as you're saying, it, is that if I say this to, to a photo editor, like you're coming to me right now and I understand why you're coming to me right now and I'm gonna tell you why it's fucked up and you need to stop doing this shit, right? Um, and so, but within that, even though that is still accommodating me individually, right, it's bleeding out into the collective. Mm -hmm. And so the more and more we begin to speak truth to these things, the, the, I think the wider the gates open, right? Um, and, and, I, and I feel like something I'm sort of hearing like in this, like with your original question, Sasha, like maybe the way mm -hmm. that I would answer it to me, yeah. it feels like almost like a matter of like directness, right? And I mm -hmm. think about, this is like kind of leading into the question that I had for you, Sasha. <laughs> um, but just like this this idea of, um, you know, being direct. So like, I, I've always really appreciated your bio on your website. It's your, mm -hmm. the year you were born, the fact that you're a Scorpio, the fact that you're black, the fact that you're alive, right? We don't need mm -hmm. to say much else past that. Like it's, just completely direct and matter of fact, this is who I am, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm here and I'm alive, I'm present, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, like, as I was thinking about that, I um, was revisiting this quote from um, Glitch Feminism uh, by Legacy mm -hmm. Russell. Um, is it okay if I read it, y'all entertain Yeah, me? yeah, of course. Okay. All right, so um, it says, to exist within a binary system, one must assume that ourselves are unchangeable that how we are read in the world must be chosen for us rather than for us to define and choose for ourselves. To be at the intersection of female identifying queer and black is to find oneself at an integral apex. Each of the components is a key technology in and of itself. Alone and together, 
female, queer, black, as a survival strategy, demand the creation <clears throat> of their individual machinery that innovates, builds, resists. Black people invent ways to create space through rupture. And so I like when I talk with my, I've been talking with my students about your work a lot lately, Sasha, but one of the like first words that I lead off with is presence. Um, because I, I think I've like in getting to know you, I've just become quite fixated with how you talk about how you photograph that you're just mm -hmm. sort of present in the scene, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I don't know, maybe if, I don't know if you just want to like kind of talk about that within your own work or just how you're thinking about things lately. Yeah, I think that I'm paying attention. I don't really know how to like, I mean, I could get all, I could be like, be here now, Ram Dass, like, if you don't remain in the present, little, you know, I could give you one of those if that's what y'all, if y'all want a, a Buddhism tea, I can give it to you. <laughs> but the truth is, I'm just there, like, and when I'm there, I'm paying attention. And as I'm paying attention, I see things. I hear things. I, I notice the way people are treating each other. I'm like, how does, are y'all treating each other okay? This person looks like, you know, I just am like paying right. attention. I don't know how else to say it. Sure. Well, but I guess so like, I think my sort of follow up question to that would be like, and something that you that you put to me the last time we were on the phone, you were talking about Stephen Shore and you were like, when Stephen Shore was making his photographs, he didn't care about my black ass, right? Like he wasn't thinking about me, right? <laughs> um, Damn, that's a direct <laughs> quote, Zora. <laughs> you, like, really you like from the phone <laughs> conversation. Right, yeah, well, yeah, I know, right? Whatever. Anyway, but the, <laughs> but the fact, like, I think that something that you and I have discussed before in relationship to your work is mm -hmm. what does it mean? Like, you're, you're talking about being present. You're just talking about, like, looking, listening, feeling, right? Um, but what does it mean that you are the one present, right? Mm. Say more. What do you mean? Like, me, my, like personage like my physical appearance what does that mean okay yeah 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 or, so or like, any, like is... any sort of standpoint that you feel like you possess like you know mm -hmm. whatever but yeah yeah I'm like trying to figure out the right I guess the best way <laughs> yeah so I should say that I'm a technical person photographically right I think I'll start with that because that's the best way into, to enter into this question. And so there's, uh, I bring the camera with me because I'm interested in taking good photographs. And I, I like, you know, it's a sickness that we all have. It's a perversion. We take photos of people, like, what is it? But at the same time, it's like a thing that I'm interested in. And so I think I just have this awareness that um, in order to see people, I have to like be with them. And sometimes that means I have to be with them before the camera even enters the picture. So like, I guess that's part of it. And sometimes that doesn't happen, but I, I don't know. I'm also curious about that. Y'all, did you, did y'all see yourselves as observers growing up or as part of the, like, I, 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 I'm curious to, I guess, to explain my whatever it's just like I always enjoyed the act of looking and I've always was curious about other people like I would see people on the street and be like that's interesting or like oh that's a thing they have on their head you know like I was always kind of like hmm. but as I was like paying attention I began noticing the world <laughs> so I was like oh wait certain people get treated like this why do they turn away from that man on the corner? This boy wore a skirt to school and now everybody's mad, which is some shit that happened when I was in high school. <laughs> and I remember stuff like that happening and like not fully understanding it. Like, you know when, yeah. And so I just like, I just started paying attention more and more and more and more and more. It was like, yeah, I just, in order to understand why people were being treated a certain way. It was like, I had to read and pay attention and listen. And 
I guess that's the, the way to answer. I can feel I like ask, I'm not really answering this Can question. I ask you a question? I, I wonder mm. if, because we're both from Brooklyn. I was born and, there, but I grew up in Pennsylvania, yeah. Okay. I was just going to ask like whether or not your like, uh, like geographical location and your upbringing has so much to do with that attentiveness. Because my family is from Guyana and I grew up oh, in yeah. Brooklyn. And mm-hmm. I just feel like, I don't know, just like whether or not our like environments just like sort of program us to like, to, to sort of settle into that, to that space of being a, an observer. And I feel like mm-hmm. I had experienced that because I was in New York, like it's a super dense city, mm-hmm. um, d- differently than it is here in LA. Mm-hmm. But like, mm-hmm. I could just be posted up by the bodega and like watch the world go by. And you just- Stop. You know, so I, I'm just like interested also if that like played like a part in in how you've um, developed as an observer and a mm-hmm. participant in the world in that way. Yeah. I, I think when you're living on a life, when you're living life on a level that is not the norm, you must pay attention or else you will die. <laughs> And I'm saying this in like, <laughs> like I'm saying this in like multiple ways and the ways in which I think photography became the means for me to understand what was going on in the world, right? And I used the camera as a way to be like, I get to investigate X, Y, Z thing. I get to investigate this. I get to investigate that. But I think I've always just learned about awareness, like just things that people tell you in your home. Don't do this. Don't do that. da, 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 da. You do, you, you, and then you start watching what other people are doing. You're like, but why is blah, 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 doing blah, blah, blah. And then you're like, oh, that's a white person. Like when I was in, when I was in elementary school, my mother, (laughs) this is really funny, but it's like an important note about awareness. You know, when you're in school, third, fourth grade, because I grew up in Pennsylvania, it was all white people and everybody's in the class, blah, 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 blah. uh, And it'd be like, Sasha, da, 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 Sasha, da, da, da. And I was like, I, I didn't know. And then I would go home and my mother's West Indian person and she'd be like, stop talking in the class. I didn't put you in the lady class. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, and she kept saying, if you open your mouth, they will see you first. They will see you first. And I had no idea what that, like literally I was like 21 years old and I was like, that's what my mom meant. She just was trying to tell me that I was a black person and they were looking for me to fuck up. They were waiting for me to do anything. If I, all the kids in the class are talking, but I'm the one that talks and it's like, Sasha, go to the front, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it was like, I kept seeing it happening to other kids around me too. All the Latino kids, because where I grew up, there was a lot of Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, all these kids. I was just watching kids that like, I knew to be like, you know, it was like, I kept getting told they were bad. I just was paying attention basically. And I was like, something here doesn't make sense. Like somebody is lying to me. And I just was like, make it make sense. And I think I started looking more and more and more and more. And I just was photographing and stuff like that. But really that's what it is. I was like, what's going on here? Like something don't make sense in here. Mm. And, And then that, that, so that starts with race. And then I had another experience. I went to this alternative high school And then the gender and the sexuality stuff came up because in 2006, damn, I'm old, but in 2006, (laughs) I graduated high school and I went to this alternate (laughs) high school. And at the high school, there was just a lot of like gender, expansive people, trans people, but this was like in 2006, so we weren't calling it that yeah and I knew that it was like well people were calling it that I should be specific me and my friends in high school didn't have that language and then I would see I I noticed that oh this is a place where my friends could be themselves and I was like why can't they be themselves in the world like if my friend comes in with a corset on and I'm like what's wrong with that you know what I mean I like wasn't understanding what was going on the world Mm -hmm. so I just like kept paying more and more attention and being like oh this is weird and then I just started photographing it like I was just always I just always had a camera really yeah (laughs) I have more questions for you all 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think specifically, uh, first, if we can go to Zora, I actually wanted to talk about your early, early work, Zora, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because I was just curious if we could kind of talk about uh, your, I guess I would say your trajectory, perhaps mm-hmm. as an artist. Um, yeah. And so yeah. I guess, I don't know if Corrections is your like first, first work, mm-hmm. but um, it's like kind of the, presented as such on your website. So I just wanted to know if you could like talk about how you feel like you've grown as a photographer from then yeah. to now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, um, <laughs> definitely grown in a technical sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, that, I, I look back and I look back at this work and I I enjoy looking back at it because I see more fully things I was trying to articulate, but like you were just talking about, didn't possess the language to maybe say those things very clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like, you know, this work, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that, maybe I've grown in that I'm, I give myself a lot more license. I think when I, you know, was making this work, um, I was learning a lot about like the history of documentary photography. I studied with two documentarians. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I had a really hard time between, you know, like as a photographer, you know, like where can I like bend the truth? essentially. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like understanding, of course, that like, there's no rules, you know, I I very much get to decide that for myself. But that I had such intimate involvement, you know, with these kids and, you know, with the system, you know, being Mm -hmm. an employee of it at the time. um, I had, I had, I had to grapple with reality a lot. And so, um, I would say it's like, you know, maybe more rigid than, mm-hmm. you know, work that I make now yeah. um, in the sense that, yeah, it was just, it was like, it was my first, like my, you know, very first sort of, um, you know, like time making a, a committed body of work. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And how do you feel like that kind of like fluidity that you have now in your work has helped you kind of approach newer subjects? Because you not just, um, I mean, I think in this work as well, you kind of, we see your interest in like objects outside of just the photographs themselves. But I feel like you've gone a lot deeper into using like uh, archival images and all these other different images. And then you're, you also as a photographer, like I feel the camera getting looser. So like, do you, Mm -hmm. like, how do you see those kind of things? Yeah, well, I think it's just, you know, kind of reconfiguring the boundaries of how I understand, um, how I understand like photography as a medium, and then also, you know, like working on like learning how I implicate myself in the things that I make. And I usually tie that back to, you know, like what does it mean to make representations of other people? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like what does it mean to be, you know, like in that sort of, in that sort of position? Um, but, you know, like, I, I feel like appropriating, like beginning to just like start using appropriating in my, in my practice. Um, yeah, that, you know, that crime pays, right? Like that, mm-hmm. that, you know, it's, it just becomes more about like visual culture generally. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like how does one sort of locate or identify themselves through the consumption of culture? Uh, and then, you know, to me, for me to be an artist now, I'm like, I, I like this, um, maybe this quagmire of being stuck in this feedback loop where I just consume and then recycle culture over and over and over and over again as, as a way to like insert myself in somewhere, you know, to just kind of wriggle into that. Um, and the, like, even with like the newer work, like I was sort of setting like loose goals or ideas for myself of what I wanted it to be. I was like, well, if I can't say right now what I want it to be, what is it that I want to do? And I was like, I want to find a way to appropriate myself. And so like that kind of triggered this, you know, like kind of going down this rabbit hole of like, you know, like what are, what are those things that I carry with me that I've like, you know, sort of 
listen to or watched or you know find fascinating like how do I Uh like keep finding ways of articulating um, those things visually but then what deeper ideas do those visual moments connect to Mm -hmm. yeah so um this idea of you appropriating yourself and that becoming um a way for you to kind of continue interrogating these ideas and these questions I'm also curious if you see that as part of a shift of maybe you moving from a photographer to an artist. And also I'm I'm curious, like, do you think of yourself as an artist? No, seriously, because it's like, yeah. I think it's a shift. Your first project is photographic, but like you become so much more looser. Your references, the things that you use, all that kind of stuff has been like, it's been really shifting. And I, I'm just curious about your journey as an artist yeah yeah well um you know my um my partner Raina like we, we've talked a lot lately about you know sort of the ways we learn to become you know educators and artists mm-hmm. and in I think specifically related to being educators what are those things that we need to unlearn to ensure the safety of our students today right mm-hmm. what are what are those bad things that I was taught that I hold on to that mm-hmm. then I then project onto them. And then that creates, right, the, the vicious cycle, right? You know, like I learn these terrible things, I give it to the students, they internalize it, and then they put it back into the world. And then it just like, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so how do we begin just like, yeah, trying to dismantle those old ways? Um, and so after I, I um, you know, I, I finished grad school, my thesis was at no point in between, which, you know, I would eventually publish as a book. But the the first year after grad school, when I was like focused really intently mm-hmm. on figuring out the work, figuring out how it existed in book format, I was also beginning to shed those, those ways of thinking that I no longer like had to hold on to because of the pressure of being inside of an institution, right? Like I could think for myself, I didn't have to account to anyone else. Therefore, I was able to find, you know, like those, um, I have another quote, but I won't read it, but like um, from American artist, it was on his, uh, in their uh, Instagram story, but just like this idea of like, yeah, like, you know, being taught like what it means to be a photographer, you know, I studied Mm -hmm. photography, so I need to be a photographer and this is what photographers do. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, like finding ways to quickly abandon that. And so where even like just the simple act of like, or the the simple notion of telling myself, I'm not gonna focus on a body of work anymore. Rather, I'm just gonna make things as I you know need to make them based on what it is I'm going through. And so if mm-hmm. I need to spend, you know, six months inside of my studio working on collages because I just really don't care about using a camera or being outside right now, Mm-hmm. I have that latitude because it's my practice. Therefore, I can right, dictate, yeah. you know, how, how it works. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think it, it's just, you know, expanding through these really kind of small ways of interrogating oneself. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah. Hey, Zora, I have a question. Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, one, one thing that I really love about corrections is um, sort of this contrast between like surveillance and, and privacy and how you've been able to sort of like situate the sitter. Um, and see, I thought I had a question, but I think I'm just processing. <laughs> um, Keep going. But, but yeah, um, but I'm, I'm curious on like how long it took you to like create this work um, and if in the, in the, in the genesis of the idea, like, was it meant to be a project or did you just sort of start off and feel like, okay, I, like I'm kind of on to something? Yeah. Well, I think that I'm glad that you asked that question. Cause yeah, that's something that like, I don't really talk about a lot, but it's actually one of the first moments in an academic space where I felt legitimately seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was taking, I started this advanced projects class with uh, my um, professor, Jeff Rich. And mm-hmm. like he said, you know, the assignment for the semester was that you're going to start making a body of work. You're just going to focus on one thing and you're just going to make work about it. And then we're going to have critique. Um, and so, you know, I was working at the detention facility, working with kids on probation full time. I was a full time student and mm-hmm. I just decided to to make that work. But, um, you know, the first sort of iterations of things that I brought in 
like after our critique, um, after the first critique of it, he pulled me aside and was like, this is really good. And I was like, oh, thanks, Jeff. Like, I appreciate that. <laughs> and he's like, no, like, this is really good. And I was like, uh, all right. And then, um, and then later he, you know, said like he had been interviewed by like Wired, their Wired magazine, like their online photography blog. And he like mentioned, like he forwarded my work in my name. And then I was like interviewed. And that was like the first time I sort of like touched the, you know, sort of the art world, so to speak, where you're putting your work out there. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like, you know, the, it was, it kind of goes back to, or, or like, I guess I, in making the work, I think about, I had to really think clearly about my dynamic in it, like a, sort of acknowledging that, that power, that power structure that's inherent in, in making a portrait of somebody. Um, and so there were a lot of things like, you know, I couldn't show their faces. That was just a rule, right? Um, I could decide to show their faces and then just maybe not make my work public so my bosses couldn't see it. Um, but they knew I was working on it. And so I wanted to just sort of honor that agreement. And then of course, like the, you know, the kid's safety and, and all of that. Um, but that, that rule created, like it, it was sort of, it's like was swept up inside of the work because um, since it was a reality that I couldn't show their faces, it was already an immediate commentary on how we get to know this, this system, right? It's a right. system that's meant to be shielded from the public. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting phenomena. Let's talk about that, right? And then, you know, I, so I start trying to find ways to talk about that and then just kind of, you know, like bleeds out. And so it was a, like, I worked on it for two years, um, but it was like that, that first time Jeff was like, this is good. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, so this means I can actually like, I can do this and people will take it seriously, right? Like it's not just an assignment. It can be much, like it can exist outside of that. And that, and therefore like this moment that I understood, I'm not just a student. I'm actually an artist right now, today, mm. right? And of course that's inherent when, when someone decides to study or like to study art or even just make art, right? Yeah. Um, but that like, yeah, it was like that awakening for me, like where I had, I became awake to that that reality um, for myself. And yeah, I'll just like, kind of leave that there, but thank you. That was a really great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you, thank you. So I suppose uh, to pose the same question to you, Texas Isaiah, when do you feel as though you moved from photographer to artist or yeah, how would you, label that part of your life or I don't know you know just talk freely <laughs> <laughs> um I think like one of the first places that I start is sort of reframing language um to fit like where I am currently and so I've been for the last couple of years um is it couple I don't know but I've just been sort of like leaning on the term visual narrator because I feel like it offers me a lot of space to um, potentially like not just focus on images, but also other things. Mm -hmm. um, that hasn't really happened yet publicly, but mm -hmm. um, I like that playground a lot. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's really difficult for me to like contain myself like within that kind of language. Um, okay. Um, you know, I I don't I don't like I rarely like consider myself an artist. I, I rarely like use that language, although like I feel like that. Yeah. Um, but a visual narrator has always just like felt like home. Um, and so I've never like sort of exercised like my creative like outlet like outside of that because I always felt like there's just something more that I'm craving like within the medium that I'm sort mm -hmm. of like clawing at and trying to like get down to like the root of whatever it is that I'm that I'm curious about. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it always just feels so new to me. 
<laughs> in so many ways mm-hmm. where I haven't felt like, you know, I can maybe move on to moving images or move on to collages or mm-hmm. um, it's just always been stills. Yeah. You know, for the most part. So you feel as though it kind of begins with the eye in terms of like, it begins with the visual, like the, like the photograph or the, the movies, you know, mm-hmm. it kind of begins there. Um, and then to say visual narrator allows you the space to like bring in all these other things when and if you need them. Yeah. And also bring in the people who are really good at those things too. Right. Because mm-hmm. just because I'm a photographer, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be a really great filmmaker and mm-hmm. I can try those things, but I also really love working with people. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And so if I know someone who's a good director or a good um, DP or whatever, I'd rather Mm -hmm. bring those people in so that we can collaborate on the Mm -hmm. vision together. And I really love that space, you know, Um, and it humbles me because it's also like, you know, I may be interested in maybe maybe like maybe I, 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 you know, maybe when it comes to movies and videos, like maybe I'm just meant to be an audience. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, and, and not, and not the maker. Um, and I don't think, you know, I, I feel like we just live in such a, like a, a, a like a, a productive, like positive, like do it all kind of culture, which, you know, if, if that's you, that's you. But like, also like, I love the fact that I'm just like, you know what, maybe this is not my thing, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's fine. Like I'm, I'm perfectly like content with being the audience and like witnessing other people just like do it them themselves. Yeah, you know? no, <laughs> I, agree. I agree. No, because sometimes it's just really nice to support. Sometimes it's really just nice to collaborate. Sometimes it's really just yeah. nice to be like, I'll hold the leg up like but it's not like I have to be at the top of the head or whatever yeah. you know like yeah. and you're right it is nice to like have someone help you realize idea an idea using their technique and talent or you help mm-hmm. someone else realize their idea using your technique and talent and then yeah I also agree with you in terms of that like I want to talk about books real quick because this is pretty mad book fair but okay uh, yeah um, <laughs> I think okay books actually great question um so Texas Isaiah have you thought about publishing a book have you thought about you know someone that you might know collaborating on a work um and yeah what have your thoughts have this has it been something you ever imagined or um I did imagine it once um Mm -hmm. it was like 2016 so like I had just um sort of like moved it wasn't a conscious move but like I had moved from New York to Oakland and then in March 2017 landed here in LA and I was working with my friend Rob Lewis who's an amazing graphic designer based in Portland Mm -hmm. and we were sort of thinking about we were actually in the process of making a thing Mm -hmm. and then um you know it's just kind of it's kind of like one of those, that process where it's like, you've created it. And then also like, what does it look like to like financially support this thing? And Mm -hmm. I think it fell through the cracks because of that. But as time went on and I looked back on the work, it just didn't resonate with me anymore, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I had to make peace with that and I didn't want to like force it or, you know, I just wasn't, you know, in love with it anymore. It just didn't feel like very, like very relevant to where I was. Mm -hmm. Um, And so like, it has been something that I've thought about, but I don't think that it's anything that's going to happen maybe in the next couple of years, because Mm -hmm. I'm more like interested in sort of like crafting like a large experience. Mm -hmm. So like a monograph, you know, that will later go into an exhibition. That's kind of like how I think like, (laughs) Mm-hmm. very worldly, very like, you know, how can this also be accessible to like the public? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how can it be um, financially viable to people who may not be able to like afford like, you know, even a $70 book, you know? Um, right. And also mm-hmm. like, what does it look like to add work in when I'm just like, you know, every five days, I just feel like 
you know, 200 years goes by, <laughs> you know? So um, I think that I've just been like, like just, you know, thinking about it, but like also like learning along the way about like what it would really mean for me, you know, to like make a book. Mm -hmm. But I love, uh, I love buying them. <laughs> Um, I love, I love buying them. Like, and I've, you know, I think in the last year, I've just been in a better place to actually like, you know, be able to collect books. And so it's really nice just sitting with them again, just being an audience, right. And just mm -hmm. witnessing how people are crafting their books, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, so maybe someday. I think that it's there it's just not the most pressing thing for you at the moment you're like mm -hmm. letting it build itself in a way which is really nice I think as opposed to kind of being like I need to make a book I need to make a book and rushing a thing like kind of what happens when you're like past experience rushing a thing that might not just be there I think yeah. when it's there for you it will be there for you yeah definitely yeah, yeah. so Zora you have an upcoming is it what is it a monograph what do we call the thing that's coming yeah out I think picture? it's a monograph Okay, so can you can you talk it. about um so you've published several books before mm -hmm. in the past and, and usually they're just for singular bodies of work and I know that like you had a a book that was made for corrections and then you've had I think one more book after that for at no point in between or I might be wrong no. just um, Omaha but, yeah yeah the lost yeah, Omaha yeah, book yeah, with Chris the Rose. lost Omaha book yeah. thank you which is like so, which is like at no point in between junior I mean it, it's like um like it was it was work from at no point in between before it was at no point in between that's yeah. like that yeah but a part of his so last series yeah I just want you to talk about your relationships to books because I think that you have more of a book making and what for you what's your relationship to the book to the photo book yeah um so I um you know I started uh, collecting photo books like as soon as I started studying photography mm -hmm. uh, it was just something I was interested in doing just to be able to like you know sit with work and and really reflect upon it and um, but I think even I've just been interested in books like you know ever since I was a kid I was always I always had my nose in a book um, mm -hmm. and so yeah, and like I took, you know, some bookmaking classes, um, you know, when I was an undergraduate student. And uh, so having the opportunity like in that class to like hand construct books and then be able to insert, you know, my own photography into them. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I feel like books are important to me, um, not only because it, it can like, you know, be spread pretty widely if you have, you know, course like a larger distribution network mm -hmm. um but uh it's also a way like I, I loved um like with that no point in between what I really loved about that process and making that book was I could I could really hone in on like what is the context because I'm given a very clear boundary of the structure but mm -hmm. then we can take that structure and manipulate its material um you know manipulate the sequencing um, you know, really think about like how it, not only how it looks visually, but how it feels and like, what is the experience of holding this book and interacting with it? Um, I think that to me is, is really, um, I think it's beneficial to like who I am as an artist and how I work. Um, mm -hmm. but it, I think it, it gives, um, maybe it's an opportunity to give, uh, you know, a reader like a fuller experience of what it is that you're saying, uh, with your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so how do you see the upcoming aperture, like the upcoming aperture book in terms of giving people a fuller experience of a certain body of work, but also as like a movement? Because it, mm. it feels, I've seen it. It feels different. Yeah, it's it the feels revolution, really different. man. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's the revolution. goddamn revolution, Sasha. <laughs> uh, you've seen it. Um, but no, I think to me, it's- But it's in a like good media. way, like- Right, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Um, but I, I think to me, it's the, like, you know, we were just talk, you were just talking about like, you know, not, <laughs> not rushing into a project just because, mm -hmm. but like, you know, winning the Next Step Award, it, it just came at an awkward time for me, right? Mm -hmm. Where I had just published at No Point In Between. I was sort of working on this work about, you know, um, 
sort of me and my relationship to patriotism, but like, mm-hmm. you know, sort of exploring, um, exploring that like through my family's existence in different landscapes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it was just like a, an odd time to, to be positioned to have the opportunity to publish a book. But um, so, I, you know, in conversations with people, you know, like, you know, friends and, and colleagues, you know, I was just kind of explaining, you know, like, you know, like sort of grappling with like, how do I do this, right? Or like, what what should I do? You know, should I try to advocate for like a reprinting of At No Point In Between? Mm-hmm. You know, do I focus on this solely photographic work or like, do I do something different? Um, and I just decided like, you know, if this is a moment for me to present myself widely, you know, to an audience, um, what should I do with that opportunity? And I was like, well, I should just do me, right? Like I yeah. should just present who I am as an artist, who I am as an individual for better or worse. Um, and that's what it, that's what it is. And so I, I went back through like the entire 10 years of, of work. Um, and then, you know, I've been just like consuming a lot of different visual things that, you know, sort of like get incorporated within that um, to, to really address like, I guess, sort of my, I don't know, like almost, yeah, like I, I guess I'm, I'm branding it as like, you know, it's a, it's a survival manual. It's a chronicle of my survival of a lot of different mm-hmm. things. Um, but within that, I'm just trying to like state it directly and, you know, be exactly who I am you know, as mm-hmm. an individual. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But thank, thank you for your words, much. man. Yeah. 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 So I I don't know. I just wanted to open it up to you for us for more questions. Like I don't, ha- I, I mean, I have other questions, but I don't know if through the course of the conversation you all wanted to ask more or whatever. I just thought free talk time. I don't know if we're supposed to do a Q and A. I don't know. But yes, I have a lot of questions. Oh, okay. So... <laughs> Well, just a, just a couple. So um, mm-hmm. I, like I told you before, um, I think that this is um, one of my favorite like book purchases this year. Actually, we'll count that for 2020 as well. Oh, cool. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think I really, you know, love, love these images, um, especially these images of nightlife. Mm -hmm. Um, which, you know, I think for me as a a witness and as a curator um, of that space and also as somebody who documented that space, I feel like, um, so I guess my my first question, I have a couple, Mm -hmm. so I'm gonna ask you. So I'm Mm -hmm. I'm curious about when those images were taken and Mm -hmm. the reason why I'm I'm curious about that timeline is because I think that when, you know, maybe the NYC um, sort of emergence of nightlife photography happened. Mm -hmm. A lot of people had felt like it wasn't an important space to document. At least that's something that I had felt that Mm -hmm. was um, implied by a lot of photographers who were older, maybe like maybe in fashion or editorial worlds, but like nightlife was something that like you know, why would you want to photograph a party, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Knowing that it was something that unfortunately would be deemed as very important later on, right? Because that's Mm -hmm. just like Mm -hmm. how we've looked at nightlife in the 80s and the 90s, like, you know, even now, right? Well, not now, but you know what Mm -hmm. I mean. But I'm curious about like when this work was made um, and then I'll continue on with my other questions. (laughs) Okay, so the work was made between 2015 and 2017. Mm -hmm. So it was made on Cornell's campus because I was Mm -hmm. in an MFA program at the time. And so Mm -hmm. I was, I was looking for black people. And and then it also (laughs) was. Where they at? So let me turn on the light actually. Let me turn on the light in this room. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, I was like, look, I was doing that. And then um, New York City, Chris 
Udemizue runs a uh, does a party called Raga. It's like a whole it's a whole situation. It's a publishing company. It's all the whole situation. But Chris always threw these parties, and I just would go. I went. I remember I asked Chris if I could photograph at one of the parties, and Chris said I could. So I went to one of the parties, and then I was in Philadelphia at a time at, at, for a period of time, and I um, was also I was just going to places I was interested in. So I photographed at a um, a ball in Philly, and so. Um, I think it's a very important space. I don't know why people would say that, but um, every interesting thing, like if you want to see, if you want a slice of socio, racial, economic life, go to a ball. Like if you want to know about America, go to a ball. (laughs) Yeah. And you can only imagine why people wouldn't deem those spaces as important. I feel like even now, Mm -hmm. um, you know, those spaces are still fighting to... (laughs) Yeah, you're right. You know, you're right. To, to be held in that way. Um, my, I have a second question. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna do a two in one. Okay. I'm very curious about the color of your cover. Uh-huh. Why you chose red specifically? Um, and also, I would love to hear you talk about that beautiful conversation between you, Juliana, Juliana, and uh, Carolyn. Mm-hmm. Um, I chose red because I'm a Trinidadian and we're a proud people about okay, the flag so. <laughs> but also I think um, okay. further more than that I, I don't know just that red is really just like it's bloody in more than one ways and so I think I'm interested in that color red um, and then the conversation so Juliana Carolyn and I went to we went to undergrad together and we had a time it was intense But Mm. for me, that moment in my life is very important because I met people who have been so influential on me and and who opened up my world, period. Like, they just opened up my world. And um, I'm, like, very thankful for them. And I think that that dance work specifically includes them because it, it was about... I knew to make that work when I got to Cornell because I remembered when I was an undergrad that on the weekends me and all my friends, people of color would like find the place where there was music playing and like take over the music and start dancing. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I know that there's a group of black people on this campus dancing somewhere because we need it. Like, not just because like, of course it's a fun thing to do, but it's like, (sighs) when you are in those spaces, I believe Mm -hmm. it's like, you feel the fullness of your body without being mm-hmm. misconstrued by anyone. So it's like when you're with, and which is not to say that violence doesn't happen in those spaces and that fucked up shit doesn't happen and that people don't need to be policed and checked and shit like that. Mm-hmm. But like, it's more to say what, uh, like what you can bring to the space, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, I know that they're, I know they're somewhere. And so I just went and looked for them because I remembered that we needed that space so desperately. And then there was that mm-hmm. Fanon quote that um, that I remember, um, like I learned it in a class, but specifically I remember Juliana picking out and reading it. And I remember being like, this is the thing that I'm talking about with this. And so that's kind of why, that's the whole genesis around that. Mm-hmm. A question I had about the book was, um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, like, just the design and like structure of it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It just that it feels like um, it's just like so exposed. Mm-hmm. Yet I like I don't find myself trying to be like hyper delicate with it because it feels so like sturdy and like weighty. Mm-hmm. Um, Can you just like, yeah, can you talk a little bit about your, like the choice in the design and and how you navigated that? Mm -hmm. So I really have to, it's really important um, as we talk about collaboration that I really need to talk about Annika Sabine, Sophie Mourner, Alex Lynn at Studio Lynn, Jenna also at, sorry, I hope I got got, uh, their name right, Jenna also at Studio Lynn, because I feel like what really happened here is like, some people were like, you want to make a book? 
what do you want it to look like? And they just listened to me. And I, and I bought things, brought things into them and they made suggestions and I liked all the things that they had made so far. So I was like, I'll trust them. <laughs> and so I just knew, I just knew that they wouldn't like, they wanted to make something good. I wanted to make something good. And they're the experts. Like, I don't know anything about books. You know what I'm saying? Annika looks at books all day. That's Annika's job. That's their job. You know what I mean? And so I trusted I trusted some of the, their their thoughts on it because it was never that far from what I was saying in the first place. So it was like this kind of book, Alex would this type of type of paper, Alex would be like, here, there's this paper, there's this paper. What do you think? He would be like, I kind of want to do a weird thing. I'm like, yeah, just show me what that looks like. Why not? You know, Annika would be like, we could do this different kind of paper in the center. Or what do you think about this writing versus this writing, these colors versus these colors. And they never brought anything to me that I was like, ooh. It was always like through and through. And they were very patient with me. And they were very like open about the process. And I sat in on calls. It was just... Um, it felt to me very, like, it was very clear. It was very obvious. They just let me see what, so I guess that's some of it. Like, even with the, it is a very exposed book, but some of the things I had been looking at, you know, I was like, I really like these kind of bindings. I wanted it to feel, you know, they were, they were like, what about this size? What will it feel like? And I think it just feels good. Like, it's a, mm -hmm thing you open it up it's not fussy you like go through the papers like yeah. mm -hmm. like if you want to rip a photo out rip a photo out like do what <laughs> you want with it honestly like it just felt like it felt like a, it felt real but mm -hmm. you know I don't know mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 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 I mean those collaborations are really important and I, I think that you know like in my experience with publishing like being able to work with someone who um yeah like where they like how you're talking about right where you just like you just have ideas right mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. because you're yeah you're not like you're not out here looking at books every day or designing books on the regular and so mm -hmm. how could you be expected to, <laughs> to know yeah. what you want but you you have a sense of it right and then that's yeah like the and you know you know you alluded to this earlier Texas Isaiah um, like mm -hmm. this idea of, of collaborating with people and, and maybe sometimes you're like you're you're just the audience or a spectator um, you're just mm -hmm. there to appreciate or I guess knowing your your own boundaries within your mm -hmm. practice that like you know even though people very much like to believe that like we're all just, just these independent geniuses but that mm -hmm. within what we do there's a lot of support right there's a lot of community work mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah yeah it's beautiful Sasha, congratulations. Yeah. You Thank did you that. Much. Put yeah. your foot on it. <laughs> you and your team. <laughs> Put the, all you ankles much. in it. <laughs> all ankles. All ankles. And I, and I think that... from the knee below. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that their... Um, I think that their archive is just so splendid. Just like also the connection, you know, that they, that they uh, you know, produced a... a uh, sorry, uh, books for Juliana, right? And yeah, Tiana, yeah. Tiana Nakia mm -hmm. McLaughlin, shout out to Tiana, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. John, like all of these folks, like, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and all of their books are just like very expansive. It, it just seems like a very like, yeah, a fun playground to be in, you know? Even before I applied, I remember that I looked and I was like, okay, I can get down. Like I looked at all the, like who they were like publishing and I saw they had done Juliana's book and I saw that they had done John's and Barbara Hammer's book and all these other mm -hmm. like, just like all these other books that were like kind of weird. And um, uh, yeah, and so I was like, I like Capricious. They seem like fun and they were fun. <laughs> they were yeah. great. If any, they were, I had an amazing time making this book. And That's it beautiful. Because of Capricious, printed matter. Buy some books from Capricious. But for real, like if you know Annika Sabine and if you know Sophie Mourner as people, if you know these people, then y'all know what's really happening. So yeah, it was a great experience. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So there's 15 minutes left in the event. I don't know, are we supposed to take questions? 
What a question, Zay. I don't know. I, I put it in the audience chat um, asking for questions, but no one sent anything in at the moment. Okay. Oh. I'm not mad at that, <laughs> actually. Okay. I mean, can we clock out early? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I did my 90 minutes about. Is it time to go? <laughs> Yeah. Um, this has been uh, a very joyous conversation. I really appreciate it. Because um, honestly, I don't really like panels that much. Because <laughs> I just, I just feel so like, I'm not great at public speaking. It gives me a lot of anxiety. And also, mm -hmm. like, it's always like fixated on like work in a way that doesn't feel like fun. And this felt mm -hmm. like a lot of fun. And so I'm very grateful to share space with you both. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank absolutely. you so much for, yeah, okay. thank okay. you for, no, I just, um, I just was like, I just wanted, I just wanted to have a good time and I just wanted to ask <laughs> you all questions and I just wanted to like learn about the work and yeah, thank you for participating. Thank you for sharing, you know, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, of course. Y'all go buy it. Go get it before it's gone. For real. Yes. You need it's to gonna, own this. It's going to sell sure. out. Wait, let me take it out. Let me take it out. Yeah, people are going to be salty. Like, yeah. It's yes. so sad because today yeah. I was like getting ready for this and I was like, Sasha, do you have a copy of the book? I don't even have a copy of the book in my own house. <laughs> no, I feel that I have a cop. I have a copy of at no point in between in my studio it's not mine it's <laughs> it's Aaron Turner's copy yeah. I don't even got a copy of this book but thanks for y'all yeah. I'm glad that y'all had it because you could show oh, me yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah I know people are going to be salty they're going to start hitting you up oh my god I'm sorry Sasha I didn't get a copy the first time around <laughs> you're like that's on you man that's on you everybody would be fine <laughs> Yeah. Okay. If there's no questions, is there any questions printed matter? No? No, not yet. So yeah, if you guys wanted to finish up early, you're more than welcome to. Yeah, we're gonna okay. go. You know, yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> we're gonna go. Sorry. Thank you all. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, thanks all right. for having Thank us, yes. Printed Matter. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much, y'all. Peace.
Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, just to let you know, we are live. Uh, so the, anything that you say is, is a part of the live stream at the moment. Um, does anyone, will anyone be screen sharing? I can make you co-host. Um, I will be screen sharing. Okay. okay. I'm having a terrible time with the lighting, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> I think it I, looks great. We can see well. It does. Right. Well, fine. But do you see that hot spot on the Steve De Benedetto behind me? Um. Yes. Hi, Monica. Hi, Ted. Hey. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for doing this, Monica. Guess what today is? What? Caleb is nineteen today no. at six thirty p.m. Unreal. He's a super that, cat. Super cat. Unicorn. I'm going to go get him so you can see how cute he is. At Hold on. Hey, this sweetheart, where are you? Here's your favorite kitty. Oh, Caleb. Hello, Caleb. Awesome. Oh my God, he's just so cute. And at nice. That. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. Does he like yes. Zoom? Does he like cameras? Uh, no, he doesn't. Oh. He doesn't like cameras. He doesn't like people. <laughs> he doesn't like being brushed. <laughs> he looks he really likes food, and naps, and he likes getting his chin rubbed. He looks great. He looks good, huh? Okay, baby. Bye. Chicken. Um, all right, everybody. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn off my video until we're ready to start. Um, and but yeah, I think everything seems like it's on on rails. So. Um, I'll see you all in just a little while, okay? Okay, bye. Should we turn off our, our, our cameras while everything happens? I will take you up right now. Great, thank you. Okay, thanks.
Hi, Ted. Um, uh, if we'd like to start the event, we can we can go ahead and do so. If everyone is still here, let's go for it. Cool. All right. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to Four Decades with Bomb Magazine. Uh, my name is Ted Dodson. I'm Bomb's Director of Circulation and one of our many <laughs> contributing editors, and I'll be your host tonight. As you all know, Bomb is participating in the Printed Matter Virtual Art Book Fair. Please go check out our virtual table. We have an exclusive subscription offer just for the Art Book Fair, a uh, one-year print and digital subscription to our quarterly magazine, plus Bomb news, Bomb's new dad hat, which we have right here. It's very fetching, I think. Um, also, as always, check out our socials for more updates on upcoming events. Uh, we are at Bomb Magazine on Twitter and Facebook, at Bomb Mag on Instagram. Um, and, you know, tonight is a very special night because uh, it is the kickoff for our uh, 40th anniversary celebration. Uh, BOMB has since 1981 been the gold standard for artist interviews. Uh, we started at the literal and figurative kitchen table of the downtown uh, art scene in New York City and were instrumental in amplifying the work of a whole generation of artists and writers. Now, 40 years later, BOMB has expanded out of downtown um, our offices <laughs> are in Brooklyn, and we work with artists and writers from around the world now. I, I think we still keep that ethos, though, that uh, downtownness, where everyone is almost famous, everyone is working at the edge of what's possible, it's all new, and we love to talk about it. So tonight, we'll be hearing from some of BOM's most cherished contributors talking about the magazine and their work in it. We'll be, set, we'll be ending with a conversation between uh, BOMB's intrepid founder and editor-in-chief, Betsy Sussler, and former BOMB senior editor, Monica Dillatory. Betsy will also be taking questions after the conversation, so please go ahead and start entering those into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and I'll be back in a little while to introduce Betsy and Monica, but until then, please enjoy four decades with BOMB Magazine. Twisted Intentions is a chapter from my first novel, Haunted Houses. London, I stare at the wallpaper in my hotel room. This wallpaper word in my apartment at home would drive me crazy. But here it doesn't matter, like not being bothered by a city council election you couldn't vote in anyway. It passes right by and I'm unencumbered, clipping my toenails and placing the small hard pieces in the ashtray that reads Inverness Terrace. Small hard pieces of American toenails. Americana of a sort. Some people might burn them. Jessica's found a place to live in Ladbrook Grove and will leave the hotel, our home away from home, and her safe place from Charles. She once described their previous flat as having too many ghosts. A not unusual thing to say, except that she believes in ghosts the way she believes in angels. In fact, a ghost to her is an angel without a resting place. Today's guardian has a paragraph on angels. The Vatican says they exist. Jessica isn't amused or surprised. Her small, sharp eyes, the eyes of a knitter, my mother would say, find their way into some secret part of me. She thinks that, and I'm beginning to believe her. 
Jessica also believes that no one should have any secrets and that everyone knows all secrets already. To her, nothing is secret. Everything is sacred. Even in the midst of packing, readying herself for the move to her new home, Jessica is composed and remarkably calm. She thinks I'm always either worried or excited. When I worry, I know she's right about me, and now my excitement diminishes knowing that she can so easily see into my dialectical personality. I'm also lazy and paranoid, but she hasn't commented on this. So I wonder why not. She's wrapping newspaper around her Buddhist altar and filling two large beaten-up suitcases with clothes. When she looks up at me, she says gossip is human, but unnecessary. From Jessica's point of view, if I can imagine it, and were she to draw her version of reality, all people would be connected not only spiritually, but materially and even physically. I concur that gossip is human simply because I do it, as do other people I know. But there must be other societies where gossip as such doesn't exist. Jessica says that while it makes sense to believe that, and that she believes differences exist among peoples, she would bet that everywhere, in even the tiniest bit of society in the farthest reaches of the world from here, one would find gossip. something that I appreciate about Baum is the fact that like you could sort of be a portal where you kind of like um, have access to all these different cultural figures and you know art, music, uh, literature, poetry, you know and then you, you could sort of like um, bring bring all these conversations together. I always believe in um, interdisciplinary approach to art and arts so it's it also it always gives me sort of a comfort i guess to know that um the reader who's reading this will read um something about poetry or literature or music uh, or film after mine or has just read something about that no we always, always find that interesting when there's that sort of cross, you know, like, like a like a novelist and an artist could like speak like speak about many things, you know, like yeah. especially if they're interested in each other's genre or whatever, or like say like a filmmaker and an artist, or or like you know, like I always I always enjoy that, and I always feel like um, <laughs> I mean, two painters talking might be pretty boring. Because <laughs> you might just end up talking about materials and, you Technique. know, yeah, 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 like just, uh, you know, that kind of a thing. I remember one time I was at a gala with Alex Katz, like it was honoring Alex Katz and I was sitting next to him at the gala. And me and him just were talking about like turpentine and, you know, all these people were like coming up to him to talk to him. And he just didn't want to, he just wanted to talk about you know, studio stuff. <laughs> yeah. Being a curator also means uh, you interview artists, but you just don't have a recorder. Or um, sometimes artists, I guess, don't know they're being interviewed. But when I do a studio visit, it's, it's a kind of conversation that could have easily been an interview. So I, I guess I always go to an artist studio or or in, in our reality, I would Zoom with artists in sort of in that manner. And, and when you interview um, one of those artists, it's, it's quite different as, as we just talked about, that it's sort of a more of a conversation um, that just happens to be recorded or in the end uh, turn into a text. And I think one element of and I've been doing interviews for Bomb for for a few years, and I think 
that's the one element of a bomb interview that in my experience that I, when I do one, it's always, or maybe I, I always associate bomb with, with poems and poetry. And, and I always try to find that element in the work. There are two different types of art communities. I think there's your own like close artist community of like actual artists that you engage with all the time, you know, like studio visits and, and you're sort of like aware of what each other is doing. And then there's now, you know, there's like a broader artist community where you might not like physically have studio visits or, or even know the person, but you're kind of like aware of each other somehow. And you're like in dialogue with each other's work or it's even more interesting is when, you know, uh, something is just in the air and, you know, my antenna could catch it and some artists like, you know, in Germany or wherever their antenna could catch it. And we could be kind of like um, tapping into the same sort of collective uh, consciousness. I remember in 81 that I saw the first issue of Bomb and it really, it left a huge impression on me because the cover was so fantastic and it seemed to capture the simultaneous sort of dangerous element and the sort of thrill and fun of living downtown in New York at that point in time. And I just, that cover just captured my imagination. And I thought the title was really great too, Bomb, because it sort of felt like a bomb in my like, you know, little life at the age of 19. I moved to LA in 1988 to go to graduate school at Art Center. And one of my professors was Mike Kelly. And Mike, uh, my very first term in school, had a little interview in Baum that I remember reading. And it wasn't really uh, a sort of penetrating interview or anything, but it was about being in LA and being an LA artist and what that might be like and how it compared to New York. And I was from New York and I had just moved. So I was just getting used to LA. And this article had a big impression on me, even though it wasn't long or uh, a very deep, it was really about what it means to be an LA artist and what the scene in LA was like at that time. And then there was another one, um, another article that I thought was actually really fantastic. And that was Mike's article, uh, Mike's interview, I'm sorry, with John Miller, another really good artist. Um, and that was sort of eye opening because Mike was talking about the pieces that were in his retrospective. So I think that was really uh, insightful and it caught that kind of special thing about Baum, which is the artist's voice. And Mike's voice was so strong and it was so important to me at that point in my life. It still is, I still hear it in my head. Um, but to hear his voice, which was very special, come through the magazine was, was what I loved. I have, uh, uh, I don't know, a kind of personal relationship with Baum because it was, you know, the periodical magazine that gave space for artists' voices, poets, fiction. I remember reading something uh, fantastic by Lynn Tillman, for example, in Baum, uh, Kathy Acker, you know, so there's writers, there's musicians, there's poets, and there's artists, and everyone's getting to speak in their own voice. And you know, the arts, a deep understanding of one art form can help you develop a deep understanding of another. Mm -hmm. So having poetry and fiction and music and art all together in, in, in one magazine is, it's a great thing because I think that when 
you become an artist, you enter into culture in a very particular way. And that culture includes all of the arts. And I expect or I want artists to be conversant in all of the arts. And I think, you know, Baum really makes that happen. You know, it, none of us had any any uh, visibility about 14th Street or even above Canal Street. You know, so it was, it, and this was way before social media was even thought of. And you know, I wish it hadn't been thought of. But anyway, um, you know, it was it was some, a way to be, to be out in public uh, with our work and. It, it was, a, it was a great opportunity because there was nothing else around for people like you or me or Kathy Acker or Ian Tillman. I mean, there, was paper, there weren't people publishing our work or even looking at it. I don't know. It was thrilling when it came. It was thrilling to see, you know. I mean, I, I got a lot of thrills from Bomb Magazine over the years because I published almost all my first book in Bomb Magazine and all my first novel, I believe. Very sick. At that time, he was living on 23rd Street um, near Fifth Avenue. And I mean, I had known him when he was living over in Great Jones Street, but, um, you know, he'd moved into that loft there and he was in terrible shape. But he liked to walk to um, from where he was to the bar that was just before the Chelsea Hotel. He would never go into the Chelsea Hotel, and he said he never wanted to go in there again in his life. But he liked this place, which is called Ziggy Bad. And so um, he, he did part of the interview in this loft, and then he walked down to this bar and, you know, sat in the bar. I don't, I don't remember him having a drink, but I'm sure I did. And um, he had his drink in the other day. But um, yeah, it was kind of weird in a way. I mean, I didn't feel weird about the fact that he was sick. What I felt weird about was that I didn't know whether he wanted to, you know, to reveal that in an interview. You know, even though, okay, it's public knowledge among people like that. But, you know, he hadn't made any sort of declaration of this situation. So I decided I would avoid that. You know, and just talk about his work because I had learned a lot from Robert. Robert taught me how to take a photograph. Well, he didn't teach me how to take a photograph. He, he taught me how to light a photograph. And this was years before. I had gone to see him at, uh, at, his, at his place on um, Joe Jones in the. Uh, he was Joe Jones. He was over there somewhere. And he showed me how to, um, how to use gel so that it doesn't bathe the subject. This color, but just the outline. And he showed me all these tricks on how to take photos. Um, so we talked about his work mostly. I mean, almost entirely about his work. Um, because, you know, I, I never know how much of somebody's personal life they want to have in an interview. And I think, uh, you know, what difference does it make that he's gone? You know? I mean, he doesn't want to talk about it, and he didn't indicate that he didn't, but I had, a, I, you know, I, I'm not into that kind of, I mean, I don't do interviews anymore anyway, but I, I, I don't like that thing of, you know, revealing some secret. Um, I think that actually Bond, which we didn't think was going to last that long, really, I mean, but, um, you know, you made it into something of lasting value. And I think it's because there wasn't anything like something. And there still isn't, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, there, the, 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 um, the thing that I so valued about it was that I could interview somebody like Hugo at length about things that, you know, conventional American publications would consider too arcane or too specialized or too intellectual 
right? I mean, it's, it's just staying the sense of community with people that are pretty scattered, you know. I mean, I feel like I'm in touch with people that, in, on some level, in touch with people's process. You know, what people are thinking about, how they're thinking about it, and how they're doing it. Unfortunately, it applies today more than ever. But, you know, um, you can't ever take for granted that all these, you know, victories have been won. You know, that we try and show the fascists, and you can never take that for granted. It just doesn't work that way. I've always really been into herbs as like a just sort of hobby, I guess, honestly. Um, but I'm always researching like different herbs. I take a ton of herbs and that kind of like those weird areas of studies, study that artists have that we don't talk about publicly in connection with our work. That was sort of the inspiration to try to find a place to do that with my own work. Cloves with their intoxicating, almost stinging aroma, some idyllic hybrid of cinnamon's thin catalyst and nutmeg's rich hallucinatory nodding. Cloves like the needle between two kinds of bittersweet, like an indulgent spike in the libido through the act of smelling, arousing the desire for desire itself, the hope for the will to crave. Maybe so alluring because part of our physiology is trapped in the subconscious, requires our antiseptic ability for healing. I am hung up on kelp as untapped redemption, entrance by the way it hangs and welcomes an ecosystem into its shabby embrace. I'm wondering if this marine weed can teach us something we need to know about exile and return from exile. My favorite piece so far was a piece on microdosing and magic mushrooms and the new practice that's becoming popular of uh, microdosing them. I think because it's the most stretched out and surprising direction it's taken so far. Um, herbs are something I knew it was grounded in, but mushrooms and getting to this um, topic wasn't expected. So it was like a discovery within research. As is true in most in instances of potential collective healing through ritual, members of the African diaspora are the born ready masters of ceremony and the resurgent ritual of the microdose. We possess an entire aesthetic tradition based on insinuating ourselves and our origins while also implicating and mastering the vampiric culture that tries to deny our connection with ourselves. And we accomplish this using microdoses of sound and shape through movement, speech, and music. Yes, like I wanna, it's something I feel like I can like give back that feels really tangible, even though that's kind of a corny way of putting it. I never wanted it to like move toward the didactic. So it was more like- Well, because I had learned a lot from that. A lot of uh, microdosing them. I think because it's the most stretched out and surprising direction it's taken so far. Um, herbs are something I knew it was grounded in, but mushrooms and getting to this, um, topic wasn't expected. So it was like a discovery within research. As is true in most in instances of potential collective healing through ritual, members of the African diaspora are the born ready masters of ceremony and the resurgent ritual of the microdose. We possess an entire aesthetic tradition based on insinuating ourselves and our origins while also implicating and mastering the vampiric culture that tries to deny our connection with ourselves. And we accomplish this using microdoses of sound and shape through movement, speech, and music. Yes, like I wanna, it's something I feel like I can like give back that feels really tangible, even though that's kind of a corny way of putting it. I never wanted it to like move toward the didactic. So it was more like how I feel like the art world kind of um, the body is sort of exiled, especially at this stage where so much is happening in these boxes. 
And so, um, yeah, it was just a way to maybe not be didactic, but to remind myself and readers like not to eliminate the body from our art practice, um, our creative practice or whatever we're doing, you know? I guess just by trying to be as real as possible with um, how I engage with the plants and also always in this series, like kind of intentionally mining that idea of who's entitled to talk about things that are good for us, because I think that comes up like racially and with gender and class um, where specifically like a working class background means that you talk about functionality and utilitarian things and you're not supposed mm -hmm. to have the luxury of thinking about the garden and the plants and just also you know what um remembering early on when i was like radicalized reading and just kind of scorning um not nature poems but the very, very like pretty bourgeois like micro attention to like what kind of butter you use and things like that that ended up showing up in a lot of lyric poetry and then this period I guess I'm sort of like circling back and reclaiming like the problem is not you know nature showing up in poetry and literature the problem is who feels like that I was feeling like I wasn't allowed to like as a black woman writer who's you know has a certain like idea about what her political viewpoints are like you're not allowed to like show that you give a shit about plants <laughs> so like trying to I guess seeing MF Doom do that um as a rapper which is no one else has ever you know that's just not what's happening in rap um yeah so just it's been nice to like try to reclaim like the ability to you know openly care about nature as a black writer basically I think we're um, anyone who's like body is politicized starts to feel like you constantly have to be reactionary to something that isn't the natural world. The first piece where I think my name was included anything in Balm was the interview I did with Fareed Matouk on my book Hollywood Forever, which I think did shape a lot of um, it was like the only in-depth interview I did about that book. And since that book was kind of rooted in intentional illegibility, I feel like Bomb helped make that more legible by having me um, discuss it there. So that was really great. And then just the experience um, like Bomb does with a lot of writers, I think like giving permission to like write about herbs as a poet slash essays slash other things. Like people don't really think that you can like bring all these things together. So it was like, um, just having that hybrid voice at Find a Home was really nice. All right, uh, many thanks to Lynn Tillman, Ali Banasada, Osman Khan Yadabakan, Diana that Theater, Gary Indiana, and Harmony Holiday. That was really amazing. Thank you all so much. Um, up next, we have a conversation between BOM's founder and editor-in-chief, Betsy Sussler, and Monica De La Torre. Uh, Monica De La Torre is the author of six books of poems, of which the most recent is Repetition 19, from Nightboat Books. Uh, with Alex Balgu, she co-edited the anthology Women in Concrete Poetry, 1959 to 1979, just out from Primary Information, and teaches at Brooklyn College. She served as Baum's senior editor from 2007 to, the, to 2016. Betsy Sussler co-founded Baum 40 years ago and has been, the editor, been its editor-in-chief and publisher ever since. She has edited five compilations of BOM interviews. Most recently, BOM, the author interviews published by Soho Press. Please, everyone, give a warm, warm welcome to Betsy and Monica.
Hello. Hi, Monica. Hi, Betsy. I can't see you. I can't see me either. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank everyone, though. You all were so moving. Harmony, Diana, Osman, Ali, Lynn, Gary, thank you. So am I supposed to do this? Maybe I'm supposed to do it. Here I am. Hi. Hi. Okay. What it's a, good well, to see you. Monica and I worked side by side for eight or nine years. And I missed her so much when she was gone. It was great working with a poet, I have to say. So, hi. Hi. It was so great working with you. I can't believe it. First, I, I have to just congratulate you. 40 years. I know. It's pretty unbelievable. But you know, when we started Bomb, we didn't think it was going to last. We thought four or five issues, this magical, you know, creature would emerge and then it would go away and everyone would be fine with that. And look at it <laughs> 40 years later. It's kind of shocking. <laughs> yes. Um, I think a lot of people might not know why you named the magazine Bomb. So I think. Um, all right. Let me tell that. all the stories. Yes. <laughs> well, first of all, before I started Bomb, or before we started Bomb, I should say, because the community really started Bomb. It's always been a community magazine, and it always will be. And the community just keeps getting larger and larger, which is really exciting. But before Bomb was started, I was acting in uh, my then husband, Lindsay Smith's plays. He was a theater director. And I was acting in them because we needed two paychecks. So he would always cast me, not because I was an actress. But I thought it would be a good way to understand dialogue. So I went along with it. Plus, we needed the paychecks. So my favorite part of this wasn't acting on stage. It was in rehearsal, where we would be, Lindsay would start every rehearsal period with a reading of the play that we were doing. And we were not supposed to use any intonation. We were simply supposed to read the play out loud her character according to the punctuation. And we would do this over and over and over again. But in this process, we were absorbing the language. We were becoming the characters. We were listening to who and what and where we were in, in, in the playwright's world. And this had a huge effect on me and it's influenced me my entire life. So when we started talking about this magazine that we wanted to start, and yes, it was me who said around a kitchen table for dinner, for breakfast, I don't know where, um, wouldn't it be great if we started a magazine where we talked about the work, where we, the way we talk about it among ourselves. Um, and I was really thinking of the rehearsal process because after we would read these this play, we would discuss it, what we felt about it, where we wanted to take it, what we wanted to do. And these conversations were happening all over, Soho, Tribeca, Lower East Side, whatever, among musicians and visual artists and writers. Um, and they were very, very different from what you would see in magazines, which were written by critics or art historians. They were very much about the process. And everyone thought this was a wonderful idea. And when I say everyone, I said, I think everyone in Lower Manhattan. And Gary Indiana is right. Everyone below 14th Street or maybe 23rd Street. So we talked about this idea, I swear, for like months, maybe a year on street corners, at dinner parties, wherever, over in bars. And no one knew how to make a magazine and no one knew how to what to call it. There were ideas like blah, blah, which was ridiculous. Um, art and culture, which was so boring. It put me to sleep before I even opened the damn thing. So finally I said, okay, we've got to decide on a name. Let's have a meeting. So a lot of the principals, Sarah Charlesworth, the visual artist who had worked on Fox with Joseph Kosuth and many others, um, Glenn O'Brien, who was a managing editor of Interview for many years, myself, Michael McClard, a visual artist, who at the time was dating Liza Bear, who had started Avalanche. So we had some provenance, so to speak. I had started a magazine with Michael McClard and um, Eric Mitchell called X Magazine, which was theory and film, lasted for three issues. But anyway, 
So we all got together in the next room was Jamie Nairs and Lindsay Smith, my then husband, who were talking about a theater project. And we started tossing out ideas. And Glenn, for some reason, started talking about Blast, which was the first artists and writers magazine of the 20th century. And it was started by um, Rebecca West, um, Wyndham Lewis, and Ezra Pound. And Michael, being an artist, was sitting there doodling. And he was making these beautiful little drawings of bombs. And I looked at Glenn and I looked at Michael. We didn't think this magazine was going to last, mind you. So it didn't matter really that I decided we were gonna call it bomb because we wouldn't have to explain this to anyone because it was just a small coterie of people. We'll get to that later. But anyway, I said, oh my God, bomb, that's the name of the magazine. And everyone said, oh my God, that's the worst name. You can't call it bomb. <coughs> but Glenn got it. And Glenn said, you know, I don't think it's a bad idea. That's how we started. And that's how it stuck. I won. I don't know. What, well, I won because I said, I'm going to be editor in chief. No one could argue with me about this. Someone has to be responsible. And everyone said, okay, so I won. Yes. And I mean, you're, you're being incredibly generous by crediting the community, but it really was your idea. And then you planted the seed and everybody got excited. Are you okay? If I could, I would bring you some water. Well, but everybody got excited enough to participate in it and make it happen. Right. I didn't do it by myself. No, of course not. But it, but it was your idea. And I'd never heard this about the doodles. And I mean, I, I've heard so much about why you named a bomb, but I never heard this specific story, which is fascinating. I love it. So then what happens? Then you're like, okay, all right, we're going to start bomb. And then- And then what happens is nobody knows how to design a magazine. Right. And yes, and you, you well, I mean, some, some of you did have experience editing, right? The respective. Well, project. we had experience editing. We had experience writing. So anyway, Sarah and I meet at her studio mm -hmm. to decide what the first cover is going to be. And I said, you know, whether it's going to last or not, I want this to be a classic. So we knew, we all pretty much knew that the image for the cover was going to be Sarah's Charles Orr's, um lightning striking the Empire State Building. Oh, that's a cute poodle I see in the background. What oh, a yes. darling. His name is Shadow. He'll come visit in a moment. Oh, good. Okay, let's call him in. And he, oh, there he is. So anyway, so Sarah and I sit down to discuss in her studio, not what the image is going to be, because we're sure of that, but the proportions of the magazine. And I said, it has to be a classic. We're sitting at her table, and there's nothing on her table. Uh, Sarah was a minimalist at heart. So there were like three number two pencils, sharp, and a bottle of Chanel number five. And I said, I want it to be in the proportion of the golden mean because that's a classic. And the two of us sat there and went, what the hell is a proportion for the golden mean? We couldn't remember. And then I looked at the Chanel bottle and I said, Sarah, Chanel mm -hmm. used it. I know it. We're going to do it in the proportion of the Chanel bottle from the top of the cap to the bottom, including the negative space. And that's going to be the golden mean. And we did. And it was. <laughs> Unbelievable. Of course, I couldn't look it up on the web. <laughs> so that was it. That was our proportion. And then a couple of weeks later, I'm sitting at a dinner party with my friend, Mary Heilman, the painter. And she was dating this wonderful man, an author named Mark McGill, who at the time was a filmmaker. And I said, we we're starting this incredible magazine. The only problem is we don't have a designer. And he said, you know, I make a living as a graphic designer. I'll design it for you. So Mark McGill became our first designer for 10 issues. Those are wonderful issues, by the way. Yes, they I mean, are. all of them. All of them. Worked on them. Yeah. So we have to compress forty years in sixteen in sixteen more minutes, more or less. Okay. What do you want to talk about? So, well, I'm curious about like how each. It, could you say? I mean, well, yeah. I have another question, but let's start with this because we're talking about design. Is there a thing for each of the decades that, like, what would be the words that you associate with every decade? So we get the '80s downtown interdisciplinary scene a lot of organizations are there that were that, that are still around artist space the kitchen right and these are really hubs for that community um avalanche of course art forum is around but that had been founded earlier maybe that's the one it was art forum the magazine that that felt like it was becoming a little more professional 
Um, and I think, but, but it's interesting. And I, I want to do a sidestep here. You know, mm -hmm. the other editors at Bomb, um, Ben Samuels and Sabine Roos and Chantal and, um, and anyway, chose what they thought was the most iconic interview. I should say Chantal's last name, Chantal McStay, chose mm -hmm. what they thought was the 80s most iconic interview. And that was the interview between Barbara Kruger and Richard Prince. And we've reproduced it in, in the next issue. And we'll do that in each issue for each decade. And, but, but we've asked, we asked, and they complied very nicely, and very graciously, Barbara and Richard to annotate in their usual witty, funny selves, to annotate what they said back then. But what I realized about that interview is it is the most iconic interview of the 80s because it's the first one that focused on a dialogue between two artists, which is what I had imagined Bomb could be. And there it was. Mm -hmm. And I went, wow, I didn't even know this was the interview, the iconic interview that sort of opened the way for all the future dialogue. So that was the 80s and the 90s. And when I say it became more professional, what do I mean by that? We, we the community itself, um, had become more known and more recognized. Mm -hmm. So people were, um, the, the interviews were more in depth. They were as ambitious as they could be. And, the, and I mean ambitious in the best possible sense of the, the word. They wanted to be intellectual. They wanted to break norms. They wanted to, what I mean by that is I had learned how to edit, mm -hmm. right? Because I learned as I went. So I understood intuitively how to edit, but as I did it over 10 years, I became better at it. And I could, teach other people how to do it. So it was really about what I called the Hans Hoffman push and pull. Some things were pushed back and some things were pulled forward. Um, and, that, and, and that notion of listening, which I did in rehearsal, also became an innate part of editing. You listened really, really carefully to the audio and the transcript and to what was really being said and what could be developed. And I think all of those things really came to the fore in the 90s so that we did extraordinary interviews in the 80s that were really off the cuff and, and punkish and, and raw and fabulous. But in the 90s, we, we perfected the bomb editorial method. And that to me was pretty important. Oh, here he is. See, there he goes. He's making a bird. Announced that this is my cat's Caleb's 19th birthday today at exactly 6:30 p.m. I don't think we're going to find him to show him, but anyway, it's a very big day in my world. Speaking of days, what was the precise day in which the day in which you, do you remember the day when you met with with Sarah for the cover? And the, no. No, we did come out in May of 1981. And I remember taking it up to Gotham Bookmart, mm -hmm. um, which was a big deal, a big deal, you know, bookstore for us back then. Um, and we brought it up there for them to sell it. And they held it up like this. Like it was a filthy oh, rag and said, do you expect us to sell this? And we went, yes, you don't understand. And, and to their credit, they did. <laughs> I think they were the first bookstore to sell bomb. Was it, in a way, we're also talking a little bit about technology, right? Because it was saddle stitched in oh, the 80s. God. And then in the cut. 90s, it was bound, right? It was cut and paste. Mm -hmm. It was typeset. And then we would cut out the columns. And to, to do, it was loaded with typos, mind you. It was a <laughs> But it was because I would come in and correct, make all the corrections by taping over the correct words or the correct letters and scotch tape them. And then Mark or Michael would come in and go, I don't like that design. And they would rip up the paste <laughs> and things would go flying everywhere and they would redo it. It was part and parcel of, you know, the process of making, which we all understand. And the duration of it must have been really crazy because we can't imagine what that was. Like production, how long did production take? I don't remember. It's kind huh? of like childbirth. It was hellish. <laughs> and I don't remember. 
<laughs> yeah, but thinking also about technology, I would think in the 90s, you don't have digital technology. I mean, I think this really informs also the way in which you would have to listen to your tapes. Like you really have to be listening and write transcribing at the same time, like you gain a proximity with the material that- Gain you an intimacy with it, it is true. But I think we can still do that now. I have no trouble with that now. Um, but at some point in the 90s, we started using computers. It was really cool. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah, but- I mean, but he was Moss was, was the designer. Mm, right. Yeah, then, then email changes everything, but we won't get to email yet. Okay, so do you have the iconic interview for the 90s yet? Have you chosen it? No, we haven't chosen it yet. So what I can't would you say. say? Would but you maybe say? Maybe Susan Laurie Parks, mm -hmm. maybe Carrie James Marshall. I don't know, maybe Walter Mosley. I have, we really, I can't decide. I have to like make the list of what I think and it will be like 50 interviews and then the other editors will narrow it down to one. Right, right, right. And I love I have no favorites, you know. I mean, I don't. I can't. No, no. How could you possibly? I was thinking myself. I was thinking, do I have a favorite and something that stands out? I can't. No, I love yeah, them all. Well, when you were at Bomb, we were doing the America's Issues. And I would love for you to talk about that. Those were started with Danielle Flores, who's our contributing editor um, for Central American Poetry. And it was right around the time when all the revolutions were happening in Nicaragua and El Salvador. And we, we really wanted to give some, some, a lot of pages to Mexico and Central America and South American artists because we knew too little about them. So one of the reasons I wanted to work with you is because you're Mexican American. So talk to me a little bit about the America's issues. Yes, so um, I remember when I, fir well, first I, this is shocking to me, but I, in, in a year or two, it will have been 30 years since I moved to New York, which is crazy. I can't process that, but anyway. So I moved to New York and as the first thing I discovered was Bob Magazine, for sure. <laughs> well, I met a few people at school and then I discovered Bob Magazine and I was like, I love this. This is it. Like I've made it to New York, this is my place. Um, and then short, like, so a few years later, I think the first issue was it the first issue with, with Francisco Toledo on the cover? Possibly because that was the first America's issue with the little Chihuahua. With, yes, exactly. Yes. With the you know, Mexican hairless hand. Yes. And then his son, who I didn't even know at the time was his son, was a subsequent cover. Yes. Jeronimo, Dr. Lacra. Yes. Right. So I, those, those issues were phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, why? Because you I mean, one, they, they were like a great opportunity to really spend time with not only, it wasn't only the interview, it was like bringing a slice of that world over here. Like the, the issues had an integrity. I remember how you focused on certain regions. And just like, if you looked at what the constellation of people that you were bringing into an issue, it was really an environment that you were translating, not just a person. I agree, but can I say it's because the contributing editors were all from, were all artists and writers from those particular areas of those particular locations. So it wasn't top down, it was really going to the people in, in Buenos Aires or in Mexico City and saying, okay, I know you're a great artist. I know you're a great writer. Please tell me about the others. So Carmen Biosa does the first interview in the United States with Roberto Bolaño. I mean, it was unknown. You know, Oscar Jaiuelos, who was here in, um, does an interview with Cabrera Infante, who has left Cuba and is in England. And that, by the way, was our first epistolary interview because um, they wanted to do it via fax, <laughs> which they did. So it was our first written kind of back and forth questions and answers that came over the bomb fax machine. It was wonderful. Right, 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 right. Yes. But that what you're saying is so important because of course, who would know but the artists and the writers and the musicians who are there or con they're all connected. So that, that was just phenomenal and it opened the doors for so many translations Roberto Bolaño as you said first translation to I mean first interview to appear in bomb and then you never imagined that you were covering that you were for you it was like oh this writer who sounds really interesting you're taking a leap of faith because you, you've never read the writing right so you're just like 
trusting your contributing editors and then, whoa. A, a <laughs> we don't hear Carl famous and we lose him on top of that, but yeah. But yeah. you know, for like David Byrne and um, Arto Lindsay, you know, b did so much work with Brazilian um, and South American musicians, mm -hmm. and and really, I mean, started that whole series in Bonn. So mm -hmm. everyone was very generous and very committed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that was I think that for me would be that that seems very much the the tenor of the of the aughts right like the late 90s and the 2000s yeah. because it was also it's a quarterly and you devoted one issue of the magazine to it and i remember those took a long a long time you couldn't just do an issue in in the span of the production time that you would devote to another issue of the magazine i mean yeah, you the would be from there was a level of writing in it because of the translations and we had so many great translators working on that yes 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 um, what else would you say about the aughts, the early 2000s? Oh gosh, that you know what? It's too close for me to comment on, sorry. <laughs> you know, I think this is what happened. In the early 2000s, I began to understand that this was really something that could last for generations and generations. Mm -hmm. And so all I needed to do was get out of the way and let mm -hmm. the next generations come in and do the work that we had started. And that is, you know, giving really talking about their creative process and letting it be about the artist's voice. So that's when I came to understand that it was such a, a much bigger project than, any, than anything I had started, that it had just mushroomed. Mm -hmm. And it was really exciting and really moving to see it. Just like I was watching tonight and going, wow, you know, look at this three generations later. How fabulous is this? Mm -hmm. Well, that's your genius, but the, the reason why it's continuing. That's our genius. Thank you very much. Our, that's true. That's true. That's true. But just letting. Every letting... voice that's ever been involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so true. So true. Um, I'm going to ask you a few more questions and then we're going to open the floor. Okay. The questions from the audience. But, um, so one is, tell me, tell me, so we all can access the archive mm -hmm. and read Bomb's history through its marvelous interviews, which by the way, I use all the time for teaching. They're incredible, oh, incredible resource. Yeah, it's like, it's all there, it's all there. But what about what's not there? I wanna uh, hear maybe a story about something that didn't make it into an interview. Do you have any, any stories about things that you have to leave out? <laughs> Thank you, Monica, because you know I wanted to talk about this. Many moons ago, I think in the 90s, Linda Yablonski did an interview with the great writer um, Luisa Valenzuela in Buenos Aires. And for one reason or another, this snippet didn't get into the final copy. Maybe Luisa didn't want it there. I can't remember. Um, but it's a wonderful story. She was working on a short story and she could not figure out the ending. It was really annoying, as you can imagine. So she thought, okay, I'm gonna take a break. I'm gonna go into the park across from my apartment and I'm just gonna like think and let it come to me. So she's sitting on a park bench and this man from the provinces, um, an indigenous man, I think, comes up to her and says, I really have to tell you something. And she said, I'm so sorry, but I am just trying to clear my mind. So please go away. <laughs> and he did but then he came back and she said the same thing or something similar finally the third time he comes back and he says you don't understand I really have to tell you this and she said okay fine tell me he told her the ending to her story <laughs> only in South America right only in Latin America could this happen he told her the ending to her story incredible isn't it so i thought this is something that i can tell at dinner parties or to friends or to people i care about or now to you all who are listening to this interview over the years um as kind of our secret our secret together what a fabulous story fabulous story and why didn't it make it into the interview i don't know it was ridiculous maybe someone felt self-conscious mm -hmm. maybe we had so much to cover and there wasn't enough room whatever but i figured there were other ways to get the story out into the world 
<laughs> exactly. Well, this actually is a beautiful segue to my next and final question for me. And then we'll, again, as I said, uh, we'll let the pe people, um, folks out there ask some questions, but what, Bet, what makes for a good conversation? Empathy, mm -hmm. intelligence, courage, intimacy, and, and, and the, really the willingness to listen, really listen and to respond to what someone is saying. And I think for most of our interviews, and I have loved this, the artists themselves who are being interviewed have had a revelation in the conversation. And that to me is the best possible thing that can happen where you learn something about your work from the conversation that's been happening in Ball. And that's kind of what we aim for. It doesn't always happen, but it happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that explains a lot of like the way in which you pair subjects, right? It's not like it's never something completely predictable because if it's predictable, then you know that conversation, right? You need it's it's really like having a dinner party or yeah. you know, meeting people for coffee, and you go, what might happen if these two minds dialogue with each other and, and and maybe get a little bit outside of their comfort zone so that they don't just repeat themselves you know you can tell when people just start going into pr mode or repeating something that they, they already know about and then there there are no surprises so i know exactly what you're what you're describing and it's so palpable in the interviews when that i'm glad it is i mean we always ask the subject who they would most like to talk to and we say look you have to be comfortable enough to be intimate but you also have to be challenged those two things have to exist side by side because without them it's going to be boring mm -hmm. so those are the two things we go for you know, and we broke a lot of journalistic molds. Like I said, it's fine for somebody who knows their work really well and who's intimate and who is friends with, with the subject to talk to them because those are the people that are, gonna, that are gonna get under the skin and understand a lot more, mm -hmm. you know? So it's not like, it's not journalism, it's something else. Mm -hmm. What do you do, okay, la last question. What do you do when you love the subject you love the people involved somehow they get self-conscious we rewrite mm -hmm. you rewrite it's it's i always treat the, tra the the audio conversation as a script in development i mean i come from theater and i come from film so the transcript is really a script in development you rewrite it you rewrite it you rewrite it until you get it right and what i mean by that is that the subject is given you know uh, an edited formed um, manuscript back with questions embedded in the text for them to answer. Would you clarify this? Do you think this is necessary? I cut this, but I'd really like to hear more about this, um, that kind of thing. So both the interviewer and the interviewee get a chance to do that in you know, collaboration with an editor who's basically using the Socratic method of asking them questions. Exactly. Right. Because you know this because you did this for eight or nine years. Yes. And, and it's fun because everybody learns in the process and it, it develops into something substantial and um, that's supposed to last. Absolutely. And the listening, as you said earlier, is, is key to the, the person editing as well. The person editing yeah. has to be the best listener, right? Um, I, I mean, it's as simple as it sounds, like. Yeah. Yeah, the, the editing is about encouraging them to just keep going, right? Mm -hmm. But not about, there's no normative style or like how style or you need to sound this way to be embalmed. Like that is not- Out not the good. door, out the door. No, no, no. <laughs> yes, okay. Well, let's, open, speaking of doors, let's open the door. We have a first question here. Okay. And um, first audience question, how and why did Bomb become a nonprofit? Well, I thought, okay, it's an intellectual property. Is this really going to be able to make a lot of money? I really didn't think it would last for any amount of time unless it was a nonprofit. So we applied to New York State Council for the Arts under the auspices of Avalanche, which was also a nonprofit. Um, and we got a $5,000 grant. It was amazing. I thought, oh my God, maybe we will last. $5,000 back then was a lot of money. Um, but they said to me, we don't think as a nonprofit you should take advertising. And I said, wait a minute. 
If you think for one minute that we'll last without, um, without this, you're wrong. Um, $5,000 isn't going to do it. So I was very clear from the beginning that we were going to be a nonprofit, but we were also a business. And so that we would go after every, every twig and every branch, because if you tied all of those together, you would have a really strong log. And if you just had one log, nonprofit, for profit, whatever, you'd probably sink. Mm -hmm. So that's always been my approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so far, so good. I'm knocking on wood. I mean, oh my God, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Who knows? But yes, um, I, intend to, I intend for bomb to survive and thrive. And I think everybody else associated with it does too. So far, you're doing great. And so far, so good. <laughs> yeah, so far, so good. So um, when did you break off from Avalon? Well, we were never a part of Avalanche, but Liza graciously and generously, Liza Bear was always our advisor because she was the one who did know how to create a magazine. And so she was our advisor, I think for the first 10 issues. Um, and then, um, but when did we form our own nonprofit? Rosemary Carroll, who's still a board of trustees. And I worked on that. And in 1984, we became New Art Publications. Rosemary's a lawyer, so she set the whole thing up. Mm -hmm. Yes, and did you choose that name, New Art Publications, just to avoid problems with the name Bomb? Uh, yes, and yes. because um, Avalanche was Center for New Art, so we wanted to, we, we, we didn't want, we just thought it was a natural progression, and it was easier to get a 501c3 with a name like that. But it was always DBA Bomb Magazine. I see, right. Um, Anybody else has questions out there? I'm going to tell you a story about the America's issue. Oh, good. I, yeah, I keep thinking about it because it's really funny. It's, it's a translation issue. So when I started working there, um, you, the, mag, the, the, the issue was focusing on Brazil, Brazilian artists. And there was an interview with a filmmaker who I believe is based in Rio called Gal Guimarães. Mm -hmm. Gal Guimarães. And... So I hadn't heard the transcript. I hadn't done anything. I was just tasked with finishing the edit on this interview and then seeing it through, right? And um, the word deviant kept coming up. <laughs> and so it was like, <laughs> so if you just allow yourself to deviate and become a deviant, and it was just like all these deviations and deviancy and, de and I was like, what is this about? Because he makes work while he walks. So he walks around the city and, and his films have to do with walking, but not with deviancy. I was like, ooh, this sounds kinky. Is it like, is he like into, you know, like sex stuff? And, um, and then I realized it was just a translation issue. <gasps> that, yeah, there's a word in, in, in Portuguese and in Spanish that is divagar, which means to ramble without any particular destination. And, but it- Oh, to, to just wander. Oh my wanted. gosh, thank goodness you caught that. That would have been so embarrassing. <laughs> well, it, it would have added a different dimension to it. I'll say. Yes. Um, okay, we have another question. Do you have any advice for a person starting a magazine today? Oh boy, you know what? No. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I think you have to have a great commitment. I don't think you should... Um, Think too far in advance because if you knew how difficult it's, if you know how difficult it's going to be, you'd never do it. But if you're utterly and completely um, absorbed and committed and um, entranced with what you're doing, then keep going. You'll find a way. Great advice. Great advice. Uh, another one. Can you talk about the auctions and how that worked? The auctions, you mean the art auctions? Mm -hmm. Yes. We um, have always felt that we belong to the artists whose voices we publish. Um, and when it became glaringly apparent that we really were a nonprofit and that if we didn't follow the formula of other nonprofits, we would not survive, we started asking artists um, who we had already published if they wouldn't support the magazine by donating artworks. And I would have to say that our publishers truly are the artists because they 
came forward with such generosity and such support and have been doing so for almost 40 years. And that's really one of the reasons we've survived. Yeah. It's a nice model also of distribution amongst the arts, right? When yeah, you know, I mean, if we were in Europe, we wouldn't have to do this because there would be huge government support. Um, but that, as much as it exists, doesn't exist here to the extent that we need it to. Mm. So we have to uh, rely on, as they call it, the private sector. <laughs> Indeed. Our friends and contributors and patrons and board of trustees and individuals who are incredibly generous and who support the magazine because they believe in the mandate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they want it to continue. Yeah. Um, I once heard Tom Finkelpearl say that um, that he actually sees the model as being a little more hybrid than that because of course it's the government not choosing not to collect their taxes that makes this model the, philan the philanthropic model possible. Yeah, I was, hmm. no, he was already working for the city. I was like, hmm, <laughs> you're no longer at the museum, I can tell. <laughs> He's great, but no comment. <laughs> Absolutely, but yeah, it was like, oh, the government is actually supporting you by not collecting the rich people's taxes and yeah. allowing them to make a donation. And we're not gonna keep going there. Another question, how did you get the first issues out there in distribution? How did you start distributing the first issue? Um, there were in those days um, small um, distributors run by um, like-minded people who took bomb and helped. Um, and I think we um, we went around in a in a in a car <laughs> and brought it to bookstores. I remember walking into bookstores and magazine shops and offering it. That's how we did it. Mm. And how what was the cut that people would take back then? Oh gosh, you know, I don't remember. I, it, it's always huge. You know, mm. the bookstore gets a percentage, the distributor gets a percentage, and then you get this little percentage. Mm. It's just the way it goes, it's fun. We never made money off of, even though we made sales, we never made money off of sales. That was just a kind of break even situation. Mm -hmm. Descriptions really are, are more to the point. Mm -hmm. Um, another question, what do you see as the value of print-based material versus what's on the web? Well, some people like to read print-based material. I do, for instance. Um, the web is miraculous in that it's allowed this quarterly magazine to um, now have, have an audience of almost a million people. I mean, that's unheard of. <laughs> It's also because we've digitized all of our content, allowed us to have this wonderful archive of 8,500 features. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there you go. There you go. But there is something about seeing <coughs> those, those threads. Yeah, no, no problem. No, it, it, seeing things in context, that's just so exquisite. Yeah. In well, the context of paper. Hmm? Seeing an object. Yes. It's yeah. still fun to handle an object. Absolutely, yeah. Um, not a question, but someone named Rachel says, hi Betsy, thank you for the beautiful project. I have learned so much from the interviews and the conversations of minds. I also want to speak to your generous spirit. When Doug Michaels passed, you and I spoke and I won't ever forget your kindness and beautiful spirit. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Doug, yes, he was part of Antwerp. A wonderful collective that um, Hudson Marquez, who had been my boyfriend's <laughs> in college's um, roommate or fraternity mate. Yes. Yeah, that's how I met him. Yes. And that was so sad. Anyway, Ant Farm, it was one of the most important collectives in the 70s. I don't know if you all know it. Yeah, of course. But a lot of architects and, and visual artists were a part of it. Mm -hmm. When did it end, Ant Farm? Farm, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know. Hudson would know, but <laughs> where he is. I see Ted. I don't know if that means yeah, something. Okay. Wait, we're done. I think that's about it. Uh, Thank you, Monica. Thank you so much, Bets. We barely scratched the surface. <laughs> I could I can stay here all night. <laughs> well, I think I think y'all have to do this again. You know, we have a 
a long 40th anniversary year ahead of us. Um, and I'm sure we have plenty more in store. Um, we should absolutely do this again. Um, it was really a thrill. Um, so thank you so much to everyone for joining us this evening. And a big thank you again to our participants, especially Betsy and Monica. Um, Y'all were fantastic. Um, just thank you so much. Uh, and please make sure to visit our Printed Matter Virtual Art Book Fair booth for a special subscription opportunity and follow our socials for future event updates, recordings, announcements, and more. We are at Bomb Magazine on Facebook and Twitter and at Bomb Mag on Instagram. Um, I really hope everybody has a lovely rest of your evening. Um, take care. Bye. Bye, Monica. Bye, Love you. I miss you so much. Bye. Big yeah. hug. We have to come over and see the new place. Yes, once I get vaccinated. Cool. Are you back? Square feet and it's almost all open. Oh my God. Uh, so Betsy, cool. Monica, just to let you know, we're still we're still live. So oh, I'm just sorry, gonna I'm gonna hop. No, no worries. You guys are adorable, and this was a great conversation. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I guess I'll I'll let y'all out of the meeting. Okay. okay. We'll great. see you. Bye. Take care. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you so much. Mwah. Mm -hmm. Love you. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second uh, in a series of programs that Printed Matter has produced in advance of the upcoming Virtual Art Book Fair. PMVABF uh, will be taking place February 24th through the 28th. My name is Sinel Breslov, and I'm the Director of Fairs and Editions at Printed Matter. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I would like to extend my deep appreciation to today's speakers, <clears throat> artist Carolina Casado, curator Carla Acevedo Yates, editor and artist Lorena Mostajo, and community organizer and artist Gloria Galvez. A little over a year ago, as our team was gearing up for the 2020 LA Art Book Fair, we were introduced to Gloria Galvez through a close member of the Printed Matter community, uh, Kimi Hanauer. Gloria generously shared with us her experience and insight of an expanded community of LA-based artists, educators, and, art and activists. This included Carolina Casado. We, in turn, invited Carolina to create a mural for the LA Art Book Fair 2020. Uh, sadly, as we all know, the fair was canceled, and the mural, which uh, illustrates a system of equity for workers and the environment, was left unrealized. Um, although I was told it is illustrated in the new publication, which will be discussed this evening and was produced on the occasion of Carolina's current exhibition at the MCA Chicago, curated by Carla. Uh, tonight also joining is Lorena Mastajo of uh, Taller, California, a San Diego, Tijuana region-based publisher, uh, engaged with border community and a new exhibitor this year to Printed Matter Art Book Fairs. We are so very thrilled to bring this incredible group together today. Uh, this program feels like a year in the making and uh, especially urgent uh, following a year of pandemic and unrest. During the conversation, we encourage you all uh, joining us this evening to put your questions in the Zoom chat box. If you are joining us through YouTube Live, 
please add your questions to the comments and we will be sure to share them with the speakers during uh, at, towards the end of the program. We'll be adding a few links into the chat box, including a link to uh, purchase Carolina's new publication and a link to her exhibition currently on view at the MCA Chicago. We'll also be offering um, a, a live captions for this program, excuse me, and uh, also dropping a link for uh, viewers now. Please note this program will be recorded and uh, available on Printed Matters YouTube channel tomorrow. So once again, I would like to extend a special thank you to Gloria Galvez, who will be moderating this evening uh, and uh, introducing the speakers as well. Gloria is a uh, LA based is LA based and maintains a practice committed to creating and expanding access to physical and abstract spaces of possibility, imagination, and self determination, especially for individuals for whom it's constantly denied. She has organized with community organizations like the Youth Justice Coalition and Mutual Aid Action Los Angeles. Galvez has exhibited at various alternative spaces as well as art, educational, and community based practices places. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind intro, Sunal. And I am very happy to be here to, today in the presence of all of these powerful people doing important work. And I will start by introducing everybody who's here today a little bit more in depth so people can get a sense of who they are and what they have been doing. Uh, I will begin with who is a London-born Colombian artist living in Los Angeles. She participates in movements of ter territorial resistance, solidarity economies, and housing as a human right. Caicedo's artistic practice has a collective dimension in which performances, drawings, photographs, and videos are not just an end result, but rather part of the artist's process of research and acting. Her work contributes to the construction of environmental historical memory as a fundamental element for non-repetition of violence against human and non-human entities and generates a debate about the future in relation to common goods, environmental justice, just energy transition, and cultural biodiversity. She held residencies at the Huntington Gardens, uh, libraries and art collections in San Marino, California in DAAD, Artist in Berlin program, amongst others. Caicedo has received funding from the Creative Capital California Community Foundation, Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, Harpo Foundation, Art Matters, Colombian Culture Ministry, Arts Council UK, and Prince Klaus Found. And recently, uh, Caicedo ha has had solo museum shows at held at the museum Scutzi and Lodz, Orange County County uh, Museum of Art, and ICA Boston and MCA Chicago. Uh, in her 2019, Hearn work uh, was a part of the 45 Salon National Nacional de Artistas Col Colombia, Chicago Architecture Biennial Film Sector of the Art Basel in Basel in the 2020 one, Lo one Loss Artist in Residence at the Occidental College in Los Angeles. And on an ending note, Caicedo is a 2020 slash 2022 inaugural Borderlands Fellow at the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands, Arizona State University and the Vera List Center for Art and Politics. And she is a member of the Los Angeles Tenants Union in Rios Vivos, Colombia social movement. Uh, next, we have Carla Acevedo Yates, who is the Maryland and Larry Fields curator at the MCA Chicago, where she recently curated Carolina Caicedo's uh, solo exhibition from the bottom of the river, the art, which is the art Carolina's first major museum survey. And Previously, Carla was, uh, was the associate curator at the Ellie and Ethai Broad Art Museum at Michigan State University, where she organized solo exhibitions of new work by Johanna Unsueta, Claudia Peña Salinas, and Duane Linklater. She also organized Fiction as a Production, a major exhibition by Argentinian conceptual art pioneer David Lamelas and 
And also in 2015, she was awarded a Creative Capital Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writer Grant for an article on Cuban painter Celia Sanchez. And also we have with us today Taller California and specifically Lorena Mostajo from Taller California. And Taller California is a small press and printing workshop located in the San Diego Tijuana region. It publishes vibrant artist books that engage with the border as a social political place and as a liminal and creative space. It is committed to hybrid forms and to hybrid forms and multilingualism. Taller California's collaborative and experimental ethos creates new modes of production and distribution of printed matter and books. Lorena Mustajo is an editor and artist living between the US and Mexico. She is the editor along with Mara Fortes of Crisp, Crisp Marker in no, in no Memoria, a volume of essays about the French filmmaker and of the first and of the first translation into Spanish of Amos Vogel, film as subversive art, both published in Mexico by Ambulante. Her writings about photography have appeared in the Mexican photography journal Luna Cornea. Taller California will be also participating as a first time exhibitor in the upcoming uh, online book fair by Print and Matter. So um, we, I, I prepared some questions for today and I wanted to go straight into the questions. The first question that I wanted to start was with the, I'll read it to you. And as you guys answer, if there's like, if you're, I think most of the bios had the pronouns, but just in case we missed it, can, if you can just say that so, so folks can refer to you correctly as you would like. So I'll begin with the question. Can each of you tell us how the political issues that you encounter in your personal everyday lives and larger social everyday lives relate to the work you do as an artist, curator, art critic, and printing press? And if there are any moments or projects that illustrate this relationship, can you please share those with us? Maybe, Caro, do you feel comfortable starting us off? It's um, Carolina, she, her. And thank you everyone at Print and Matter and for my fellow panelists for being and sharing this time together. Um, I think all of my works are kind of informed by my everyday and you know what surrounds me and what happens to me as a, as a woman, as a mother, as a person of color in this country, as an immigrant with privileges in this country. Um, I think from the first works, as soon as I graduated from art school in Colombia, like the work I did with Colectivo Cambalache, Museo de la Calle Street Museum, and then the evolution of that into the day-to-day -day project that lasted for a number of years that consisted in um, non-monetary exchange and bartering, you know, uh, that responded to the precariousness uh, you have as a, as a cultural worker, as an artist, um, as a young practitioner, as somebody who just graduated, you know, who's trying to find their way and survive in that like, precarious system. And all the way to the current ongoing project, Be Dam, that looks at the effects of um, dams and different extractive projects on waterways and, and ecosystems. Um, that started because I read that the Magdalena River in Colombia was going to be dammed and I lived on the borders of that river for a couple of years when I, when I was a teenager and my dad was um, cultivating cotton and rice uh, in, the, in the middle body of the river and and um, and so kind of it hit home no the fact that it was a, a river that you know was part of my kind of life history was being dammed uh, pulled me into investigating more about what was going on and uh, so most of my projects are, are informed by, by what happens to me, you know, like, for example, uh, recently I did a series of collages um, that are based on, um, um, how do you call it, it's, it's giving my mind, um, on um, uh, bonds, like um, utility bonds and debt bonds. And that responds to 
you know, to the services that I have to pay. And, you know, and I, as a person who is a citizen who pays taxes, you know, who's interested in knowing where those taxes are going. Um, so it's just doing a little bit of research and founding, finding this, this bonds, you know, that are privatizing what is supposed to be our common goods, water, um, education, health, whatnot. So I would say that pretty much, you know, that immediate personal, you know, private life and personal every day and the kind of consequent political surroundings informs my work. So I hear that your work is a response to like being alive and being a part of this social political atmosphere. Thanks for sharing. Um, Carla, would you mind going next? Sure, thank you so much. And I want to thank Printed Matter for organizing this panel, um, our viewers that are joining us online, and also I'm very honored to share this space with these incredible women. Um, just like Carolina, I think that a lot of my work is, is really informed by um, my identity, my background, my personal experiences. Um, a Puerto Rican woman, you know, born and raised on the island um, with a lived experience here in the United States. I've been working in museums for the past five years almost in the United States. And um, I like to think of my work uh, as a curator as being site responsive, meaning that I try to really research where I am, um, the history of the institution, but also the city where, you know, I'm making exhibitions. Um, and I've been in Chicago for about a year and a half. Um, and uh, really once I, I arrived here, I knew there was a, a very important and one of the largest Puerto Rican you know, populations outside of the island here in Chicago. And I was interested in, in that history, but also just thinking about you know, the larger Latinx population um, here in the city, which is about 30%. And 18% of that of those are Spanish speakers. And I'm a native Spanish speaker. And for me, it was very important to think about how to structure my work at the MCA in a way that my shows were you know, accessible to these communities. And one of the questions that I asked myself and that I still ask myself is how do I make these shows speak to those communities? And how can we bring those communities into the institution, which I think it's a longer you know term conversation but one that's very important to me and for me it was very important to work with an artist such as Carolina and, and bring that voice to the institution her work has been an incredible inspiration for me and um, one of the things that I think is very important that we have you know done for the exhibition is, is uh, really um, create a fully bilingual Spanish English exhibition um, all the gallery texts are in Spanish and English. Um, the catalog is in Spanish and English. And even all the promotional materials, the social media outreach, the artist video. So, you know, I'm very proud and, and happy to say that it's the first fully bilingual, holistically bilingual Spanish English exhibition at the MCA. And that's all thanks to, you know, Carolina and her work. And, it's funny because it's really inspired by the structure of one of her installation, video installation, Spaniards um, named her Magdalena, but natives call her Juma, which is in Spanish and English. So that was an opportunity for me to, to really take the structure of the work and translate it into, into the museum. Um, and I just wanted to show briefly the publication because it's an incredible book that I hope all you have the opportunity to see published with Delmonico. And um, it has these beautiful stills from apparitions um, and featuring Samet Guerra, one of the dancers and collaborators. And um, just wanted to show this quickly before I pass it on to, to uh, another one of my colleagues. I definitely feel you on the need for language justice and answering that necessity, like growing up in a household where people spoke Spanish only. And when we went to museums, how they didn't understand a lot of the work they were seeing. And then the second layer of not understanding was the tags on the wall. So if there was an explanation there that made the work more accessible, it was like completely lost. So I thank you for your effort in making um, art and, and exhibitions more accessible. Lorena, I now I would like to pose the question to you. Um, yeah. 
Thank you so much, Gloria. Um, thank you so much, Printed Matter, for organizing this, for the invitation. And I'm very honored to be with uh, these, again, also wonderful women. Um, and to to answer, you know, to answer the question, being at the, at the border is a very, living in, in between two countries is a very uh, difficult way of navigating first identity, then place. And one of the things that uh, I'm not from, I'm from Mexico City, and I've been living here for more than six years. And one of the things that is impossible to avoid being in, in San Diego and in Tijuana is obviously the, the border and what it does to, to the body, to your, to your subjectivity, and also to language. And in, in the spaces where, where things are difficult, there are also spaces that are really fr like fruitful and full of life. And recently I was talking to a friend who, uh, he's the director of the, a gallery in San Isidro called The Front. They, they do excellent work with the community at the border. And we were talking about, you know, the, I was telling him about the printing house and he said, you know, at the beginning I was organizing a lot of things and at some point the, the theme of the border sometimes is, it's so, so big in our lives, you know? And then at some point you want to forget the border too. At some point you want to forget that you're constantly surveilled, that you have to, that is a transaction in between uh, one language and the other, a, an identity in a country and another. And, and sometimes, you know, people, people, for example, in Tijuana who cross to study, to work, they, they have already incorporated the, the crossing in their everyday lives. It's no longer an event. Uh, but there, there are moments, for example, when you're crossing, that you're reminded that this, that, uh, that's, there's a state that is surveilling you, that there's a land that's being divided, that there's someone who might not understand you or someone who might mistake you for, you know, if you're in a, in a store and someone, usually that this is common where people, you know, Think that you work there because you look in a certain way. So there are a lot of like uh, a lot of negotiations in this place. So when I moved here, um, not only I was, you know, part of these, but I also was fascinated in terms of language and in terms in terms of all the networks that are already had that are already in Tijuana, working with people in San Diego. So I I found that there was that I needed to to do something with, with all these energies in the and, and efforts of artists and community members. Uh, so the, the idea of the multilingual press came also because there are many indigenous languages spoken in the area. Uh, so hopefully in the future, you know, the, the more people know about the publishing house, we will be able to publish in other languages, uh, not only Spanish and English. Uh, so, and I think one of the things that I've learned from, from all the people who I've, I've worked with is this, that the border is, it's a multi, um, there's so many things to interpret about it. And, and it's a negotiation that is endless, but it's also rich. You know, at the same time, one can rebel against the border while being subjected by it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in learning more about your border, the work you're, you guys are doing as artists and organizers in the border. And perhaps actually this second question um, can help us understand that a little bit more. You've shared a lot already, but just different aspects of it. And that question is for, for you, Lorena, and for Carolina, but obviously if anybody has something else to add, please do. The question is, uh, Carolina, your body of work, Be Dam, addresses water dams across the Americas. In Lorena, with Taller California, you have printed projects that address the U.S.-Mexico border, including your most recent publication, Border Looping. For me, both of these physical barriers, the border wall and the dam, serve similar neoliberal interests and also have similar negative social environmental impacts on their surrounding communities. Can you share what some of these negative impacts are, especially those covered by your work? And also, can you share if you know of any artistic and political movements addressing these issues? Um, uh, the, absolutely, the, the, the dam 
and the border share, you know, a physical presence that cuts, you know, a set of relationships into uh, the body of a river in the case of the dam and sometimes of even physical barriers that traverse a river cuts the body of a river in two, cuts the connections that communities have um, and, and severe um, a set of um, cultural and biological relationships that happen within an ecosystem. In the case of a dam, um, the, you know, the, one of the first consequences is the, the death of the fish that inhabit that river because uh, the dam stops reproductive cycles of fish swimming upstream, um, you know, to, to reproduce. So that's one of the first impacts. And then of course, then that impacts all the riverine communities who have a fisher livelihood, like fisher folk, uh, but also the stagnant uh, reservoir normally fills very productive um, land where crops used to take place. So people dedicated to those crops also lose uh, work sources, but also the access to, to good and healthy food. Um, and then dams, though uh, we have been fed a lot of lies uh, in, in, in the sense that we have been taught that hydroelectricity is green energy or that is a sustainable source of energy. Uh, there's nothing uh, further than, than, you know, than the truth because actually large dams produce a tremendous amount of methane into the atmosphere, uh, contributing to greenhouse gases. Um, so these are kind of the like immediate environmental impacts that you can see uh, with any large dam or medium-sized dam construction. But then, you know, there are many that you cannot see, like the emotional um, and, and psychological impacts that uh, any extractive process such as damming, mining, oil extraction have over these communities. Because, you know, when, when the river that it's kind of your kin, you know, it's part of your everyday, it's not only um, for a lot of communities, the river is not just this place for extraction, but it's, it's something that you grow up with, you know, it's part of your family almost. Um, to have it dammed, to see it you know, in that state, to see the water kind of dead, stagnant, is a tremendous uh, environment, uh, sorry, uh, psychological impact um, brings a lot of depression and you know there's a sense that you know you get uprooted you get uprooted sometimes you're displaced by these mega constructions and mega projects and you're displaced you're uprooted totally and you know your your identity your culture your history suddenly is taken from you so that is uh, one of the impacts that I'm that I'm interested in the to, to kind of uh, make visible and highlight in the work um, and also looking at uh, as part of also that things that are lost and that are endangered when one of these extractivist processes come to your territory, to your, to your land, is the loss of embodied knowledge or the transmission, the loss of, of, of the transmission of embodied knowledge. So say when I speak about embodied knowledge is that knowledge that we inherit from our grandparents and from our parents. In the case of fisher folk, how to weave a net, how to cast a net to capture fish. And uh, when there's no river left and there's no fish left in the river, then you stop casting the net, you stop weaving the net. And that embodied knowledge uh, is not performed anymore. So uh, that's something that worries me a lot. And that's something that I look at through different um, works, uh, kind of the geo choreographies or these collective actions and performances that I facilitate and that we do in collaboration with communities who are resistant dams or the Cosmota Raya series, which are these series made with artisanal fishing nets sourced from these same communities um, that speak about disembodied knowledge, the knowledge of weaving a net, the knowledge of casting the net, um, and also how performing or like, you know, in casting a net, how this reaffirms the river as a common good, right? So I would say, you know, this is an example of, um, of two, you know, series or two pieces that, that kind of talk about those losses and those 
um, those things that worry me most about these extractive industries. Lorena? Yes, so I, I will talk uh, a little bit about Border Looping, the, the book that uh, we're going to present at the, at the Printed Matter Fair, which is very, very exciting. Uh, and from there, I'm going to just respond to the, the question. So the Border Looping is a, is a book, it's a dialogue between uh, David Morrison Portillo and Rehan Ye. And what David does, which is very hard to describe, it, it's between a performance, performance art and really punk activism. What, what he does is that he crosses the border uh, non-stop, he, he chooses a day and crosses the border non-stop between Mexico and the United States and he goes over, on and on and on for, you know, four or five hours. So in, in, the, in the looping, what happens is that first the, the massive violence of the state appears, but at, at, in crossing non-stop, things, the system start, starts to break down in a way. So for example, officers start to recognize him and then first they're very violent, violent with them, but then they start asking him like, oh, well, next time you cross, can you tell me a joke? And so there's something happening in his, in his, in this decision of crossing uh, that is disarticulating the, the violence of the, of the border. And again, he has the privilege to cross in that way because he's a US citizen, you know, it's, but, but there's also in his thinking, he's also, he has said that he started doing this when uh, soap at the border, uh, in the bathroom in the United States side was out. So he asked an officer to put soap in the bathroom. And it, that, that um, developed in a series of bureaucratic responses and aggressive responses. And this is why he started looping to see if, he, if, the, if the authorities had put soap in the bathroom. So, and for example, he, he talks about the different answers that he gives to officers um, when they ask, what do you bring from Mexico? And, some, and he mentions uh, someone, a friend of his answers, mucha felicidad, a lot of happiness. You know, so in these, in these little gestures, he's subverting this, this relationship between officers and, and migrants. Uh, so in, in that sense, you know, he's, he's talking about body, you know, the, the, I think the crossing is definitely about body. It, it creates a, it's a liminal space in which, you know, you're being surveilled, but you also have to account for yourself to someone else. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, also the border is the, the land divider that creates a lot of environmental issues in along, you know, all these states. So for example, uh, in San Diego, the Kumeya nation is suing the Trump administration because they're constructing the the, board, the the wall in sacred lands. So they've been able to stop some of the construction and it's still going on, the, they're still battling. Uh, in Texas, there's also three or four groups uh, suing the, the government. And in terms of people who are, yeah, can, can, yes, uh, in, in terms finish, of- Finish, finish. Okay. In terms of the of the people who um, who are working here at, at the border, there's uh, with this with the damage of to the bodies is uh, Espacio Migrante, Border Angels, Pueblos Sin Fronteras. There's a really uh, really strong group of uh, Central American youth who have migrated from uh, Honduras, El Salvador to Tijuana, waiting to receive asylum here in the United States. They create a group called uh, Contra Viento y Marea. And Debbie Machete is leading, it's part of that group. Uh, and then there are artists, um, another artist that I'm working with, uh, her name is Ana Andrade, she's from Tijuana. And she photographed uh, the people living at the Bordo in El Rio, que, that separates the, the US and, and Mexico. And she photographed the, the decline of, of, the, of nature, but also the, the way people lived and interacted in, in that space space uh, and in a space that years later after she she was there was completely redone by the government by the because they constructed a new port 
uh, a new garita. So they got, re they intuited, they, they paved the, the river. So now when you cross, you see all the pavement and all the vegetation, the birds that used to go there, they lost part of their, of their habitat. So yeah, it, it is what, what the division of land does to the bodies, to the subjectivities and to the environment is, yeah, it's really, really harsh, of course. Caro? Yes, I, I wanted to add that um, in Texas, I've been developing a work for the last two years there that's going to open at the Visual Arts Center in UT Austin in, in October. And we have been uh, learning so much from the Carrizo Come Crudo tribe from Texas, who are just one of those groups who are resisting and suing the Trump government for their illegal and nasty construction of the wall, uh, and also the private wall that was constructed in Texas, actually. Um, they, their arguments are, of course, environmental damage, because the wall, when it's constructed, it's just not the spikes that go up, but they actually erase almost a mile on each side of the wall. And, uh, you know, they, they kind of graze all the vegetation, so all the biodiversity that's, you know, around the, the that that where the wall kind of goes is is destructed uh one of the most important cases is the butterfly national butterfly center that's a small ecosystem in in, in, in Hidalgo, texas uh, but their other argument is that they're going over sacred land and they're going over um sacred cemeteries, ancestral cemeteries but even kind of more contemporary ones uh that are that have veterans lie, lie in there and whatnot. And um, so, yeah, there have been also Carrizo Come Crudo tribe of Texas, which of course is not federally recognized, uh, but that they have been historically, their lands, um, which in their language is Somisek, the land of the sun, is both on both sides of the borders, right? So uh, Juan Mancias, who is the chairman of the Carrizo always says, la frontera nos cruzó, the, the border crossed us, you know, but we've always existed and we've always walked and, you know, lived along the Rio Grande. Um, I think another group that I feel very inspired of, of the work on the border is uh, Angri Tias and Abuelas, also in Texas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much to both of you for all of that information. And it's interesting to hear from both of you, like some of the things you're talking about in languages and in like moments that I feel like there's a lot of the similar tactics used on the communities, whether it's a community of people or a community of plants. I mean, like both of you guys talked about uprooting, uprooting people, but also uprooting vege natural vegetation that is, is both its own thing and its own um, living thing, but it's also like food sources and things that feed people and so on. And on a brief note, a film that's coming to mind that I feel like actually ties dams and ties the border and it's a sci-fi film is Sleep Dealers. And it covers like a lot of the issues that you all um, are addressing and also talks about like a future that could happen if we don't solve these issues. But um, we'll move on for now. And we'll go to the next question, which is for all of you guys and I will Read the question and maybe for this question, we can begin with Carla. The question is, in my contemplation of the work that you all do, I came to realize that each of your projects that uh, that each of your pro sorry, that each of you have projects that politicize and platform the mundane acts of the everyday life, especially of those who reside in the social political margins. Carolina, for instance, your Cosmoatarrayas project primarily consists of artisanal fishing nets and directly references the everyday fishing that folks do in rivers that, in the rivers that your work revolves around. Lorena, with Taller California, the prints you co-produce with artist Adela Goldbar that portray a small artisanal brick making community in Baja, Cali in Baja Mexico. And Carla, the essay that you wrote exploring the meaning, including the political meaning of trabajo, a photographic work of art by the late artist Catherine Mateos Olivo uh, that portrayed her performing the different low-skilled jobs 
she had throughout her life. So I see these this type of work as a powerful act that creates visibility and reverence for the mundane of the margins uh, while advancing its social political importance. But I also see this type of work as complicated acts that pose the opportunity for them and the ideas and and those worlds and those people that they are referencing to get co-opted, fetishized, and reduced to mere objects or images by the art world that is deeply alienated from these spaces. Um, my question to you guys is like, how like have you encountered this duality? How do you feel about it, and how do you navigate it? Um, and Carla, if we could begin with you. That's a tough question. Um... But I think it's a very important question. And I think in the work that we do, at least for me as a curator, I need to live within the contradictions that this question implies. Because I think that, you know, at the same time that I work with artists such as Carolina, who has very deep and profound social and political commitments, at the same time I work with these objects that are presented in a museum with it, the colonial history that that implies, that are collected by private people, by private, you know, private entities, and that can be perhaps sold at auction in the future. And we don't have really a, a lot of control over that. And I'm glad you mentioned um, the work of my friend, um, the artist Catherine Matos Olivo, because that really made me think of a completely different part of my career when I was working as an independent arts writer in San Juan. And um, that I think it's very a very different type of work that from what I'm doing right now as a curator in a US museum. And Kathy's work really was about precarity. The fact that she had to take on three and four different jobs in order to make ends meet. And that's the reality of a lot of artists you know, in the United States, of course, but in Puerto Rico, the circumstances of the um, production and consumption of art is very different from the United States. And I think that it's important to acknowledge the distinction between these art worlds, right? And I think that what you're pointing to really is the arts industry or the art market um, that tends to reify the objects and commodify these works and they get co-opted into, you know, a neoliberal ethos. Um, so I think that it's important to make that distinction in the sense that that art world that we're always talking about is actually something very specific. It's, it's like centered and focused in major cities in the US and Europe. And, and her work really, Kathy's work was presented mostly in nonprofit spaces, artists run galleries. So the ecology of how art is produced, shown and consumed is, is very different. Now, as a museum curator, and I'm like switching back to like what I do now, I think that that's a question that I pose myself all the time and that we should be thinking about all the time. And I think that we should acknowledge those contradictions and, and sort of navigate them in the way as ethically as we can, right? As curators, as cultural workers. And one thing that I have very present or that I ask myself all the time when I'm working with an artist such as Carolina or any artist is, you know, how do I honor and respect the work that I have been entrusted with? Um, and how do I provide the proper context for this work to be presented in a museum? Um, and how do the devices of display that we usually use as curators um, actually accelerate this consumption of objects that you are you know, talking about? Because I think that part of the work that we do is, is really not only working with artists and the objects that they produce and bringing those relationships into the museum, but it's also about um, the interpretation, the context that we're providing um, for, for our visitors to come when they come and see the show. And when I'm talking about all these devices, and that's something that, you know, I think Carolina and I have discussed, it's like, what are those devices that standardize a way of looking at an object within a gallery? And that can mean anything from a pedestal to the production of walls, to the height of a piece, you know, to the hierarchy of 
the text, if it's a bilingual um, didactic text. So that's all these different things that I think about um, when I'm working with an artist. And, and that doesn't mean that, um, that the process that you're talking about won't happen, but I think that it's important to just acknowledge the fact that we are all necessarily enmeshed within these market forces and that we need to navigate them as best as we can and with um, the ethical commitments that you know we have as as curators and as as artists working in this field i i really feel you in that acknowledging the con the contradictions that one can have and as an artist um like i feel like i'm coming more to more to that mind of thinking that I'm like, oh, I'm functioning in a very specific art world that be, in order to function with, you have to make space for these contradictions or else I could go to a different art world. Like the one that you said that Catherine is a part of, which are like, you know, there's the DIY or the more like um, activist art spaces that I know that are totally unrelated to the art world that we're talking about. So I appreciate that you're making those distinctions. Um, Lorena, can we jump to you and then we'll end with Carolina. Yes, uh, so you mentioned Adela Goldberg's project uh, and that project um, it's called uh, Prototipo para un desastre arquitect arquitectónico. It's just in English is so long and so sorry that I'm just mentioning in, in Spanish. Um, and and what she did in this uh, in this project is she went to Cerro Azul in Baja California. Um, that it's very close to Tecate in, in that area. And she worked with these brick makers to build a, a model of a, of a house, typical of uh, lower class um, tenements. And she, so when we were discussing, you know, what, what kind of prints she wanted to produce for the show, we talk about basically the, the photographs of the process. And because in, in the process, you know, the, the contact with the brick makers, she was uh, also, you know, doing the, the bricks herself. She would drive, come in and, you know, in between San Diego and, and Cerro Azul. And one of the things that, um, of, that we printed was uh, this house that, usually the, the houses that are disposed in the US, all these prefabricated houses are sent to Tijuana. So she was really interested in these uh, moving homes and moving a type of architecture to a, to a space that had a different way of doing houses, of, make, of building houses. So uh, in that sense, you know, I think the, the everyday, the projects that, that talk about this, these little aspects that the labor that is kind of invisible, that is invisible, are things that are, you know, I'm very interested to to work uh, to work with artists that are doing that. Another project that I think addresses this in a in a different way is uh, a book that we also present at the fair, which is about surveillance in San Diego. So uh, and Lily Rani and Jesse Marx are, you know, they're 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 they not only they describing the the aspects of um, what goes behind surveillance and how we access information about how the government surveils us, but also they're writing a guide to learn how to access information or to request information from the government. So I think these aspects of um, these mundane things, the everyday, the everyday things that they seem that might not be so interesting, the, the books that I'm publishing that address that in, in a way that they take that and then create uh, something for the, for the common good. So, Border looping will include a guide of how to border loop, and then the, this other book will have, you know, how 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 are you going to learn to access information, for example, in California, um, and the yes, yeah, so I I will I will stop there. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I would just yes, I have the, the just a quick answer about the the way in which the art world, you know, can eat also some communities sometimes in a, in a toxic way. I think, uh, I think what the working with artists in this mode of exchange, I have a model of trueque. So when artists print with me, they, they 
um, I donate my labor and they donate material for other artists to print other books. So I've been able to support some groups in Mexico City who are responding to the pandemic. So in that way, everybody's helping each other. And I've been, you know, with every author that I work with or artist, they have to, we have to set the rules of, you know, what the money that comes from the books is going to another book that they want to make or for another book of another person. So, you know, it's also in the sense of bookmaking and, and book selling, I'm also trying to re, not redefine, but like make our own rules together. Yeah, so. Oh, I'm muted. Something that, well, you said it, Lorena, but it also made me think of Carla's work about like turning, like making common goods and resources for larger communities. And to an extent, I feel the Spanish print book that you're making and just thinking about language accessibility, that is like a common good resource. And I definitely would like to echo that. Um, Caro, jumping to you. Yes. Uh, well, Carla mentioned it at, at one point when she was talking about my work, and I think she puts it lovely that, um, you know, and that's something I, I work hard is to maintain a commitment to, to the communities and to the processes that have informed my work and that have generously received me in their territories, um, that have educated me about their struggles, about, you know, the ethics of collaboration. Um, you know, just thinking about how, you know, those conversations, those critiques that come from precisely the, the people I collaborate with that are not part of this art industry are the ones that ground me and that, um, you know, keep, keep me, keep me, yeah, on my, on my toes, I guess. And um, I, I just added in the chat for all the attendees, um, the Carrizo Come Crudo link, uh, the Angry Tias and Abuelas, and the last one is the Facebook of Jaguas por el Territorio, which is a youth organization um, from Colombia in Huila that are impacted by El Quimbo Dam, was the first case study that informs the, the or that conforms the whole body of work of B Dam, that uh, is, the, is the body of work that looks at the impacts of dams over rivers. And, um, you know, the first time I visited there was 2013, uh, started conversations with them in 2012. Um, and the last interaction we're having is that it, I invited uh, David Hernandez Palmar, who is a Waju uh, indigenous to spirit person who lives in the Hagua and who has collaborated to write a text for the catalog that we put together with Carla for the MCA. And he's certainly not, you know, a, a voice that's coming from that art industry, though he is, you know, an artist, a filmmaker, a journalist himself, uh, uh, you know, and he curates film festivals and whatnot. But, you know, I could certainly have gone through, you know, to, to pick, you know, I don't know, kind of a, anyone, right? Okay, hey, you know, high flight personality, or I don't know what, but, you know, the fact that I, that I, you know, wanted to go back and kind of, you know, uh, work on that commitment that I have to that community that has generously informed my work and has generously put everything for me there, you know, as a way for me to, to kind of loop back, talking about looping. I think that's an important act to look back, to always look back and enable to, to move forward. So, you know, those long-term co -term commitments take time, take effort, uh, sometimes get rough, you know, as any relationship, but you have to keep on grinding and have to keep on, on doing that. Today I had a marvelous conversation precisely about the show I'm putting together for Oxy Arts that opens next month. And um, also I got a, a super good grounding down <laughs> from a few indigenous Chumash and Tongva women of like, hey, are you doing this? Are you doing this? Are you going to talk about this? But have you done this? Have you done this? So, so you know, it's about finding those ways to communicate, and um, and weave together those two spaces. No, like I think, I think I like to say that I've gotten better, and and, and you know, and that my process of learning how to weave those two spaces has, you know, um, is is getting better and better by the day. But it's definitely a commitment and hard work. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, Carolina, and because I, I feel like I'm so familiar with your work because I was your former artist assistant. Um, so I know your work and your path very well. And I think one thing that I appreciate about your work and that I've learned from your work and I've learned from um, things that my organizing peers have told me is like making that space to give people to for people from the community or people that I'm working or writing about or making films with and about to make space for them to tell me like, how does this like you may be talking about the problematics of like organic foods, but like some people may not even have access to organic food or food at all. Like, how do you talk about those problematics with this new context? And if I don't make the space for people to speak to me, because a lot of artists, unfortunately, don't always make this space, I can fall into these like traps of thinking that I know everything. Um, but I think I'm going to jump to a question that I had just for you here, since it's kind of related and I think it might flow better. And I rather end with a question for all rather than this one. But the a question is that I had for you is like, do you have any words of advice for artists who are trying to work with political groups or social justice issues? Um, I specifically you've done a lot of work with Rio Rios Vivos, um, who is working in response to the the dam that was built in Colombia. So yeah, do you have any tips how artists can go about that? And if there's any specific things that you've learned in your process of working? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, it's never bad to repeat, but the commitment, you know, that effort of committing uh, to an idea and to a relationship, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and feeding that relationship, it's like a marriage, you know, if you don't fuel the fire, <laughs> it's not going to happen. I don't know, but it's, it's that and, and doing it in also in your capacity. So learning to pace yourself because, um, you know, working with communities can be draining too. Um, and maybe you have like an aesthetic goal and you think, oh, I need to do this project in a year, but maybe that's not in the agenda of the community and they have other things to prioritize. So learning also to respect the agendas in place for communities and organizations and see how, can you, how you can support those agendas instead of the community supporting your work as an artist, how you, with your set of skills, you know, I always say that as artists, our set of skills is to construct images, but also to deconstruct those images, um, you know, and to distribute resources that you receive from precisely that art industry, you know, when you get a commission or a production grant, how can you distribute those resources in the community and how can you support with your skills as an artist, the agendas in place for that community, uh, either by highlighting you know, their efforts or their struggles through film, through collages, through bookmaking, through printmaking, uh, through curating, through putting a series of, you know, um, exhibitions or screenings together, um, but also respecting the time, you know, uh, you know, the art world functions at such a speed that you know, as any industry has a certain speed that we've all seen, you know, with a pandemic, we've all have been able to take a breathe, a breath, you know, um, but it seems that it's kind of speeding up again. So, um, and respect the time and the, you know, the time cycles of those communities. And, you know, and also we are artists. I mean, there are so many people in the front lines who are activists. Um, I don't consider myself to be in the front line people in the front lines across the Americas and even here in the United States, uh, you know, get legally hassled, are followed, are killed, you know, in some extreme cases. But we can be immediately, you know, behind that front line, supporting with our work, with our visuals, uh, with monetary, you know, distribution, with uh, gathering resources, with sharing um, and highlighting their voices. So there's many ways that, that we can collaborate. Uh, some are more visible, some are more invisible, but it's certainly something that it's like a long-term commitment. If you want to work with a community or with a social organization, be prepared to commit to long-term and pace yourself. Uh, and I think that's, that's the best way to approach it. Yeah, because mm -hmm. these battles are long-term battles. And yeah. The, gonna, mm -hmm. 
the relationship is key, like you said. Um, and I totally feel you on so many other things. And many of the things that you're mentioning actually reminded me of like the Zapatista principles, which I think actually are great principles to implement in any collaboration and relationship we have across art and across life. And also a great book, uh, Decolonizing Methodologies by Linda to to he y smith and that's been really helpful to me also um i'm gonna move on to the uh, a question for lorena and carla and let me make sure i'm reading the correct question okay here we go so the question is as a press that prints artist books and and media and as a curator or art critic, one per se is not given the same opportunity to directly work with communities and political struggle like an artist is get, is granted the same, sorry, like an artist has. Um, nonetheless, in an abstract way, one is always working with community. For example, perhaps a curator curates a show that is informed by a justice movement or needs of a community. Um, I was wondering if you guys had any thoughts around this and if you can tell us about any of the ways you are either working indirectly with community or if there's a direct way you're actually doing it also like that would and either or that would be awesome to hear about. Maybe Carla if you can. Sure. Um, so I really don't consider myself like a, a socially engaged curator and I'm not an activist by any means. And um, my commitments are really working collaboratively with artists to make exhibitions with the objects that they make and with the relationships that they bring into the institution. That said, um, I think that I try to translate those commitments to the ways in which I work in the institution. And I think that Carolina's exhibition at the MCA is a really great example. Um, the way that she establishes relationships with communities, the ways that she structures the work itself has provided me with a blueprint to bring the work into the institution. So the structure of um, the exhibition is really inspired by the ways in which Carolina works. And I think that um, that informs not only my working relationships with my colleagues, but also you know, how the show looks like and the publication and the types of you know, contributors that we invite. And Carolina mentioned um, David Hernandez Palmar, who's a fantastic YU filmmaker. And I just wanted to add a comment that his text adds something so significant to the publication because the lived experience of a geochoreography is not translatable to a gallery space or to a museum. So the emotional and effective response that he wrote in his text, a very emotional, a very personal text, says so much about the reciprocal relationships that Carolina builds on the ground. And that's a word that David uses a lot, reciprocity. And it's about reciprocal relationships. So for me, it's like, how can I learn from that? And how can I work in that reciprocity ethos within you know, the museum? And I just wanted to mention, and apart from that, that um, on the horizon, I'm working right now in researching the artistic genealogies between Chicago and Puerto Rico and the history of social justice movements here um, that were initiated by the Puerto Rican community um, and their intersectional work with um, the Chicanx organizers. So, in the horizon of the, my continued tenure at DMCA, I'm thinking about how to, you know, make do a project that is really thinking of these histories together. And I'm, you know, researching local organizations that have been doing a lot of work on the ground already. So I'm not coming in and saying, okay, I just moved to Chicago and I'm doing the show, but really incorporating into the show already existing knowledge and that exists, you know, that is in the city. And so I'm not like really starting from scratch. I'm, I'm just bolstering that, um, 
yeah, that organizing the, the archival material and just bringing it into the MCA. So I think that those are two kind of examples of how um, that kind of like community structure can translate into the work that I do. I'm excited to see that show. And if folks want to keep track of that, how can they do so? Well, it's not public yet. It's just like mm -hmm. a research project. So it'll be down the pipeline in a few years. It's a at MCA, you said, right? At the MCA. Okay, cool. Awesome. Lorena? Yes. Uh, first, Carolina, I think your words of advice were beautiful. Like, I'm so happy that we're talking right now. Yes. Um, so I think the you know, as, as, a, as a printing press, I think that the act of publishing, publishing is the act of making something public. So in that sense, there is already a sense of, there, there is a community that you're already addressing and, uh, or that you're imagining. And the, the power of that is, it can be really strong if you, if you connect also to, to the people who are around you, if you serve that community. So it could be, you know, this community of readers can be, um, you know, like like global or just local. And I think in that sense, uh, what I'm figuring out with the Yet California is how to how to cross, you know, not only between the the readers in in Mexico, uh, Estados Unidos, but also how to that the people who are going to engage with these artists with the books. Are going to create networks also, you know, in in their own in their imagination. So, for example, the the readers of Border Looping, they'll have a connection with David and Rehan. The readers of uh, of the surveillance book, they will have a guide. So that that already is doing something for the community. Um, so I, I see I see publishing as as this beautiful act of through language and images tend like create a network, you know, create a space of silence and, and meditation where people can can talk in a different way and can show in a different way. So yeah. I definitely feel you on that. And it's like a network across physical space and then also across time. There's so many texts that were written before my time and ideas that I'm just like, this is everything. Um, so, uh, I'm going to move on to the last question, which is for all of you guys. And this question is, what are the pressing social and environmental issues within the art world that we need to address? And whomever wants to start can go for it. If somebody's like, I got it. <laughs> Maybe I'll choose somebody. I'll choose Carolina. <laughs> uh, I think that we have a, a big carbon footprint as artists and as in art institutions. Um, and that's a big challenge because, you know, shipping, crating, insurances, um, flying all over the globe to all these biennials and art fairs. So that's something that worries me and that I'm certainly part of. You know, it's one of these contradictions that we talked about. Um, uh, and so, you know, the pandemic, for example, has made me question, ask myself, uh, now that I'm home in the Sereno and East LA, you know, if I'm the artist of my block, what is my role in my block? <laughs> I don't have the answer yet. Um, but certainly, you know, looking, looking at those practices, uh, like Museo de la Calle, or those practices that I was doing when I was still in art school, where I was intervening streets in Bogota, where I grew up, being very informed about the dynamics of the street culture in Bogota too. So think, which are very different from here, from LA and from El Sereno. But, uh, but try to think about that. Mm. But definitely the carbon footprint and all these flying and how to, to address this in the art world is something that's a big challenge for us, for our community of artists and cultural makers. And, um, and I think also the, um, 
and then, you know, at, at large, just the environmental collapse. I mean, the pandemic has definitely uh, brought to attention the deep inequalities that exist in our society, you know, and have, have, have even made them worse uh, in terms of um, racial uh, injustice, uh, in terms of access to health, to housing, to food, um, you know, and, and the depend how dependent we are of, of like an electric grid we don't control at all. You know, I was here during the pandemic, really, you know, peeing myself like, what if the light and the electricity fails and there's no internet at all? Like, what the hell are we gonna do? We don't control anything. So just thinking like about a lot about just energy transition and fair energy transition and how we really, I don't know what we have to do as a society I mean, but we really have to start moving aggressively in that direction of energy transition and thinking about um, energy production that's localized and controlled by communities, as small as blocks, as small as a few streets, you know? Yeah. I just wanted to add because um, the first, when I read your question, Gloria, I immediately thought about the Blockbuster show and the carbon footprint of a large international or a survey with international aspirations, um, even a biennial, but also in museums. And does it make sense right now to bring artwork from around the world um, to a place where it's gonna be up in a museum for a two or three months, and then it's gonna be shipped back to the four corners of the world? I'm not sure. So that's something that I've been, you know, thinking a lot about and just thinking as a curator who works in a museum, what does it mean to look at our surroundings more closely? And that's not to say that we're not going to do a survey or we're not going to do a show that's thinking, you know, from this international perspective, but what can we do to really minimize that carbon footprint and just be more um, cognizant of how these loans are affecting the environment, I think it's very important. The other thing I wanted to add, and this is like a large kind of question that everybody's thinking about, especially now during the pandemic and with um, the social uprisings that have been happening for the past year, is like, how can we build a more equitable museum and how does that look like? I don't have the answer to that. This is an ongoing question, but I think it's something that we need to be asking ourselves every single day. Um, and it's something that I've been thinking a lot about, especially because there's a lot of conversation around diversity, inclusion and representation, but I really feel that that's not enough. And that those are terms that we have inherited from the multicultural era that have a certain limit. So how can we reformulate that to exceed and push that conversation forward. And I think that for, for us who, you know, museum workers, we need to be not only including artists that have been historically excluded or not represented in the canon, we need to bring artists that challenge the canon, that challenge these master narratives and that really disrupt the foundations of everything that the museum is built on, even if it's ruffling some feathers, you know, and even if it takes, you know, a lot of work to make those projects happen. But I think that it, it's something that, that we all need to be thinking about, you know, the terms of the conversation, are these terms sufficient? Um, I'm not so sure, I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with this idea of inclusion. So that's something that it's an, an ongoing, um, ongoing thinking that I'm, I'm trying to, you know, work through also with my colleagues at, at the NCA. And I would just uh, add, because uh, I echo everything that Carolina and Carla have mentioned uh, already, is, is that I think for, to understand that, you know, the, the, our world is a, is a small space that we inhabit from time to time, but the larger picture is very, is, it looks very dry, you know, it's like, it, 
it's not good what, what's coming. So to, for example, to understand the relationship between us and, and nature to reconfigure our idea of what nature is and also how we how this system pushes bodies uh, and landscapes and um, ecosystems environments I, I think the, the the pressing matter is to reimagine that you know that we cannot have a utopia that doesn't include our relationship with nature we cannot it has to, we really need to replace ourselves, not as the, we cannot put technology as the, as the savior of, you know, the, everything, the opposite. It, it's time to, I think that the work of the imagination, it's so necessary right now. Uh, so I would say that, 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 that to me, that is the challenge in all the worlds that we inhabit. Yeah. Um, briefly, I wanted to, uh echo or or i guess like add a comment of to what you said carla too that this the reimagining or reconsider reconsidering the role of the museum or the art gallery or the arts nonprofit that has something that has been really um interesting to me especially because i'm from la um carolina is from la and la there's i feel like there's mixed feelings towards museums <laughs> about how people feel about museums some people like want them out they don't necessarily see them as spaces that are friendly and to me i feel like caught in the middle a lot of times and I, and when i think about that i think about like the places that i know that people are down to protect and will be there and it's like a place that comes to mind is chuko's justice center and this is a place that does community organizing and when i think about like why do people want this place so much is because like when chuko's was inviting people to organize they're like people are like i can't organize because i need a job or i can't organize because i need to finish my high school diploma or i have a baby and chuko started really shaping and developing their place to like meet people's needs and not not seem so like distant right uh and i'm really inspired by that format and i'm like how can we make museums like crucial to people right like and not, not but not erasing the art and the importance of art and in imagination because i that's at the center but i guess like kind of like healing the alienation that has happened because of capitalism and its role within you know funded art spaces and stuff like that but yeah so I, um, I wanted to add not only oh yeah go, go, go for it I just wanted to add something that that's really kind of continuing your train of thought Gloria because I think sometimes museums look at other museums and sometimes even larger museums and I'm of the opinion that they need to look at other types of institutions and other types of organizations like they should be looking at I don't know smaller maybe arts related organizations in the Caribbean, like Alice Yard in Trinidad or Beta Local in Puerto Rico, you know, how do these organizations sit within their local communities and, and how they, do they build relationships? And I think that, yeah, sometimes like, I don't think we need to look at other museums. Like we have so much to learn from other smaller organizations. And I think that's something that we should be thinking about for sure. Go ahead, Caro. No, 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 I was just going to hammer everyone in the head with, um, you know, not only capitalist structures within the museum, but also patriarchal um, and um, and white supremacist structures within the museum. Um, so much we can talk about around these topics, and I'm excited with, and grateful that we got the opportunity to share space, and I've learned a lot. Um, I think this is about the moment where we open it up for a at least 10 minutes or so to the public for questions. Um, I'm looking towards our chat and perhaps there's no questions or maybe there is some questions. In the meantime, if folks have any like afterthoughts that you would like to add or anything, I know you guys mentioned a couple of projects that are coming up, but anything that you think people should have on their radar or there is one question in the Q and A. Oh, really? That's bizarre. I'm not receive, receiving those. So, do you mind reading that? Because I don't see it in my chat. Yeah, it just okay, came in. 
it's, or it just came in yeah it's, it's a question for carolina and everyone else too i'm thinking a lot about how you talked about dams earlier and the emotional effects of that kind of disruption and loss i was recently in the olympic peninsula and went to the river where the elwa dam used to exist it's the elwa river a recent and largest dam removal project in the u.s history and the world thanks to the pressure from the lower Klalem tribe and other local tribes. And in just a few years of without this dam, there is now a healthy growing population of salmon that has totally changed the ecology and the biome. In a time where ecological devastation feels so irrep uh, irreparable, seeing how quickly things change after the dam removal was really profound. I wonder if you witnessed things like this, how quickly the environment can bounce back and how you might take inspiration from these rare moments. I've been there at the Elwa, at the mouth of the Elwa. It's really amazing and inspiring to be there and to hear the elders of the Lower Klalem tribe, how the organizers spearheaded the removal of those dams. And yes, uh, I think um, nature has a capacity to bounce back, but they need our help. I mean, it, it, it needs our help, you know, that all the rivers, the mountains, they need us there to support that bouncing back. And, um, you know, when I spoke about fair energy transition in the last answer, a, a just transition uh, is not only about thinking and imagining other ways of producing electricity, but it also has to do with removing and decommissioning and dismantling oppressive infrastructures such as dams, such as oil rigs, such as border walls, such as aging infrastructure that is not doing anything for us, or that is just like a, a threat to us. Uh, and, you know, I think about the Idrituango Dam in Colombia that's been in red alert and about to collapse for the last few years. I think about all the mine tailing dams in Minas Gerais in Brazil that ha keep collapsing and killing 300 people at a time and uh, producing toxic waves of mine detritus that kills a whole river at a time. So we need to work towards it. Um, uh, what, what I take of these inspiration, you know, is that we need to identify those oppressive infrastructures and work towards that dismantling. And that is part of this just energy transition that we need to gear towards. Yes. I think, um, I have, I don't see another question in the chat unless you all do, because my I seem to have a bit of a delay. Just if you, oh, here it goes. What roles, yeah. What roles do you think art have in order to help us navigate future cultural and technological transformations? Well, I think Lorena said it. Uh, beautifully, you know, the role of imagination. Um, and um, I, I think the, ro the role of weaving together different worlds too. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes the political sphere and, and like we're living that right now in the United States and not only the United States, but you know, everywhere. There's such a, like, seems like, um, a division that seems that cannot be, you know, that gap that seems that it's impossible to kind of close between people thinking one thing and people thinking the other thing and acting in one way and acting in another way. Um, but I found that, you know, that that art has the possibility of actually <clears throat> at least creating a platform where these people that have different ideologies and different perspectives of life can meet and at least start a conversation. Um, yeah. Anybody else who wants to add to that? Just, you know, to, to follow what Carolina said, that, you know, there, when that question is posed, a question that disrupts or like asks the, the viewer to enter into a different space, that's already a, like, a, even though it's a minor act of being in another situation yourself, I think that's already could be very powerful and very moving for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think just briefly for that art on my mind by bell hooks, there's a portion that she dedicates to that, like the role of art and how um, it's like a, a, a refuge that we can come to to make sense of the world. 
And although in that making sense, it complicates the world because the world is a complicated place, but through that complication, like clarity of who we are, where we stand comes about. But I, I really enjoy how they go into that. Um, a follow-up question to that is, if you all have final thoughts, then, oh, so, no, that's a different, that's like an internal thing. Um, there's one more. Can you discuss or share information about the photography project along the border around the issues of water resources? I think uh, she's referring to Anandrade's book. Uh, the book will hopefully uh, be ready for the, the, the beginning of spring. And it is, it is her four or five year um, project of photographing the, the people living in, uh, at, the, at the border in, in Tijuana. So it will be published by a, a collaboration between uh, Ana Andrade and Taller California. So if you want to know more about it, we'll be posting in, in our kind of very modest social uh, networks um, information about it. And the, the website is tallercalifornia.org and not Taller California, but Taller California. <laughs> so, yeah. And Lorena, you will be presenting in the virtual book fair, right? Yes, we'll be there. So uh, I'm everybody who's uh, part of the fair, where everybody's so excited that, you know, never we, although we cannot be in person, I am so thankful that Printed Matter is, is doing this because I, you know, I'm a fan of the, of the fair and all the, um, the, you know, relations and information and people that you meet at the fair. So in a way, you know, they're doing their best. So uh, all of us can communicate and, and learn, you know, find books that, that obviously, mm. will, yeah, really interesting books that will be there. And Carolina, you will, you have a book that folks can get through Printed Matter. That's the book that you collaborated on with um, Carla, right? Yes, I understand it's available through Printed Matter, and um, it's a uh, it's a monograph called From the Bottom of the, the River, Desde el Fondo del Rio. It's está bilingüe in Espanol and English. It's bilingual. It has text from Carla herself, from Pilar Tompkins Rivers, who's a curator based here in LA, and from David Hernandez Palmar, who is a YU filmmaker based in Colombia. Great, and on an ending note, I would like to encourage folks to seek you all out, your books, your tables and everything going on. And thank you all for sharing space and thank you Sonel for facilitating this space. Uh, I, I wanna thank each of you. Uh, you've given us so much to think about, um, a really thoughtful and powerful conversation on so many levels. We're really honored to um, have been able to host this conversation. Uh, Thank you to each of you for your work, uh, incredible work, and for sharing it with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the attendees. Everybody. I see you. <laughs>